Chapter 1 of Grace Harlowe Overseas This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ashley Jane Grace Harlowe Overseas by Jessie Graham Flower Chapter 1 A Disturbing Note Oh, Tom, Jessica writes that Reddy has joined the Navy. The Navy? Yes, he has gone to Pelham, and from there he hopes to be sent down to Annapolis for further training that will give him a commission as an ensign. Isn't that fine? It surely is safe, replied Grace's husband briefly. Tom Gray, how can you say such a thing? You know that Reddy has no such thought in mind. Reddy is not a man who would shirk his duty when his country called. And I think he has done a splendid thing. You might say the same of David Nesbitt, who has gone to the training camp at Plattsburgh, and who will be an officer in a few weeks and on his way to France. There was a note of disapproval in Grace's tone as she laid down the letter from Jessica Brooks and resumed her breakfast. Tom's face tightened ever so little. Avoiding her eyes, he gazed down over the beautiful lawn of Haven Home, the home that had meant so much to Grace Harlow Gray and her husband during the ten months of their married life, ten wonderful months of unalloyed happiness, the fruition of their dreams and of their earthly ideals. Then the blow fell, and America entered the war in behalf of the liberty of the human race, a blow that was felt in every home in the land. In Haven Home, during the few weeks following the declaration of war, a barrier seemed to have risen between Grace and her husband, an indefinable something that amounted almost to an estrangement which neither one, had he or she been asked, would have been able to define in words. It was there, and it was becoming more marked as the days passed. Friends of Grace and Tom had one by one volunteered their services to the country and hurried away to training or mobilisation camps, but Tom Gray had made no move in that direction and had not even expressed a desire to play a man's part. At first Grace was shocked at her husband's attitude, which was a bitter disappointment to her, for she had looked for Tom to be among the first to offer his services to the government following the declaration of war. On his part Tom Gray seemed to change almost overnight. He grew distraught. The lines of his face deepened, and in place of his wanted cheerfulness there appeared an irritability wholly foreign to his nature. Grace could neither understand nor analyse this attitude, yet despite the restraint not a word passed between them on the subject of Tom Gray's entering the service of his country. Grace's intimate friends had been equally amazed at Tom's attitude of apparent indifference toward the crisis which his country was facing. Knowing him as they did, these friends were inclined to lay the blame at Grace's door. That Tom of his own choice would be content to stay out of it, they did not believe. Speaking of joining the colours, what about our friend Hippie? he questioned, turning back and looking steadily at Grace. Her face relaxed into a half-amused smile. Theophilus H. Wingate, otherwise Hippie, says he is too fat to go to war, she observed. I fail to see what that has to do with it, my dear. Well, Tom. The way Hippie reasons it out is that being so fat, he would present a conspicuous mark for enemy sharpshooters. Tom actually threw back his head and laughed. Hippie declares that being fat, and hence an easy mark, he is certain to be shot to pieces to an extent that will mar his manly beauty and cause Nora to love him no more. Of course Hippie doesn't mean that. No one ever really knows what is in the back of Hippie's head because he camouflages so successfully. Perhaps Nora knows, for probably they have had an understanding on the subject of Hippie's going to war. I judge this by her happy manner and her perfect contentment with everything. Hmm, exclaimed Tom. It is easy to excuse oneself. 
As I view the subject, no man, sound in mind and body, has any right to consider what may happen to him in the service of the United States, save in so far as it is his duty to see that his loved ones left at home are properly provided for. When he turns his face to the East, he leaves all behind him, and that will be the end of everything for many. Grace looked startled. It was the first time her husband had expressed himself in that way. Perhaps Nora is holding Hippy back, suggested Tom indifferently. Would you if you were in her place? You know me better than that, Tom. I hope I never should even think of holding a man back from his plain duty. However, there are conditions that might make it imprudent for a man to leave his family and... What conditions? demanded Tom Gray. Tom, do you realise that it is nine o'clock and that J. Elfrida Briggs is due at the station fifteen minutes from this very moment? I must go to the car at once, answered Grace, rising hurriedly. I will get the car. You get ready while I am gone and I will ride downtown with you. I am looking for a letter this morning that will call me up to Boston regarding that forestry contract that I spoke to you about yesterday. Oh! The exclamation escaped her before she realised it. Grace knew that the contract of which her husband spoke was one that he expected would keep him busy for the better part of two years, and her heart sank within her, for this would mark the end of all her hopes of Tom's finally deciding to enter the service. Her disappointment was for the moment forgotten, however, when she heard the car stop at the door and realised that she was soon to see Elfrida, who always was a tonic and a delight to Grace. Tom's eyes brightened and lingered lovingly on her as Grace stepped out and paused a moment to cast an appraising glance over the car. Framed there between the white pillars of Haven Home, clad in a dainty white organdy, pink rosebuds just peeping over the brim of her leghorn hat, she presented a picture that Tom Gray carried in his mind for many a long day. It was a picture that softened the way for him through many a long desperate night in the future. Grace dropped her husband at the post office in Oakdale and sped on to the station, and a few minutes later, J. Elfrida was in her arms. "'I'm glad you were here at this time, Elfrida,' greeted Tom, whom they picked up on their way home from the station. "'I'm leaving for Boston this afternoon, and I shall feel better while I am away to know that Grace has you with her. I have a letter calling me there on the matter of the forestry contract that I spoke of,' he added, turning to Grace. I hope to be able to return in a day or two. You two will have so much to talk over that you will hardly miss me. I should say we would have, agreed Alfreda. We shall not even think to miss you, Tom Gray. How is it that I find you here when all the boys have gone to war? demanded Alfreda with her usual bluntness. Tom flushed under his tan, while Grace's face paled ever so little, which was not lost to the keen, observant eyes of Alfreda Briggs. Elfrida saw before her the same Grace Harlow that she had known and loved so well through the four years of their college course at Overton. Those who have followed Grace Harlow through her high school and college life are equally well acquainted with the other seven members of the eight originals. In Grace Harlow's plebe year at high school, Grace Harlow's junior year at high school, Grace Harlow's senior year at high school, these old friends retained their devotion and love for each other. After graduating from the Oakdale High School, Grace went to Overton College, accompanied by Anne Pearson and Miriam Nesbitt. At Overton, her sweet disposition, her loyalty and patriotism won many friends for her, to whom she soon became known as Loyalheart. The record of Grace Harlow's four years at Overton and her splendid achievements there will be found in Grace Harlow's first year at Overton College, Grace Harlow's second year at Overton College, Grace Harlow's third year at Overton College, Grace Harlow's fourth year at Overton College, Grace Harlow's return to Overton College, and Grace Harlow's problem. In Grace Harlow's golden summer, Grace awakened to the insistent pleadings of her own heart and became the happy bride of Tom Gray, who led her to the house behind the world, a place she had always loved, and there ensconced her as his bride. Anne became the wife of David Nesbitt, his sister Miriam the bride of Everett Southard, the famous actor. 
Hippy the Cheerful had chosen Carefree Nora O'Malley, and Reddy Brooks won the heart and hand of Jessica Bright. Since her marriage, Grace Harlowe had seen little of her old friends, though an intermittent correspondence had been carried on between them, and this visit of Elfreda's was the first since the previous fall, when Grace was married. Elfreda was now a full-fledged lawyer, and a successful one, absorbed in her work, a little thinner, perhaps, but wearing a dignity that added to her attractiveness. It was not, however, of herself that she was thinking now, but of Grace. That all was not well with Grace and Tom was plain to the observant eyes of J. Elfreda. As yet she had had no opportunity to arrange her impressions into anything like logical form, and as a matter of fact, Elfreda preferred to wait for her conclusions until she had further information in hand. Reaching Haven home, Tom went immediately to his study, saying he had several important matters to attend to before leaving, which he had planned to do on the one o'clock train that afternoon. Grace conducted her friend to the room that had been prepared for her, its windows commanding a view of the broad green lawns and the great old elms that had made what was popularly known as Upton Heights famous for many years. Now please remove that very fetching headpiece and let me look at you, commanded Elfreda. Stand out here in the middle of the room where I can look you over, in detail. For a moment or two, Elfreda, with hair tilted slightly to one side, regarded her friend with appraising eyes. Yes, it is the same old loyal heart, but changed, she murmured. How changed, Elfreda? questioned Grace. More beautiful than ever. Thinner, slightly more matronly. Anything else? demanded Grace, laughing merrily. Yes. Well, Judge Briggs, you might as well sentence me now. I do not enjoy suspense. And yet you are permitting yourself to enjoy suspense. You are growing thin under it, and— But I shall fix you up as good as new. I am a lawyer, you know, and troubles such as yours are my strong suite. Sit down and give me a full account of yourself, leaving out no details. After you have finished— you may ask me all the personal questions you wish. I assure you I have nothing to hide, added Elfreda mischievously. There is little to say, Elfreda. I am, as you see me now, and have been, happy in the possession of the best man in the world. They all say that, whether they mean it or not, cut in Elfreda. We have lived very quietly here, and been away but seldom, save as I go to visit Mother or Fairy Godmother. Tom's mother is such a dear, the most wonderful mother-in-law a girl ever had. I hear that Reddy and David have gone to war, Grace. What about Hippy? Grace told her what she already had related to her husband. And what about Tom Gray? persisted the relentless Frieda. Tom will go when he can consistently do so. The war is still young, and there will be plenty of time for him, answered the young wife as bravely as she could. Something wrong, radically wrong here. As a lawyer, I assign myself to the case, was J. Elfreda's mental declaration. Then aloud, I'm glad to hear that, Grace. I think you are mistaken about Hippy. You will find him in the forefront of things. You just watch Hippy's smoke. There I go. Truly, Grace, dear, I never shall get over my early habit of using slang. Remember how you used to lecture me about that when I came to Overton, a verdant freshman? Grace smiled at the recollection which her friend's words stirred. When does Tom think of going? asked J. Elfreda, boring in mercilessly. There he comes now. Please, please do not refer to the subject. Promise me. Elfreda nodded. Her keen legal mind was beginning to get at the mystery, though there were phases of it that she could not understand. I find I must go to town, Grace, said Tom, rapping on the door of his guest's room. I will get my luncheon at the hotel and take the train without coming back home. I shall not be away long. Alfreda, take good care of loyal heart. Tom kissed his wife, and with a wave of the hand to Alfreda he was off. J. Alfreda noticed that Tom and his wife avoided each other's eyes, as if each were harbouring a guilty secret, and that Grace's features contracted while lines that her friend never had seen there before ridged her forehead. 
It is my opinion that you two children need a good old-fashioned shaking up, declared Miss Briggs with emphasis, and J. Elfreda is the one to do the shaking. Come, let's go out for a stroll. I wish to get acquainted with this beautiful place that I have never known in all its beautiful details. Grace rose with a sigh. Elfreda linked an arm into Grace's, and together the two old friends strolled thoughtfully out and over the velvety lawns of Haven Home, neither speaking, each absorbed in the problems that lay nearest to their hearts. Grace sad for herself and for her husband. J. Elfreda thoroughly angry with both. End of chapter 1 Recording by Ashley Jane Chapter 2 of Grace Harlow Overseas by Jessie Graham Flower This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ashley Jane Chapter 2 J. Elfreda Solves the Mystery The idea that any girl could be unhappy with such a home as this, observed Elfreda, pausing to look back at Haven Home, a rambling structure that stood dazzling white against the magnificent trees that surrounded it, its high-pillared verandas lending a dignity to the structure that was undeniable. I am happy, Elfreda, answered Grace. Then give me unhappiness. If yours is the true happiness of married life, I most emphatically prefer single blessedness. Come over here and sit down. You and I are about to have a thorough understanding. As your lawyer and as your best friend, I am entitled to know everything. Elfreda led her friend to a settee under a spreading elm, and still with an arm linked in one of Grace's, sat down beside her. How long has this state of affairs existed at Haven Home? I, I don't know what you mean, stammered Grace. Oh, yes, you do. You know that I know you and Tom are about as near to estrangement as a married couple well can be and still live together. Grace Hollow, it is my opinion that your own little head is all twisted, that you are doing Tom Gray a very great wrong. Now what is there about Tom's going to war? I... I don't know. Please, Alfreda, do not question me. You think he doesn't wish to go? demanded the lawyer shrewdly. Tell me the truth, is that it? Grace made no reply. I thought so. Why do you think he doesn't wish to go? You think he is afraid to go? Grace bristled. She was indignant, and Elfreda chuckled to herself. When her friend reproached her and defended Tom Gray in a flood of words, fighting hard to keep back the tears. Have you ever talked it over with Tom? asked Elfreda. Grace shook her head. I thought not. That is the way most domestic disturbances occur, as I have learned from my experience at the bar. Each side gets an idea into its head. Then the two drift uneasily apart. Grace Harlow, I gave you credit for possessing more sense. However, never having been in love, perhaps I do not understand what its reaction is. I will confess that I did wonder that Tom had not gone into the service, but I presumed then, as I do now, that he believes he had a good reason. Believe me, Grace, Tom will do his duty in good time. He cannot. He has taken on this forestry contract that will take him two years, perhaps three years, to complete. It is that that he has gone to Boston to arrange for. Then I demand that upon his return you and Tom get together and have a thorough heart house cleaning. Tell him how you feel on the subject as well as what your disappointment is at his attitude in this matter. Personally, I can't understand why any young woman, especially a bride, should be unhappy because her lovey-dovey doesn't run off to war and get himself killed, declared Elfreda, with an emphasis that made her friend wince. Don't, oh, don't, begged Grace. You... You do not understand. No, I will confess that I do not. Have you thought about the Overton commencement next week, to change the subject? No, truly I had not, replied Grace, brightening a little. Then let's think about it. Why not go up there for the great event, you and I? It will do you good, and when you come back your troubles will have faded like a morning mist over the meadows of Haven Home. 
Grace said she could not go without first asking her husband, whereupon J. Elfrida launched into an argument for the rights of her sex and the personal independence to which the sex was entitled, married or single. After luncheon the two friends went out for a long drive. Grace's skill at the wheel was well known to her friends, and though a fast driver, she drove with her head as well as her hands. Not only was she an excellent driver, but she could change a tyre or make temporary repairs with the skill of a born mechanic, so that her friends never felt the slightest nervousness in going out with her. Rough roads, steep mountain grades, or congested traffic had no terrors for her nor for her passengers. Grace benefited materially from the wholesome, practical association with her friend. This and the drive did wonders for her, and she returned with eyes sparkling, a smile on her lips, once more the Grace Harlow that Elfrida had known in the Overton College days. A letter from Tom told Grace that he was obliged to make a trip into the main woods, which would delay his return until the latter part of the week. Of this Elfrida was secretly glad, for unknown to Grace, she had sent a long night letter telegram to Tom, telling him what the situation was at Havenhome, and advising him to take his wife more fully into his confidence, either by letter or by word of mouth, upon his return. Elfrida told him frankly that his present attitude was alienating the affection of Grace, who was a patriot first and a wife next. There, she reflected after the message was written and dispatched. I suppose I shall be set down as an old meddler, but Tom must remember that I am a lawyer and that it is my legitimate right to interfere in other people's domestic affairs. On the following day, Grace received another letter from her husband, couched in a tone of tenderness and with a certain something between the lines that went straight to the heart of the young wife. What that something was she could not define but it was there, and it brought a certain amount of solace to her troubled heart. Yet the spectre of doubt persisted in creeping into her consciousness. She had written Tom of her wish to go to the commencement at Overton, and in due time had his hearty approval of the plan, but urging her, for reasons which he would explain, to wait until his return before she started for Overton. All this was of the greatest possible interest to J. Elfrida, though she had not the slightest idea as to whether or not her message to Tom had borne fruit. At any rate, he would return with no doubts in his mind as to the situation at Havenhome, and with a full knowledge of what might follow his persisting in his policy of aloofness and failure to be at least frank with his bride. In the meantime, Miss Briggs went ahead with her plans for the visit to Overton to attend the commencement. She wrote to Miriam, Nora, Jessica, and Emma Dean, urging them to join the party at Overton for a reunion that might never be possible again. Emma Dean did not reply. The others did, promising to meet Grace and Elfrida on the day before commencement. After receiving these acceptances, J. Elfrida acquainted Grace with what she had done. I'm beginning to wonder whether I am the mistress of my own home or even of myself replied Grace smilingly. You are neither, but you are going to be both, returned Elfrida bluntly. You go ahead and be yourself, and I'll settle any difficulties that may follow your having taken the law into your own hands. You know I am the law, and I have simply assigned the law to you for present purposes. I shall write to Mrs. Elwood today, telling her that we are coming and that some of us will wish to stay with her. You, of course, will prefer to go to the Harlow House, and I rather think I shall go there too. Yes, I'll write to the Harlow House at the same time. This Elfrida did. Now all that remains is for the Lord and Master of this house behind the world to return and give his final August consent to us two children going away for a holiday. And suppose he should not, suggested Grace. Should not? demanded Miss Briggs, elevating her eyebrows. I should like to see any mere man step in and interfere with the plans of J. Elfrida Briggs, was the reply uttered with emphasis. My plans are your plans in this instance, so we go to Overton. If Tom does not return by Friday, I shall not leave until he does, announced Grace with finality. Of course we may have to wait a day or two, replied Elfrida, 
having in mind the message she had sent to Tom Gray and the letter he had written to Grace. However, we shall go just the same. I shall wire him today to be certain to return in time. Grace sighed a sigh of resignation. There was no stopping J. Elfreda when once she was well started on any definite line of action. As for J. Elfreda herself, she was saying to herself, Elfreda Briggs, you are playing a desperate game with the happiness of two human beings in the balance. If you stub your toe, you are lost and so are they. Thursday found preparations for the journey completed, but with no word from Tom Gray saying when he expected to return home. Grace was restless, and her face was resuming the set look it had worn at the time of her friend's arrival. She was looking forward to going back to Overton, and if at this late hour she found it impossible to do so, her disappointment would be keen. Elfreda herself was a little out of humour as the day drew on with still no word from Grace's husband, and she found herself undecided as to what course she would follow provided Tom did not return in time to permit them to carry out their plans. I will cross that bridge when I get to it, was Elfreda's conclusion, but as she made it, a carriage crunched on the gravel drive and the cheery voice of Tom Gray called, Hello! He had driven up in the old antiquated hack that did service for the passengers who detrained at the station in Oakdale. Grace and Elfreda hurried out, Grace remaining at the head of the steps, Elfreda stepping down and shaking hands with Tom. It is fortunate for you, young man, that you returned in time. Two women were beginning to prepare to give you a warm reception if you came too late to permit them to carry out their well-laid plans for an old-time college romp. Thank you for the message, said Tom under his breath. Then running up the steps, he gave Grace what Elfreda characterized to herself as a most perfunctory kiss. I returned as soon as I could, apologized Tom. I had much to do and I have much to say to you. First I must run up and have a bath and a change of clothing. No, no, I'll carry the bundle, he added, flushing as Grace sought to take the bulky package done up in rough brown paper. Wait for me in the living room. I shall be down in a few moments. After he had run lightly upstairs, the two girls entered the living room and sat down to await Tom's return. Grace had sensed the perfunctoriness of her husband's kiss, but there was something about him that puzzled her more than ever. Somehow it seemed to her that it was a new Tom who had returned to her. There was a purpose and resolution in his eyes that was like the old Tom she had known before the barrier rose up between them. Something is coming off in this house, or I am much mistaken in my reading of the signs, reflected Elfreda. A few moments later they heard him clattering down the stairs. It was not the accustomed firm tread of Tom Gray, but a sound that reminded Grace's friend of hobnailed shoes. And then he appeared before them. Elfreda saw Grace's face go deathly pale, then a slow flush rise to her cheeks, and Elfreda herself uttered a little gasp at what she saw framed there in the doorway. Tom, very erect, his eyes alight, a half-smile on his face, stood regarding Grace, who had risen to her feet, the colour flooding her face and neck. Tom was in the uniform of a private of the United States Army. Tom! Oh, Tom! cried Grace, opening wide her arms. This is no place for a bachelor girl, exclaimed J. Alfreda, and fled. End of chapter 2 Recording by Ashley Jane Chapter 2 of Grace Harlow Overseas by Jessie Graham Flower This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ashley Jane Chapter 3 For Country's Sake Tom! Tom! What does it mean? Breathed Grace her emotions now under partial control. It means, loyal heart, that I have listened to the call of my country and enlisted as a private in the 130th Engineers. Wait, please sit down, Grace. I have something to say to you, something to confess and to ask your forgiveness. I know that at times you must surely have thought me to be a coward and... No, 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 Tom, never that. 
returned Grace gravely. When the war broke out, I could scarcely restrain myself from starting at once, but there were certain business arrangements that must be made before I could take such a step. In the meantime, your attitude toward me changed. I construed it as fear on your part that, knowing me as you did, I would go and enlist. It was because you did not, my husband, that my heart was filled with disappointment, interjected Grace in a low tone. Yes, I know that now, but then I read you wrongly, and every day the gulf between us seemed to widen. I knew that I must go, that I never again could look you or my fellows in the eyes without flinching were I to fail of my plain duty, yet I was a coward for all that. Grace shook her head but spoke no word. The longer I waited, all the time making plans for you, the more difficult did I find it to be frank with you and to tell you how I felt. I should have known you well enough to understand that you would despise the man who took the position that you thought I had assumed. Tom, you are mistaken. My only thought was bitter disappointment. I went no further than that. I understand, Grace. You were right in being disappointed in me. I was weak, and if I am as cowardly as a soldier, you will meet an even more bitter disappointment. I promise you, though, loyal heart, that you need have no fear of such a result. No, Tom, there is no fear of that, interjected Grace gently. To continue, I could endure it no longer. I had already written to Boston regarding enlistment, and when I left home the other day, it was firstly for the purpose of turning over my forestry contract to another man and showing him the plans I had made as applied to the actual work that I went east. Why did you not tell me, Tom? That was my mistake. I feared that after these brief few months of companionship and happiness, I might weaken when I saw the unhappiness I was about to bring upon you. I couldn't weaken. I had to go. So I went to Camp Aya and enlisted in the engineers. I have made myself despicable in your eyes, Grace, but I feel that you will understand and forgive. I do understand, my husband. As for forgiveness, there is nothing to forgive. We were both wrong, but our love blinded our better judgment. You have done a noble thing. Not noble, just a man's duty, interrupted Tom. She made a place beside her for him, and hand in hand they sat in silence for several minutes. The unit that I have joined is one of the best. It is said that they are to leave for France very soon, as engineers are urgently needed there. It was that which in a way induced me to join the engineers. You will not know when I leave the country, as I shall not be permitted to write you anything about it. I shall know, Tom. My heart will tell me. People's hearts sometimes fail them at the critical moment. I have a better plan, he said whimsically. After going to camp, I will write to you every day until the moment that I leave. When you fail to receive a letter from me for two days in succession, you may know that I have embarked and am on my way to the great adventure. This evening I will tell you about my affairs in details. There are still some things to be done, and I think I'd better have lawyer Clayson up this evening to draw the few necessary papers still to be made out and executed. Why not let Alfreda do that? She is a lawyer, suggested Grace. Surely I had forgotten that. I do not suppose she is a notary, but I can stop and execute the papers on my way to the train. Where is Alfreda? She ran away when she thought you and I were on the point of getting demonstrative, was Grace's smiling reply. Who is taking my name? demanded a voice from the lawn. If you two people have finished being human, I'll come in. Please be sensible, for I do not enjoy sitting out on the lawn for two solid hours waiting for two children to finish their love-making. Sure I'm not a crowd? Not so far as we two are concerned, laughed Tom. In fact, we were just speaking of you. Will you come into the family conference this evening and assist me in winding up the arrangements for my departure so far as my business affairs are concerned? I do not know how good a lawyer you are, but if you are as good a lawyer as you are a friend, I should say you are at least dependable. For your information, Alfreda, I will merely state what I have already told Grace. 
I went to Boston to turn over that forestry contract to someone else and to enlist before returning home. That will be sufficient to explain some questions that possibly may have entered your mind regarding my action. J. Elfrida and My congratulations. No shoulder straps for you, eh? Going to be just a plain buck private. Had I a hat on my head, I promise you that I should take it off right here and now. But you will get the shoulder bars and silver ones at that. Tom shook his head. I shall be content to do my duty as a plain private. I think we had better defer our business matters until after dinner, for... I was just wondering if anyone was going to eat in this house tonight. You must remember that there is one person under this roof who has had no training in living on love. Food is what I am in need of at the present moment, and after partaking of a liberal portion of that, I shall be ready to favour you with such legal advice and assistance as you may find yourself in need of. Why, it is seven o'clock, exclaimed Grace. I wonder that the cook has not caught us. Upon going to the kitchen, Grace found a disgruntled maid who declared that she had called them four times already and that the dinner was stone cold. After dinner, Grace and Elfrida went to Tom's study. He turned over to Grace the papers already executed. These are the deeds to all of our real estate which I have made over to you. Here are the securities, all of which have been transferred to you. The bank books you know about, began Tom. Elfrida, will you draw the strongest kind of a power of attorney that can be drawn, covering every possible contingency that may arise? I wish to leave Grace in position to carry on our affairs exactly as I should do were I to be here. In case I do not come back, of course, the property is yours to do with as you think best. The power of attorney places the bank accounts at your immediate disposal. Grace, don't forget to take your checkbook with you to Overton. We shall see to it that those bank accounts are reduced, won't we, Grace? observed Miss Briggs. Alfreda drew the power of attorney now and then asking a question, after which, at Tom's request, she looked over the deeds and the other papers, each of which she pronounced correct. That was all. Grace was now in full possession of all their earthly possessions. Tom informed her that he had taken out an army insurance in her favour, this being in addition to the fairly heavy insurance already carried by him. "'Tomorrow morning you will be going to Overton. I shall be gone by the time your train is due.' I leave at 7.30 tomorrow morning. While you do not go until 11, you see my leave expires at noon. Grace did not speak, but Alfreda observed that the muscles of her face tightened ever so little. In a few moments Grace was chatting gaily, only her heightened colour bearing evidence that she was labouring under a severe mental strain. Not once during the rest of the evening did she let down. What she had to say to Tom of a more serious nature was said late that evening in their own room, and next morning breakfast was bright and cheerful, with plenty of laughter, each one being as light-hearted as though they were about to start for a day's merry-making in the woods. Even Alfreda wondered at Grace and her superb self-control. She wondered even more when at the station. Grace ran along beside the train that was bearing her husband away, blowing kisses at him and calling goodbyes. Then the two drove home and began preparing for the journey to Overton, Grace entering into the remaining preparations with almost feverish haste. Reaching there, they found rooms at Harlow House, one room for each. Arrangements had been made elsewhere for the rest of the party, none of whom had yet arrived. After supper, Grace and Alfreda went over to call on Mrs. Elwood and then to see Miss Wilder, the dean of the college. It was a happy meeting. Miss Wilder held Grace off at arm's length and looked her over in detail. The same beloved Grace Harlow. It does not seem possible that you are a married woman. And your husband, Grace, I trust he is well? Yes, my husband is now in the army. She made the announcement with ill-concealed pride. Indeed, I hadn't heard of that. May I ask when he entered the service? He left for his mobilization camp this morning, was Grace's quiet reply. You have not changed, I see, observed Miss Wilder. By the way, President Morton was inquiring about you today. I told him you were expected at Overton tonight or tomorrow. 
He wished me to say to you that he desired to see you on a particular matter of a somewhat confidential nature. If convenient, I would suggest that you call on the President tomorrow. This Grace promised to do. The two girls soon returned to Harlow House, where they met with a happy surprise, and to Elfreda, an agreeable one of Grace's account. A chorus of voices greeted them upon their entrance. From the medley of voices, Grace recognized those of Mabel Ashe, Ruth Denton, and Arlene Thayer. Cries of delight were mingled with affectionate embraces, and a chattering began that lasted until late at night. Grace was plied with questions and teased, but for a few moments following J. Elfrida's announcement that Grace's husband had that day left for the Great War, the voices were subdued and not raised again until Grace herself started the merry chatter. Those who did not know Grace Harlow so well thought she did not care. Her old-time friends in that group, however, knew her and understood. Understood that beneath Grace Harlow Gray's happy exterior, there lay an aching heart. Shall I sleep with you tonight, loyal heart? questioned Elfrida. Thank you, no, dear Elfrida. You have been so good to me. When we get the opportunity, I want you to tell me something that I now have only a bare suspicion about. Tonight, I wish to be alone, for I am going to have a good cry. I promise you, though, that it shall be the last, the very last, unless, unless, Unable to trust herself to say more, Grace ran into her room and closed the door, while Elfrida kept guard in the corridor to make certain that no one disturbed her friend, and there she kept her vigil far into the night. End of chapter 3 Recording by Ashley Jane Chapter 4 of Grace Harlow Overseas by Jessie Graham Flower this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ashley Jane. Chapter 4 Grace's Golden Opportunity Overton was not the same joyous place that it had been in former years, as Grace and Elfrida realized next day. While there was laughter and play, they were more tempered than before, for the war had touched most of the girls, having taken loved ones across the seas or to camps in preparation for going over. If anything, Grace was the liveliest one among them, unless it were Nora Wingate, who with her Irish wit kept a large circle of admirers in continuous gales of laughter. She and Jessica and Ruth had come on that morning. When asked about Hippy, Nora said he had gone south on a business trip. As she seemed disclined to explain anything more about her husband's absence, no one pressed her. Anne Pearson and Jessica Brooks were very much depressed. The husbands of these young brides were now at training camps, one for a commission in the army, the other for whatever he could get in the navy. There was a happy luncheon at Vinton's, on which occasion the original four had grown to several times for. There were calls on old college mates and professors, visits to old familiar haunts that saddened rather than brought joy, for there is a sentiment, an appeal to the emotions about the scenes of one's college days, felt by none save those who have passed through them and journeyed on out into the world. The day was a busy one, and it was not until the following afternoon that Grace found time, or in fact even thought of the Dean's request that she drop in to see President Morton. The commencement exercises were to be held on the following day, when there would be neither opportunity nor inclination for anything other than the commencement itself, so Grace shortly after luncheon excused herself to her friends and strolled over to Morton Hall and sent in her card to the President. The President came out to greet her. "'Come in, my dear Miss Harlow. I beg your pardon, Mrs. Gray,' he added, gazing down on her with twinkling eyes. Grace followed the President into his private office, and as she gazed about her, Grace Harlow permitted a sigh to escape her, for that office brought back recollections of other happy days when she was a carefree student. Since then she had come to a woman's estate and assumed the real responsibilities of life. Mrs. Gray, began the President, 
thrusting aside a litter of papers on his desk and resting his elbows on the space thus cleared. I am informed that your husband has joined the army, as a private. Yes, Professor. I am glad to hear it. Most young men, college men, prefer to go to officers' training camps to try for commissions. Of course the army needs officers, but the ranks are just as much in need of men of education. There are many of those who, like your husband, are content to do their bit in the ranks, and I honour Mr. Gray for what he has done. Still, knowing you and your deep-seated patriotism, I could expect nothing less from Grace Harlow's husband. May I ask, Mrs. Gray, what your plans are for the period of your husband's absence? I have made no definite plans for myself, Professor. Had you thought of entering some form of war work? Not only have I thought of it, but I have decided to do so at the earliest opportunity. I have not decided where or how. I suppose you have no idea when your husband will go over? No, sir. President Morton stroked his chin thoughtfully. Mrs. Gray, Overton College has been asked to form a unit for overseas work with the Red Cross, and we have decided to do so. It is desired that women of more or less maturity be selected for this service. We have made up a tentative list, but some of the young ladies either do not desire to join or are unable to do so owing to other responsibilities. What will be the nature of the service? questioned Grace, her eyes alight with a slow flush mounting to her cheeks. I am not fully informed as to that. I do not believe, however, that the unit will operate as a unit, but that the individual members will be placed where they are most needed, in hospitals, in canteens, in headquarters offices. At the suggestion of the dean, I have placed your name on the list as a member of the unit. Of course, I do not know whether or not you would wish to join, but will you think it over and let me know before you return home, if possible, what your decision is? Oh, Professor Morton, so far as I myself am concerned, I can give you my answer now. Nothing could make me happier than the knowledge that I too might serve my country. President Morton nodded approvingly. I felt sure that such would be your attitude. Of course. I should, before deciding definitely, wish to write to my husband, asking him for his approval of my going over. Naturally, I would suggest that you do this today, as it is desired to get the unit started within the next ten days. Grace said she would immediately send a special delivery letter to Tom. She had already received two letters from him telling her how happy he was and how he looked forward to the great adventure that lay just ahead. He had no idea when the engineers would embark, but hoped it might be soon. "'I shall let you hear from me at the earliest possible moment, Professor,' announced Grace, rising. "'I think, however, that you may count on my joining the unit. As soon as I hear from my husband, I shall telegraph you, and in the meantime, please keep me informed, giving me particulars as to equipment and the like. You may depend upon me, Mrs. Gray.' I wish to add that I am much pleased that you look with favour on the proposal. It is women like yourself that we desire for this unit, which we expect will be a credit to Overton. Thank you, Professor. Grace hurried from the President's office and ran to her room, where she wrote a brief note to Tom, telling him of her opportunity and her desire to join the overseas unit. Next she hurried to the post office, then went in search of J. Elfrida Briggs. Oh, Elfrida, cried Grace the moment she espied her friend. The most wonderful thing has come to pass. Has someone left you a fortune? questioned Miss Briggs. Far better than that. Professor Morton has asked me to join the overseas unit of Overton girls for war work. And you have accepted? Conditionally, I have written to Tom asking his permission to do so. Oh, this married life! Thank heaven that I do not have to ask the permission of any man when I wish to do or not to do a particular thing. Being a bachelor girl has its compensations, observed Elfrida. As well as its disadvantages, retorted Grace. Elfrida, dear, you have no one to ask. You are free to do as you wish, as you say. So why not come along? Please do. 
I have not been asked. You will be, you will be. As they were speaking, one of the girls called to Elfreda that President Morton wished to see her at her convenience. There, I told you so. You will say yes, won't you, Elfreda, dear? pleaded Grace. I should like to. Nothing in the world would give me greater happiness. But it is impossible, Grace. I have an important case on hand that I cannot leave. Perhaps later. Perhaps I may be able to go later, but not now. I will go see what the President wishes, then we will talk this matter over. Shall we meet in our room, say, in half an hour? Grace said this would be agreeable to her, and the two girls separated. So full of anticipation was Grace that she could give little thought to the remaining days of activity at Overton. The word had been quietly passed that a group of Overton girls was going overseas, but who the fortunate ones were was not generally known. The commencement exercises came to a close. Goodbyes were lingered over. Many things were destined to happen before that group of loyal girls again met on the Overton campus and perhaps some of them never would return to the familiar scenes of their college days. President Morton had asked Elfreda to join, but she told him, as she had said to Grace, that at that time it would be impossible for her to join the unit, eager as she was to do so. Grace and Elfreda returned to Haven Home on Wednesday, but to her very great disappointment there was no letter from Tom. After waiting another day, Grace sent a night telegram to Camp Aya, asking for a reply to her letter. Another day elapsed, then came word from the telegraph company. Party has left Camp Aya. They have gone, Alfreda, she said. Now what do you propose to do? What would you do in the circumstances? Do? Why, I should go if I wished to. If Tom has sailed, it will be two months ere you can get a letter to him and have his reply. Long before that, the Overton unit will be in France and at work. That is the way I view the matter. I think I will run over and see Mother and Fairy Godmother and tell them that I have decided to go, after which I will wire President Morton. In the meantime, Alfreda, will you please arrange our affairs so that Tom's property may not suffer from my absence? Oh, I do hope he will approve of my going. We will talk over business matters when you return from Oakdale. I will stay here and look over the papers again, if you will be so kind as to get them for me. Grace was absent for nearly three hours. She returned with heightened colour and sparkling eyes. Mother and Fairy Godmother, after some opposition, had given their rather reluctant consent to Grace's plan. Both believed that Tom would really feel better to know that Grace was near him, and Grace would never forgive herself if she passed her one opportunity to do something for her country. A telegram of acceptance was sent to President Morton by Grace on her way home, and for the remainder of the day she and Alfreda were wholly absorbed in arranging business affairs. It was decided to set aside a certain amount of money that Grace might draw upon, if need, while in France. The power of attorney was assigned to Tom's mother, which was permissible under the power of attorney executed by Tom before he left home. By evening all the legal arrangements had been completed. There only remained the affairs of the house itself to be attended to. These were arranged on the following day. At the end of the week Alfreda was obliged to leave her friend, so Grace closed Haven home and went over to spend the remaining days with her mother and fairy godmother. Her stay was brief, for on the following Tuesday the eagerly looked for telegram came from President Morton. Report to headquarters in New York on Friday the 5th before noon. Grace sat down and wrote to Tom in care of his organisation in France, telling him that he probably would not hear from her again until after she reached Paris, and expressing the earnest hope that he would approve of her going. On Thursday, before leaving for New York, Grace went alone in her car to Haven Home, where she spent several hours amid the familiar scenes where she and Tom had spent so many, many happy hours in the brief period of their wedded life. She finally reluctantly stepped into her car and drove away, turning her head once for a final look at the green carpeted lawns and at Haven Home, standing dazzling white in the afternoon sun. Goodbye, old home she said. 
May we both live to spend many happy years with you. That night Grace entrained for New York, destined to pass through many thrilling experiences, ere she again gazed fondly on the house behind the world. End of chapter 4 Recording by Ashley Jane Chapter 5 of Grace Harlow Overseas by Jessie Graham Flower This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ashley Jane Chapter 5 When the Blow Fell Oh, Grace! Arlene Thayer, is it possible? cried Grace. Yes, but that is not all. Look behind you, directed Arlene. Grace's face flushed as her eyes met the smiling faces of Anne Pearson, Mabel Ash, and Ruth Denton. There were little exclamations of delight from each. And you girls never said a word to me about it, chided Grace. We wished to surprise you, said Arlene, so we requested Professor Morton not to tell you that we were going. We have been here ever since headquarters opened this morning, coming straight here to the Red Cross offices from our trains. There are a number of others from Overton who are to be here, some of whom I do not think you know. What makes you so late? The orders said any time before noon. It is not yet noon. I had a few errands to do and some money to exchange, which I thought best to attend to, not knowing whether we were to set sail today or not. Not until ten o'clock tomorrow morning, dear, Anne Pearson informed her. We sail on the SS Holborn, and if the good ship doesn't sink, it will be the first time that something dreadful did not happen when Grace Harlow was at hand. Remember, Anne, I am no longer Grace Harlow. I am Grace Grey. My unlucky luck has changed, so you are perfectly safe in sailing with me. To whom do we report here? To Mr. Conway, who has charge of the college units going over. Arlene will take you in and introduce you. Then Mr. Conway will take your pedigree and your fingerprints, etc. Arlene is our self-appointed mouthpiece, or has been. Now that Grace Harlow has arrived, I reckon she will be the leading spirit of this outfit. I cheerfully resign in her favour, spoke up Arlene. If you are ready, we will go in, Grace. Mr. Conway greeted Grace cordially, taking her in in one appraising glance. I have a most cordial letter from President Morton regarding you, Mrs. Gray, he said. In view of what the President of Overton has written, I have decided to place you in charge of the unit on the voyage. Of course, when you reach France, that arrangement is subject to change. Here is your passport. Have you a recent photograph of yourself? I have brought two for the purpose, Grace informed him, handing over the photographs. I see you come forearmed, smiled Mr. Conway. I will take you to the wardrobe director who will fit you out with uniforms, which will be ready for you late this afternoon. Your luggage must be on board ship tonight. At four this afternoon you will report here for such instructions as I have to give you regarding your unit en route. May I ask what our assignments are to be overseas? That will depend upon what the individual is best fitted for and what the director in Paris may decide to give you. It is not probable that the unit will operate in France as a unit, however. So I have been given to understand. Your party must be on board not later than nine o'clock in the morning. Please inform each person individually. That will be all for the present. I am glad to know you, Mrs. Gray, and am certain that you and your unit will do most excellent work in France. It is such material as this unit is made up of that we are in search of. The wardrobe director, a motherly-faced woman, grey-haired and kindly, fitted two uniforms to Grace. There were some alterations to be made, but she informed Grace that the uniforms would be ready by three o'clock that afternoon. Grace and her old friends then went out to luncheon together, where they discussed their voyage and the work that lay ahead of them in France. By the way, Arlene, I forgot to tell you that Mr. Conway has appointed a more competent person for your job. I'm to be in charge of the unit on the way over. Sorry, but merit always wins. Not at all, 
I suggested that you were the proper person, nor do I envy your job. Deliver me from having the responsibility of looking out for a shipload of seasick girls. I say I suggested you as the leader. I did, but Mr. Conway said that he already had you in mind. It seems that someone had written to him about you. Grace Harlow, have you been playing politics, pulling wires to get yourself into a good job? I deny the allegation, replied Grace laughingly. If my recollection serves me right, Mrs. Gray was something of a politician when she first came to Overton, interjected Mabel. She was. She got herself elected to pretty nearly everything in sight, declared Ruth. Grace laughed merrily. We might as well laugh while we still have laughs left in us, Grace said. Soon, I fear, we shall not be laughing. I know that what I shall see in France will give me a heartache that I shall not get over for many a long day. Come, girls, I suggest that we return to headquarters and see what we can pick up in the way of information. According to arrangement, Mr. Conway made a long talk to the unit, after which he gave Grace detailed instructions as to the regulations which would apply to her unit on the voyage. Remember, was his parting injunction, that the moment you set foot on the deck of the Holborn, you become a part of the forces of the United States and subject to all the rules and regulations of the military establishment. An hour later, Grace Harlow Gray put on her uniform, the natty blue of the overseas units, the collar bearing the insignia USA. A dark blue felt hat completed the outfit. The spare uniform was packed in the regulation trunk, together with such other belongings as she was permitted to take with her. The others of the merit did likewise, and their trunks were carried away to the ship. Grace gave her final instructions to her party before they left headquarters for the night. The pier and the ship were surging masses of khaki when Grace reached there next morning. Men were surging up the gangway, bent over under their heavy equipment. Orders were being shouted everywhere. It was a scene of confusion such as she had never witnessed, but this was war, as Grace Grey realised when she gazed at the long slender guns mounted fore and aft and to starboard and port on the upper deck of the ship. If one of those things goes off while I am on this ship, I know I shall jump overboard, declared Anne Pearson. You will do nothing so foolish, rebuked Grace. Remember, I am responsible for your well-being on this voyage. After you reach France, you may jump overboard as many times as pleases your fancy. My responsibility ends the moment the ship is tied up to her pier over there. After all the members of the unit had reported to her, Grace assigned them to their quarters, of which she had a list supplied by Mr. Conway. The unit's quarters were on the upper deck, where the officers were quartered, and to accommodate all of the young women, even majors were obliged to sleep four in a cabin. The Overton girls were packed into their cabins in the same proportion, four in a room. That evening there was a dance on the upper deck, a dance from which the privates down on the well deck and in the hold were barred. Grace was kept fully occupied in attending to her charges and dancing with the officers, among whom she was the most popular person on the ship before that evening's entertainment was ended. It was to be the last night of dancing, for, after that first evening, no lights were to be permitted on board, save the dim green corridor lights. There was, however, no objection to their dancing in the daytime. Colonel Ward was the commander of the regiment on board, and Grace at the first opportunity made his acquaintance, and from him obtained permission to arrange for a dance for the men of the regiment and the sailors after mess that afternoon. Permission was readily granted, and the Overton units won the hearts of the regiment, and incidentally nearly danced their shoes from their feet in trying to dance with every man on board. It was too big a contract for even an Overton unit, and when the dancing came to an end on account of darkness, there were about two thousand men still waiting to dance with a little group of tired but bright-eyed young women. Grace promised them that they should have their dance at another time, if she should catch the colonel in a good humour. By the following morning several ships had joined the convoy, having three destroyers with them, one on either side and the third one some distance ahead of the convoy. 
Watches were stationed at many places on the deck and in the crow's nest, where there always was a double watch, two men instead of one, as is the custom in peace times. The sea was smooth and there was little wind, though the ship rolled quite heavily at times. Anne Pearson of Grace's set was the only one who was seasick, and she required the services of the regimental surgeon. Grace spent considerable time among the men, with whom she grew more popular with the hours. She chatted with them and wrote letters home for those who were ill, filling up each hour with useful work and impressing certain members of her unit into the work as well. Colonel Ward congratulated her. You were doing more than you realised to make the men contented. Their morale is splendid when you consider that the majority of these men have never been a day's ride from their own homes before leaving for their mobilisation camp. Should we have the misfortune to get mixed up with an undersea boat, I think you will find that they will give a good account of themselves. The credit for this will in no small measure be due to the work of your unit. May I ask when you plan giving the men another dance? Now, if it suits your pleasure, Colonel. You may call on the Overton girls at any time, day or night, for any service they are able to render. We are going over for service, sir. What better service can we give them by making the way a little easier for the men who are offering their lives for us? I am afraid I have expressed myself badly, but I think you will understand the deep-seated motive that has led these young women of Overton to join this unit. I do understand, my dear lady. You are Americans, that is all that is necessary to be said of your motives. Let me see, it is now six bells, eleven o'clock. Mess will be over at about one thirty. Say we call the dance for two o'clock? Thank you. I will have the girls of my outfit at hand. Might I suggest, Colonel, that you ask some of those YMCA girl war workers to join us in dancing with the men? Thus far they seem to have nothing to do but parade the promenade deck with your most estimable young officers. Not that I blame them, Colonel, but the need, it seems to me, is for them below decks. The Colonel laughed heartily. You are right, Mrs. Gray. I'll see what I can do. The result of what I can do was three Y girls making a party of a total of twenty-three, including the Overton unit, for the dance, and being still too ill to dance. A piano and two banjos supplied the music. The men were not informed of what was in store for them until the music struck up and the Overton unit ran laughing down to the well deck. Here we are, buddies. Choose your partners, but do not keep them for too long, called Grace. The men uttered a cheer, and Colonel Ward, standing at the rail of the promenade deck, looking down on the scene, chuckled approvingly. There's a young woman worthwhile said the colonel, turning to one of his captains, who had come up with others to watch the dancing below. Who is she? Mrs. Grace Gray is her name. I believe her husband is in the service. She is in charge of the Overton College unit, and every one of that unit is of the same type, intelligent, cultured, and Americans to the marrow. I see only three of the Y girls down here. I suppose the others are entertaining our young lieutenants up on the boat deck. The captain shrugged his shoulders. They are not quite in the same class with these young women, I should say, by which remark I mean no disparagement to the YMCA workers, many of whom are doing good work in France, I am told. Be good sports now and give the boys who failed to find a partner the last time a chance to dance now. That's right, don't be backward urged Grace. A space had been cleared immediately upon the arrival of the girls, and ere she had finished speaking a big doughboy had grabbed Grace and stepped off in a lively foxtrot. I'll take the next one before I give you up, announced the doughboy with some emphasis. Oh no, look at those poor fellows washing us. Have a heart, buddy, she protested. All right, I'll give you up, but I don't want to. He agreed with a sigh of resignation that caused Grace to laugh merrily. Leaving her partner, Grace made straight for a young soldier whom she had been observing as she danced. He was very young, but big of frame, and probably had been a farm boy before going into the service. 
It was the lonely, hungry look on his face that attracted her attention, and she determined to shake him up. Come along, buddy. This is our dance, she cried cheerily, lifting an arm to be swung into the next dance. The boy blushed until his face was rosy red. I'm... I'm afraid I can't, miss, he stammered. I'm clumsy as an off-ox, and my shoes are big, and... and I don't know how to dance very well. Nonsense! You come along. I've got a big boy like you in the service, too. And I should thank some nice girl if she asked him to dance with her. You... you have a boy, uh... He's my husband, buddy, and I am used to having him step on my toes. Dancing is not one of his accomplishments. The doughboy, without further opposition, swung Grace out to the open deck and they began their dance. She found him more diffident than awkward, and after a few moments he danced very well indeed. "'You are homesick today, aren't you?' she demanded. "'Well, yes, I guess I am a little,' he admitted. "'I thought so. You will forget all that after you get to beautiful France. What is your name?' "'Jonas Bartles. I live on a farm in Pennsylvania.' "'Well, don't get homesick any more, or I shall have to come down and cheer you up.' Now I must hunt up some other homesick boy and give him a dance. Grace gave Jonas a winning smile and a warm hand clasp and in a few seconds had chosen another lonely soldier boy for a partner. As she passed the members of her unit in the dance, she called them to pick out the boys who needed cheering up. They all do, answered Arlene Thayer. No twenty-three girls ever worked harder than the Overton girls did that day, and after half an hour every one of them was at the point of exhaustion, as Grace saw, but all were smiling, wholeheartedly hiding their weariness from the eager doughboys. "'When you ladies get tired, let me know and we will stop the party,' was the message the Colonel sent down by an orderly. "'Tell the Colonel we haven't yet begun,' was the word Grace returned to the commanding officer. A sudden crash from one of the three-inch guns on the upper deck shook the ship, and the music stopped instantly. The first shot was followed by a second, and then a third. "'Go on, music. They're only trying out their guns,' called Grace. "'Play. On with the dance.' Grace, however, knew very well that it was not a mere tryout, for she had seen some officers running to their stations. The musicians, taking their cue from her, resumed their playing, and the doughboys began to dance again, though those who were not dancing peered over the bullocks to learn what the guns were shooting at. What they saw appeared to interest them very much, but they were game and did not raise their voices to alarm the dancers. Guns now began to fire from other ships of the convoy. The dancers could hear them above the music of the pianos and the banjos. Meanwhile, the guns of the Holborn were firing rapidly. Suddenly, there was a jolt that made the big ship tremble. She seemed to pause in her rapid flight and then stagger on like a wounded thing, following the explosion that came immediately after the jolt. It was not a deafening explosion, but a muffled, far-away roar. "'I reckon it is time to stop,' Grace confided to her dancing partner. "'Yes, we are struck,' he answered. The big siren of the steamer began to blare the call to quarters. Officers on deck were shouting out orders, and it seemed as though all were in confusion on the upper decks. It was confusion, but orderly confusion, as it were. Grace's girls hurried to her side. "'Go immediately to our boat and await orders,' she directed. "'Let the boys up fast.' The boys would have none of it. One by one they boosted the Overton girls up to the promenade deck, cheering as they did so. "'Are we in a serious condition, Colonel?' questioned Grace calmly as they passed Colonel Ward. "'The ship is sinking,' was the brief reply. "'She will be down in ten minutes.'" End of chapter 5 Recording by Ashley Jane Chapter 6 of Grace Harlow Overseas by Jessie Graham Flower. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ashley Jane. Chapter 6 Adrift at Sea. 
The Holborn had been struck amidships by an enemy torpedo, killing several of the engine room and fire room forces and wounding others. Wounded men already were being brought to the deck and loaded into lifeboats. All women into the boats, bellowed the captain of the sinking ship. It was then that Grace first realised that Anne was not with them. With a little exclamation, she ran aft to the cabin where Anne Pearson slept. Anne lay on the cabin floor, pale and motionless. Anne, Anne, do you hear? Speak to me, dear, begged Grace. There was no response, and Grace gathered her up in her own arms and staggered out to the deck with her burden. There an officer sprang to her assistance and took the unconscious Anne in his arms. Boat number 17 directed Grace, noting the quick glance of inquiry of the officer. He carried Anne to the lifeboat, beside which the Overton girl stood, a little pale but calm and emotionless so far as exterior evidences went. The Overton girls were in their places a moment later, and while waiting for the lifeboat to be lowered away, had opportunity to gaze about them. Off to starboard they saw another ship with its bow buried in the sea, its propellers standing high above the water and whirling dizzily. Lifeboats surrounded it. They noted, too, that the other transports of the convoy had not stopped, but had continued on their course, while two of the destroyers were dashing madly here and there, dropping depth bombs that sent up great columns of water. Boats loaded with khaki-clad figures were going over the side, the doughboys setting up a great chorus of, Where do we go from here, boys? Several other passengers, including a crew to man the boat, were shipped with the number 17 lifeboat, and at the command, lower away, the heavy boat settled rapidly down to the water and cast off. Pull away quickly! All boats in the clear! bellowed an officer through a megaphone. Oh, look! cried Anne, suddenly sitting up in the boat where Arlene and Grace had been working over her. Look at the funny ship! The funny ship was standing poised on its nose, and while they were looking it slipped quietly down into the depths and disappeared. It is terrible, but it is war, murmured Grace. What happened to you, Anne? The explosion threw me down, and I guess I must have bumped my head. Was anyone else hurt? I fear quite a few were hurt, replied Grace. See how splendidly our boys are carrying themselves. I'm proud, so proud. Boats keep together, bellowed the captain. Oh, why doesn't he get off the ship? demanded Ruth anxiously. If it isn't going to sink, why didn't we stay on board rather than come out here in this little cockle shell? Look and you will be answered, returned Grace sharply. They saw the Holborn listing heavily and settling by the stern, and the Overton girls uttered gasps as what was once a thing of life plunged stern first into the deep. The struggling figures in the water where the ship had gone down were being picked up by other lifeboats that had come as close as they dared. Then, little by little, a veil was drawn over the scene that at first only the sailors in the lifeboat and Grace Harlow understood. The two destroyers that were searching for the undersea boat, the cause of all this destruction and loss of life, began blowing their sirens to give the lifeboats their position. Fog, nodded Grace to the quartermaster who was in charge of the lifeboat. The quartermaster answered with a nod. All hands listen, he commanded. If you hear a destroyer coming, set up a yell. Why should we yell? demanded Ruth Denton, her teeth all a chatter, for the fog was cold and penetrating. So they did not run us down, replied Grace Harlow briefly. Grace was concerned. She had been to sea before, and she knew the perils of a fog at sea better, perhaps, than any of her companions, other than the sailors themselves. Her concern deepened as the whistles of the destroyers grew fainter and fainter, until finally they died out entirely. Fortunately, the sea was reasonably calm, though a heavy swell was running and several of the occupants of the boat became violently ill. Darkness finally settled over the sea. The grey, 
chill fog accentuating the pall of blackness that had swallowed them up. We shall have to make the best of our position for tonight, announced the quartermaster. After setting a light, he took from the locker some sea biscuit and water and passed them around, assisted by Grace. It was not much of a meal, but it put heart into all of them. Grace announced that she was going to stand watch, then assisted her companions to comfortable positions, covering them with heavy blankets. Quartermaster, I wish you and your men would turn in. There is nothing for you to do, and I can keep the lookout. If I hear anything, I will call you, she urged. No, miss, thank you. We gobs will stand our own watches. We cannot think of permitting a lady to do it for us. You are fine, and you're no fair-weather sailor. That is the best compliment you could pay me, answered Grace, laughing a little. Ruth was moaning in her sleep, but the others had quieted down. After a time Grace permitted herself to nod, but quickly recovered herself and remained awake through the rest of the night. Day dawned with the fog still thick, then it slowly changed to a whitish grey as the sun rose and grew thinner and thinner under the increasing heat of the sun's rays. After a little there remained only wisps of fog that, like spectres, stood up from the sea, swaying back and forth, blown this way and that by the brisk morning breeze that had sprung up. It was all very beautiful to Grace Harlow, but as her gaze swept the sea and found it empty of every living thing save for a flock of seagulls that were circling low above them, her heart sank within her. The sailors gave her a cheery good morning, and then one by one the Overton girls and the other passengers, all women, sat up, rubbed their eyes, and gazed about them. "'We are all at sea, girls,' cried Grace in a merry voice. "'You might as well go back to sleep.' "'No, then I think I will get breakfast. Quartermaster, may I serve breakfast now?' "'Yes, miss.' He was a little hollow-eyed, and so were the members of his little crew. While Grace was setting out the sea biscuit and jam from the supplies stored in the boat's locker, the quartermaster stepped the mast, bent a sail, and with the boat's compass on the seat beside him, laid his course to the eastward. "'How far do we have to go before we can hope to reach land?' questioned Arlene. "'About a thousand miles, miss.' Ruth Denton groaned dismally. "'I shall be a wreck on the shoal of life long before that.' she declared hopelessly. The little boat gathered headway, heeling over under the wind pressure on the sail and sending a spray of salt water into the air. Grace found herself wondering if this were the end of her earthly ambitions as well as those of her much-loved companions. Then her thoughts turned to Tom Gray. The war might claim her instead of the husband who had gone away to war. She suddenly straightened up and peered ahead. The quartermaster, observing her action, began sweeping the sea with his eyes. "'Just to the left of the mast,' Grace advised him in a low tone. "'I see it,' he answered as the lifeboat rose on a swell. The quartermaster let go the sheet and, creeping forward, lowered the sail and unstepped the mast so that the lifeboat might be less conspicuous. "'What is it?' questioned the Overton girls in chorus. Only the periscope of an undersea boat, my dears, Grace made reply. Please do not let it disturb you. They can't do any worse than they already have done. I would suggest you all lie down so that in case they sight us they will believe us to be an abandoned lifeboat drifting. Yes, everybody down, ordered the quartermaster, at the same time taking in the sail. I will keep the watch. A moment more and the small boat was drifting and wallowing in the trough of the sea with the quartermaster peering cautiously over the gunwale. "'Do you see it still?' questioned Grace. "'Yes, they are coming up. I do not believe they have sighted us, and I hope they don't. There they are in the clear.' He crouched lower. "'They have opened the hatch and are coming out on deck.' "'Then they will see us,' declared Grace. "'We are too close to be missed.' Her face wore a troubled look, for none knew better than she what a perilous position they were in. To be made prisoners on a German U-boat was well-nigh unthinkable. "'What is it?' whispered Arlene, noting the change in Grace's expression. "'They are on the surface, and we are in great peril.' 
but above all, be calm, all of you, and leave the rest to our commander. No one replied. The Overton girls were too plucky to give way to their emotions. They have sighted us. There they come, announced the quartermaster. End of chapter 6 Recording by Ashley Jane Chapter 7 of Grace Harlow Overseas by Jessie Graham Flower This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ashley Jane Chapter 7 Grace Harlow's Strategy would it be possible to run away from them? questioned Grace. The quartermaster shook his head. Even if we were fast enough to do that, their guns would reach us and blow us out of the water. They probably would shoot us up anyway if we tried it. I wish I had a gun. Please put up the sail at least, begged Grace. After a moment's reflection, the quartermaster decided to do this, as it would be so much easier than using the oars, and besides some manoeuvring would be necessary to bring the lifeboat alongside the undersea boat, which he knew very well he would be ordered to do. The mast was stepped and the sail bent on by the crew, as calmly as though they were not an enemy submarine within a thousand miles of them. As the quartermaster hauled the sheet in and the small boat put its nose into the sea, there came a sharp report and a shell whistled low overhead. Grace thought she felt the breath of it as it passed, the shot was put over so close to them. The quartermaster came about quickly. Don't go close enough to them so that they can get us aboard, not yet, please, urged Grace, placing a hand on the tiller arm of the quartermaster. I've got to, miss but I won't until they order us to lay alongside. Boat ahoy! Who are you? demanded a voice through a megaphone from the undersea boat. Castaways from the SS Holborn, flung back the quartermaster. Who have you aboard? Red Cross women. Any officers? No, just the crew to man the boat. Have your party stand up to be looked over. One woman is too sick to stand up answered the quartermaster. Stand up, was the stern command. The girls got unsteadily to their feet, holding to each other for support, the helmsman in the meantime wiring slowly back and forth about a hundred yards from the rolling undersea boat. Where were you bound for? Can't say. That's right, don't you give him information, approved Grace. I don't intend to, miss. The submarine slowly circled the lifeboat then lay to a little nearer than before. They were looking out for tricks, but Grace Harlow's unit had no tricks to play. Lay alongside, was the order issued from the submarine. Come in slowly. Quartermaster, whispered Grace. There was a tenseness in her voice that startled the stolid quartermaster. What is it? he demanded in a low tone. There is a ship coming up. I wasn't certain at first, but now I can make her out quite clearly when we rise on a swell. Be careful that the German do not see you looking. Oh, do keep off a little longer. The quartermaster uttered an exclamation. It's a destroyer, miss. Thank God. Talk to the officer there and kill all the time you can so the destroyer may get closer before the submarine folk see her. Oh, I do hope she is able to surprise them. Good business, muttered the quartermaster. You have a head on your shoulders, miss. The quartermaster immediately began having trouble with his boat. Somehow she wouldn't steer. She zigzagged and plunged and heeled until all hands were hanging to the gunwales, momentarily looking to being dumped into the sea. What's the matter? bellowed the commander of the undersea boat. She doesn't handle. Something the matter with the tiller or the rudder, sir. They are coming, warned Grace. Keep them busy until the very last minute. Can't the destroyer shoot her at so far away? They are within range, miss, but they probably do not dare risk a shot fearing to hit us. Oh, lay to, we will come alongside, ordered the commanding officer of the German boat. The lifeboat still continued to perform strange antics, however. Lay to, or I'll blow you out of the water. As if to emphasise his threat, the U-boat commander fired another shot over the small boat. Will it do any good if I ask him to go away and leave us, that we are only women? questioned Arlene. 
Both Grace and the quartermaster smiled. Keep quiet. The quartermaster is in command here. He will do what is best for us so far as possible, advised Grace, casting anxious glances at the rapidly approaching destroyer. She could not understand why the German commander had not sighted the other boat, but he was so much interested in the lifeboat that his watchfulness was relaxed for the moment. The lifeboat had been hove to, but was still under slow motion, and the U-boat was approaching barely under steerage way. Soon the two boats would be alongside each other, then it would be too late. How long will it take for the destroyer to get here? whispered Grace. Five minutes, about. And how long will it take the submarine to go down? Probably about the same length of time. No less than four minutes. Then, quartermaster, I think it is time that we get away from here as fast as sail power will carry us, decided Grace. Yes, and get blown to pieces, growled the petty officer. It won't do, miss. They're standing by to assist us aboard the Heine boat. Bad luck to them, continued the quartermaster in a low tone of voice. Prepare to come aboard, was the next command from the U-boat skipper. At this juncture Grace Harlow stood up boldly, her hair blowing about her face in the wind. Get ready to sail out of here, quartermaster. We must get out of the way so the destroyer can punish this fellow. Then placing both hands about her mouth, Grace raised her voice in a shout. I don't think we will go on aboard your boat today, Captain, she called. What? Look behind you and you will discover the reason why, she added, pointing toward the destroyer that was rushing toward them, throwing great billows of water from her knife-like bows. Quick, quartermaster, sail for all you are worth and give the destroyer a chance. As she said this, Grace threw her hat overboard, tossing it as far toward the U-boat as she could, and grabbing the hats of three of her companions, she sent them hurtling toward the German. The quartermaster had brought his boat about so quickly that it shipped quite a volume of water. On the U-boat there was instant confusion. Those in the small boat heard the hatch cover go down with a bang and saw the bow of the submarine point gradually downward. Half her conning tower was out of sight in a few seconds, while the lifeboat, now under good headway, was putting water between itself and the German. Out there on the water, but a few yards from the submerging submarine, the girls could easily make out the four bobbing hats that Grace had tossed overboard. No one had thought to question Grace's strange action in throwing them overboard, and the quartermaster was too busy trying to get away from the scene to think about her reason for doing so. The German boat sank out of sight, while the destroyer was still some little distance away. The dashing war vessel seemed to veer a little then, as if she had just discovered them, plunging straight toward the bobbing red cross hats. Hold fast, girls, warned Grace, well knowing what was coming. We are going to get a shaking up. The destroyer dropped a depth bomb a few yards to the right of their hats. None of those in the lifeboat knew when the bomb was let go, but a few seconds later they knew that it had exploded. At their distance from the destroyer, the explosion of a depth bomb would have caused a big ship to be severely jolted, and it can be imagined what such an explosion was likely to do to a comparatively frail lifeboat. The little boat was lifted free of the sea, and the occupants of it hurled in all directions. Sailors, Overton girls, and the other passengers landed stunned in the sea. When the lifeboat started away from the submarine, Grace passed life preservers to the boat's company and directed her girls to put them on but the sailors shook their heads. They were willing to take their chances, and not one would don a life preserver, knowing that he would be laughed at by his companions. Grace Harlow was almost tempted to remove her own, but her judgment told her to keep it on, and it was well for her that she did so, for following the first bomb, several more were dropped in rapid succession, stunning the women of the party to the point of unconsciousness in some instances. Grace, though dazed, managed to retain her senses, although each explosion seemed to be tearing her to pieces. It was a sensation that she never forgot. Grace recovered rapidly and went at once to the assistance of the girls of her unit, assembling them as rapidly as possible at the overturned boat, where they were able to cling to the lifelines. 
The quartermaster, stunned at first like the others, had quickly recovered himself and aided in the work of rescue. So busy were they with their own rescue that none of the party had had time to give thought to the destroyer and her prey, the German U-boat. Gasping, half-drowned, still dazed from their terrific experience, they clung to the lines, seeing nothing of what was going on over there beyond the swells, and wondering vaguely why the destroyer did not come to their rescue. None of the castaways had seen a black column of water shoot up following the discharge of a depth bomb, nor the rise of oil and a certain tell-tale wreckage to the surface of the sea. To make certain that their work was thoroughly done, the destroyer put over another bomb, then started out in search of the mysterious cutter that had slipped out of sight after leaving a mark for the warship. At last the officers on the bridge saw the lifeboat, bottom side up and nearly half a mile away. They drew in as close as safety permitted and put out a cutter manned by strong arms and soon reached the exhausted Overton girls and their ship-wrecked associates. The women were dragged aboard first, then the crew of Grace's boat were hauled in. All the girls, with the exception of Grace, were dazed from their experiences. Grace was weary to the point of physical exhaustion, but her mind was alert and active, and it was pure willpower that enabled her to keep up long enough to assist in getting her charges into the other boat, where most of the girls sank down in a half-stupor. Ruth and Anne had suffered the most, but the others were in none too good condition. A side gangway had been put over from the destroyer, and up this the shipwrecked passengers were assisted, Grace standing by on the platform until the last of her girls were on their way up. They presented a bedraggled and miserable appearance when the company assembled on the deck of the destroyer. Grace saluted the commanding officer gravely, which was answered in kind by that officer, a lieutenant commander. "'What ship is this?' was Grace's first question. U.S. Destroyer Crawford, are you in charge of this party? Yes, sir. We're the Overton College unit going over for the Red Cross. I'm Grace Harlow Gray. Thank you for rescuing us, for we were in rather a bad way. If all men of the sea knew how to take care of themselves as well as you have shown your ability to do so, we would have a different breed of sailors. May I ask whose idea it was tossing those hats over? Grace admitted that she had tossed them over, hoping that the destroyer officers would see them and understand that she had thrown the hats away to mark the disappearing point of the U-boat. Fine strategy. It gave us a good mark to shoot at. Thank you, answered Grace simply. I am afraid we cannot do much for you in the way of clothes, but you had better put your young women to bed at once. I will see that warm drinks are served to them and that their wet clothing is dried and ironed. Destroyers do not carry very extensive wardrobes, you know, added the lieutenant commander smilingly. The party was then assigned to cabins. Grace saw that every member of her party was well rubbed down and tucked under warm blankets before she gave any attention to herself. Then, undressing and throwing her bedraggled garments out into the corridor, she dropped into her bunk and lost herself to the world. She did not awaken until after daylight the following morning. Each girl upon awaking found that her clothing, thoroughly dried and ironed, had been tossed into her cabin some time in the night. Grace dressed with considerable care, combed and groomed her golden brown hair with infinite care, and putting on an officer's cap that she found with her clothing, stepped out and began searching for the members of her unit. End of chapter 7 Recording by Ashley Jane Chapter 8 of Grace Harlow Overseas by Jesse Graham Flower. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ashley Jane. Chapter 8 In Beautiful France. Come, wake up, Arline. You have nearly slept the clock round, chided Grace. Your clothes are here, and I see an officer's cap that has been provided by our thoughtful hosts. Those poor fellows would go without everything for the sake of making a woman comfortable. Such is the spirit of Uncle Sam's navy, to which this ship belongs. What is the matter with you, Ruth? Oh, Grace, I was deathly seasick last night. How do you know you were seasick? Why, Arlene said I was, because... I thought so, 
replied Grace, laughing merrily. Get up now. The sea is quieting down, and I presume we shall have some breakfast before long, which will put new life into us all. I must confess that I am literally famished. I must go see how it has fared with the rest of the girls. Come out as soon as you are dressed and get the air. Air? Grace Harlowe, don't you ever dare say air to me again so long as you live. I have had enough air and water to last me a dozen lifetimes. But I will come out if I can manage to stand on my feet long enough to get out. This thing rolls around worse than the lifeboat did. Grace went out laughing and chuckling to herself. She found Anne dressing and Miriam fully dressed save for her hair, which she was brushing out into long strands with infinite care. Vanity, vanity, cried Grace gaily. Judging from appearances, I should say that you had spent some time on your own hair this morning, retorted Miriam. I was thinking this morning that could our husbands have seen us when we came aboard this ship, they would love us no more. Vanity again. I must see the lieutenant commander and find out what his plans are with reference to us. Grace stepped out to the deck and asked a junior lieutenant where the commanding officer was. She was informed that he was on the bridge, but that he was instructed to say to Mrs. Gray that breakfast would be served in the mess room at seven o'clock, and that the lieutenant commander would join them there at that time. Will you kindly convey my compliments to your commanding officer and say that I should like to speak with him when he is at leisure? The lieutenant bowed and touched his cap. The commanding officer came down almost immediately. He was instantly struck by Grace's beauty, and she flushed ever so little as she recognised that fact. Good morning, Captain, greeted Grace easily. Or should I not call you Captain? I am Lieutenant Commander Barber. Acting as captain of this ship, then I shall call you captain. Lieutenant Commander is such a long title to handle. First, I wish to thank you for your generous hospitality to myself and the young ladies of our unit. Secondly, if I may do so, I should like to ask what disposition is to be made of us. I can readily understand that women on board a destroyer are something of a burden. Indeed not, I assure you, Mrs. Gray. We do, however, regret that we can offer you neither conveniences nor comforts. I should call what you have offered us nothing less than luxury after what we have been through. Are you able to give me any information about the boats from the Holborn? All except one are accounted for, and that probably will turn up unless they got caught in the blow last night. As for your previous question, we are on station here and cannot go in. I have, however, asked permission to transfer you to another destroyer that we expect to pick up late this afternoon or early evening. She is going to Brest. Will that be agreeable to you? Grace said that it would suit their purposes very nicely and that they undoubtedly could get passage to Paris from there. The lieutenant commander questioned Grace in detail about the other members of her unit, how they had slept and how they were feeling that morning. She assured him that the Overton girls were in excellent condition, a little worse for wear so far as their clothing was concerned, but otherwise all right. In this connection, Captain, I wish to say a word for your quartermaster and the men of his crew. Their attitude was splendid, and they proved themselves to be brave fellows. I hope I am not asking too much when I request that we have an opportunity to thank each one of them personally. You shall have that privilege, of course, bowed the officer. What you call brave applies to the entire United States Navy, Mrs. Gray, added the lieutenant commander proudly. Yes, I know, and it makes one proud to realise that he or she is an American. I must return to my station now, but hope to have the pleasure of meeting you at breakfast. The freedom of the ship is yours. You and your friends will use it and its service as if it were your own home. Thank you answered Grace, bringing a hand to the visor of her cap in correct salute. Lieutenant Commander Barber's observant eyes noted the firmness of the slender brown hand at salute as he returned the courtesy. He noted, too, that there was even more than great beauty in Grace Harlow Gray's face, that there were character and culture as well as firmness and resolute purpose in her expression, and thus observing, he understood why she had been able to accomplish what she had done in the face of such tremendous odds. 
Breakfast that morning was a most cheerful function, and everyone was happy except the officers who were on duty, for they were denied what would have been an enjoyable occasion. At breakfast the lieutenant commander asked questions about their experiences in and following the disaster. He assured them that their particular U-boat would sink no more ships, that she, or what was left of her, now lay at the bottom of the sea. After breakfast I will show you how depth bombs are dropped. Of course all these matters are secret and some of them I can neither show nor tell you about. The bombs and the dropping mechanism, while secret contrivances, have their secret so hidden that the lay mind cannot discover it. It is all very interesting. I am sure that each of us will be glad of the opportunity to learn all we can about what our glorious Navy is doing. Of one thing we are certain of our own knowledge. It has saved our lives and punished those who would take our lives. So you see, Captain, we have reason to appreciate Uncle Sam's naval establishment. You say the other destroyer is going into Brest. That is the present intention, I believe. She has been out with a convoy, and there being no ships to convoy at the moment, she is going back for minor repairs to her boilers, which can better be made in port than at sea. Following breakfast, the Overton girls were shown all over the ship, its intricate machinery explained, though it is doubtful if any of them obtained even the remotest idea of what it was all about. The officers of the ship were introduced, and during the afternoon Grace and her companions at different times met the men who had composed the crew of the cutter. Each girl of the outfit thanked each member of the cutter's crew, simply but with a sincerity that brought flushes of pleasure to many weather-beaten faces that had not known a blush in perhaps many years. It was not until about eight bells, four o'clock that afternoon, that the commanding officer sent his orderly to Grace to inform her that the destroyer that was to take them aboard was coming up on the horizon. Grace hurried to the deck and gazed at the sea in all directions, but she saw nothing that looked like a ship. The lieutenant commander, peering over the bridge rail, observed her perplexity. Come up, if you will, Mrs. Gray, and I will show you the Johnson, that being the name of the approaching destroyer. Now do you see her? he teased. Grace confessed that she did not. Here is the glass. Look directly at the horizon about three points from the port bow, and I think you will be able to make her out. Grace had not the slightest idea where three points from the port bow might be, but she took a chance and guessed at it. Find her? I don't know. I see something that looks like two masts sticking up out of the water on the horizon, but no ship. That is the Johnson, chuckled the master. May I ask how you know? By the set and rake of her sticks just as you would recognise the position in walking of a person that you knew well. She will be up in forty minutes, so please have the young ladies ready. Destroyers are always in a hurry, you know. Just forty minutes later a boat was being put over the side, and after bidding goodbye to the ship's officers, not forgetting the crew of the cutter, Grace and her friends went over the side and set out for the Johnson over a lumpy sea. They were warmly welcomed by the commander, Captain MacLeod, with whom Lieutenant Commander Barber had communicated by radio, giving him briefly the facts about the passengers who were on the way over to the Johnson. The Johnson was somewhat larger than the destroyer the Overton girls had just left, but the cabins were just as tiny, and every other part of the ship just as much filled up. The only place where there was more room was on the deck, lengthwise. The girls made friends with officers and crew before mess time that evening. After mess, Grace dug up some music in the shape of a thick troller, and, with the captain's permission, gave a dance for the men of the crew. It was a red-letter evening for the gobs, and it was all too short to suit them, for the dancing ceased with the falling of darkness, as no lights must be shown. After that you could almost lead my men to desert ship, laughed Captain MacLeod. I take it that your heart is with the enlisted men. In a way it is. My husband from choice is an enlisted man in the army. Perhaps I should say a volunteer. We are going over to help the men of the ranks in every way possible, because they are the ones who need help and woman's comforting. Yes, agreed the captain. It is a noble work. There are plenty of American women now in France doing war work. 
or rather who think they are doing war work, but there is room, oceans of it, for such work as you and your unit are proposing to do. I wish you all success, and I know that it will be yours. Thank you, Captain. We shall do our best. The day after tomorrow morning we hope to land you at Brest, unless we are ordered to some other port, and you will soon thereafter be on your way to your great adventures. You will see many sad sights, sights that will tug violently at your heartstrings. The Overton girls retired early, for they were still quite wary from their strenuous experiences. On the following day there was another dance, and Captain MacLeod relaxed discipline to the extent of coming down and dancing with grace. He did it without the loss of dignity, even though members of his crew were bumping into him on the narrow deck for the relations between men and officers on a destroyer are much more intimate than on the big battleships, though discipline is none the less strict. After the sailors had had their dance, the officers were asked to join in, which they did. This time there were more girls than were needed, but Grace found little opportunity to sit down. On the following morning, when they turned out, the shores of France lay before them, a long slender line of almost vaporous green on the very edge of the horizon, which grew rapidly out of the sea as the Johnson plunged through the waters of the Bay of Biscay. They came to anchor about ten o'clock in the morning, and after a considerable wait were taken ashore on a tender. There their trials began. Each of the Overton girls was put through an examination that left her worn out. Passports were examined and antecedents gone into with a thoroughness that was at times disconcerting. Nearly four hours were occupied in examining the unit, after which their passports were visaid and they were free to go where they would. Grace's first duty was to look up the Red Cross headquarters at Brest and find out about trains. Troop movements being heavy, she was informed that they could not get away for Paris under four days from the time of their arrival, so the unit volunteered its services for that time to serve the troops, and they found it hard work serving chocolate and coffee to hordes of hungry and thirsty doughboys. The four days passed quickly, and on the evening of the fourth they entrained for Paris. The car in which they took passage was attached to a troop train. This train was composed of what is known in America as freight and cattle cars, and in these men had to sleep on the floor, in many instances, night after night. But the men bore it all uncomplainingly and with the best of humour. Trains of khaki-clad men in unending procession were encountered, some waiting for the train on which the Overton unit was riding to pass, and in other instances this latter train was sidetracked to permit troop trains to go on ahead. There seems neither rhyme nor reason to these wartime railroad methods, and everything appeared to have been thrown into utter confusion. Perhaps there is someone at one end of the line or the other who knows what it is all about, but I confess that it is beyond me, declared Grace. The Overton party was four days and three nights on the road, getting what sleep they could in the uncomfortable seats, but with no opportunity to remove any of their clothes. Before leaving Brest, Grace got permission to take supplies of chocolate, cigarettes, matches and chewing gum with her. When there was a long wait at a siding or a station, she would turn out the Overton unit and send the girls scurrying along the train, distributing their wares to the doughboys, and now and then as occasion offered, to the men on other trains. Here and there at stations they encountered small groups of Red Cross or Y workers, from whom, where possible, they replenished their supplies. The sight of an Overton girl anywhere along the train or on a station platform was always a signal for an outburst of cheers from the doughboys, followed by good-natured bantering, which Grace and her friends accepted smilingly. At last the car on which Grace's unit was travelling was switched off, and late in the afternoon of the fourth day drew slowly into the city of Paris, where the Overton unit detrained at the Gare du Nord. There another few hours were spent while the French authorities gave them what Grace called the third degree. Even the fingerprints of the young women were taken. 
When the examinations were completed, Grace reported to a Red Cross official who had them conducted to lodgings that had been reserved for them temporarily in the Rue Richepance, just off the famous Place de la Concorde. Paris was in darkness, save as here and there a masked street light relieved the somberness of the night. It was not the gay, brilliant Paris that Grace Harlowe had known when she visited it a few years previous to the breaking out of the Great World War, and the buildings and familiar scenes looked ghostly and unreal in the uncertain light. All the belongings of Overton Unit had gone down with the Holborn, though their money belts that Grace had directed should never be removed for any length of time had been the means of saving their funds, so the Overton Unit was in need only of equipment, but very much in need of that. "'Well, girls,' said Grace, when they had settled themselves in their quarters, while Arlene was brewing some tea and laying out some French cakes that Grace had purchased at the station. "'Here we are.' and it is perhaps the last night that we shall all be together for a long time to come. Where do you think they will send us? questioned Ruth solemnly. I do not know, Ruth, nor does it matter. We are here to serve our country just the same as are those beloved doughboys, and wherever we are ordered to go, there we will go cheerfully. I hope they put me in charge of a chocolate counter, spoke up Anne. I could simply expire sipping chocolate with thick cream on it. Don't worry, Anne. You will not get enough thick cream over here to cause you any disturbance. Remember, this is wartime. Now, if you please, finish those cakes quickly as possible. I'm going to do my hair and go to bed. Don't any of you girls dare have the nightmare, for I propose to sleep the night through without so much as turning over in bed. Tomorrow we girls shall have a very full day. All out except the one who is going to bunk with me. Anne decided that she would stay with Grace, and a few moments later the Overton unit was tucked in in real beds and sound asleep. But their hoped-for night of peaceful rest, after their many days of trying experiences and hardships, was destined soon to be turned into a night of excitement and thrills. End of chapter 8 Recording by Ashley Jane Chapter 9 of Grace Harlowe Overseas by Jessie Graham Flower. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ashley Jane. Chapter 9 The Trail of the Silver Moth. Grace awakened suddenly and lay listening. From a distance, the sound of a siren was borne to her ears, accompanied by the ringing of bells. She wondered what it could mean. Getting up quietly so as not to awaken the sleeping Anne, she stepped to the window and gazed up and down the street. Not a light was showing anywhere along the street. It was a moonless night, but the stars were out in force. The wail of the siren was increasing in volume, and far up the street Grace heard shouts. "'What is it? Grace! Grace, are you here?' "'I'm trying to find out what the racket is about.' Anne sprang up and ran to the window. "'Why, you ninny, it's a fire!' she cried. "'That is what comes from living in the country all one's life.' "'I do not think so, Anne. Do not think what?' "'That it is a fire. Hark!' A faraway drumming sounded on the night air, a droning sound that was new to both girls. Anne struck a match to light the candle, but Grace blew it out instantly. Do not forget that lights are not permitted unless the shades are drawn, my dear. This is war, she warned. Oh, I forgot. You do remember everything. It will be well for you to do the same, my dear. You may be placed in a position where to strike a light might mean instant death for you. There, it is a fire, exclaimed Anne as a fire engine dashed past their billet. I'm going back to bed. I suppose we might as well though I feel certain that it is not a fire. The girls tumbled into bed, but were out and at the window a few minutes later. It was that droning sound again, which seemed to be drawing nearer. Oh, look! exclaimed Anne. What is it? Northern lights? No, searchlights, replied Grace. Bars of light shot and swept the skies from all directions, then, focusing on a single point, were held steadily. At the focal point, the Overton girls saw something that drew exclamations from their lips. 
What looked to be a great silver moth hung there, floating in space, while to the rear of it was a trail of bursting lights that melted into liquid fire. That is an aeroplane, Anne, and we are going to have a raid, announced Grace. I think there must be several of them, for I can hear several motors droning. Some of them may be French planes, but that one up there is an enemy plane. See the shells bursting all around it. And to think that there are men up there. Isn't it terrible? whispered Anne. All war is terrible. Do you think we are in any danger here, Grace? questioned Anne apprehensively. We may be. I do not know enough about these raids to know whether we are or not. They could hear the explosions of the guns that were shooting at the raiders, and soon falling shrapnel was pattering on the street and on the roofs of the houses like hailstones. The other girls of the unit, some time since, aroused by the racket, had gotten up, and now they came crowding into Grace's room. "'Isn't this terrible, Grace?' cried Ruth. "'Do not get excited, Ruth. This may be but the beginning.' I have a feeling that we are going to see something even more thrilling. Almost ere the words had passed her lips, the thrill came. A flash of fire seemed to leap right up out of the street below them, followed by the most terrific explosion any of them had ever heard. Accompanying the explosion came the crash of breaking glass and rending wood. The girls were thrown to the floor by the explosion, some of them partially stunned, and all more or less shaken up. Grace was the first to leap to her feet. Looking up through a great gap in the shattered ceiling, she saw the stars, while on the street side part of the front of the house had been blown away. There came a second explosion further down the street toward the Plaza de la Concorde, and following it cries and shouts. Girls, I think we'd better dress. We can't stand another shock like the last one without someone getting hurt. I'm going downstairs to see if anyone down there has been hurt. Hurriedly dressing, Grace ran downstairs where she found the rooms deserted. But when about to return to her room, she heard voices that seemed far away. Investigating a little further, she discovered that the household had taken to the cellar for protection. Grace returned to her room and advised her companions to take a lesson from the French family and go to the cellar. They did so willingly, but after seeing the rest safely in the cellar, Grace and Arlene returned to their room and watched with fascinated eyes the continuance of the raid. By this time French airplanes had ascended and were giving battle to the Germans high in the skies. The rat-tat-tat of the machine guns up there and the slender threads of fire from the tracer bullets which the rival machines were firing was quite plainly visible to her. Now and then the sound of a bursting bomb was heard, but none fell near the house in the Rue Richeponza. Finally the raiders were driven off. The girls came up from the cellar, and the household settled down into quietness. But the Overton girls did not sleep very well. It was near three o'clock in the morning when the raiders returned, and this time, as before, the Overton unit got a baptism of fire. The first bomb dropped from the air well nigh wrecked to the house in which they were staying, tearing away almost an entire wing, leaving the ceilings hanging in ragged shreds in every room in the main part of the building, while in every room were heaps of splintered wood, plaster and glass. Only one person had been hurt, and this was the son of the proprietor of the house, who was seriously cut by shell fragments. Grace dressed the wounds of the unlucky boy and advised getting a doctor at once, there being evidences that there were some broken bones. She was informed that no doctor could be obtained that night, so she did the best she could with the patient, her slender, capable hands doing much to relieve the boy's sufferings. They finally got a bed fixed up, the rubbish cleared out of the room, and the injured lad into bed. So, this is war, reflected Arline. No. It is only the beginning of it, was Grace Harlow's brief reply. If that be true, I am perfectly content to take the rest for granted and go back to good old America, declared Ruth Denton. Shrapnel was still spattering the wrecked house at intervals and continued to do so until nearly daylight. There was no more sleep for anyone in that house, so the Overton girls sat about with drooping heads, cold and miserable, until morning. 
Grace, however, appeared fresh and well-groomed when she stepped out into the street shortly after sunrise, and with her brood, as she called the girls in her charge, started out to find a restaurant. Most of the girls knew enough French to enable them to get about and ask in understandable French for what they wanted. Grace and Anne, however, spoke French quite fluently. Grace ordered the breakfast at the little café on the Rue Martin, for which they paid what Miriam declared was a perfectly outrageous price. Yes, five francs for coffee and rolls. Why, I could get a whole dinner for that back in the States, spoke up Virginia Redfield, an Overton girl who, considerably older than Grace, had been asked to join the outfit. Virginia was engaged in settlement work in New York when the war broke out, and while a most capable girl was inclined to be fussy as Anne characterized it. Following breakfast, the party went out to make some simple purchases of things as were absolutely necessary to take the place of the equipment that had been lost on the Holborn. Of course, new uniforms could be obtained from headquarters after it was decided what each member of the unit was to do. Shortly after nine o'clock, the Overton girls walked to the Red Cross headquarters on the Rue de Rivoli. Grace sent in her card to the director of their department, Mr. Davis. She was summoned to the office of her chief after a wait of nearly half an hour, for which delay the chief apologized and invited Grace to be seated. I represent the Overton College unit, Mr. Davis, she announced. We are ready for any service to which we may be assigned. That is pleasant. We need young women who really wish to work. The great difficulty is that we have a number of most estimable women on this side who have come over not for service, but for an adventure under the guise of service. The French government recently shipped back some two hundred such, but I might add that they missed a few. Mr. Davis's eyes twinkled, and Grace's face relaxed into an understanding smile. I trust that no such disaster may befall us she said sweetly. It is not probable. Now may I ask if you have any preferences as to the service? Only that I may be placed where I shall have plenty to do. I did not come to France on a pleasure trip, nor have I had a pleasure trip. You know perhaps that we were on the SS Holborn. No, indeed, I was not aware of the fact. Come to think of it, I did hear that some women war workers were on board. You see, the newspapers have very little news of disasters to shipping or any other news that might possibly be useful to the enemy. By the way, I believe I have a letter regarding you from an officer very high in our organisation. Yes, here it is. Mr Davis read the communication through carefully and looked up smiling. This letter contains all the information that I need to have as to your capabilities and your ability as an organiser, he said. Grace wished he would tell her who the letter was from and what it said about her, but she was a too thoroughly well-bred woman to ask. I do not suppose you would care for clerical work? Frankly, no. I thought not. Will you please call in the young ladies of your unit and introduce them? Then I will talk with each one individually. Grace summoned her associates and introduced them. She could see that Mr. Davis was most favourably impressed. Many questions were asked and promptly answered, following which the girls were interviewed singly, some being sent to various department heads for further consideration or for assignment. Grace was the last to be called in. She was informed that for the present she would be assigned to relief work at the canteens, that is, filling in. This, Mr Davis explained, would mean getting her assignments every morning and would also include assisting in entertaining the soldiers. If she at any time wished to offer suggestions, the chief told her they would be most carefully considered. He then went into a long explanation of the work of his own organisation, as well as that of the YMCA and other welfare organisations, but drew no comparison then, after giving Grace a list of lodgings, asked her to call on the following morning prepared for work. By arrangement, the Overton girls reassembled at the office of the Red Cross headquarters after they had finished with their various interviews and compared notes. Arlene and Ruth were to work in the offices at headquarters. Anne was assigned to entertainment, the others to pouring tea, as Miriam expressed it. And I, well, I'm sort of freelance, as it were, laughed Grace. That man knows more about us than we ourselves know declared Ruth. 
I never saw a man who could ask so many questions about things that he was not supposed to know anything about. That probably is the reason he asked them, suggested Arlene mischievously. What about our spare uniform, Grace? Mr. Davis says we are to speak about that when we come tomorrow. Now suppose we go look up our new quarters. I don't suppose any of you girls care to go back to what is left of the house we slept in last night. Slept, did you say? rebuked Virginia Redfield. That's it. No, indeed, we don't want to go back to that awful place, declared Ruth. For two reasons. The first is that there is no place to sleep, and I object to sleeping standing up like a horse. The second is that the enemy has that house marked for destruction. It isn't likely that they will hit it again, comforted Grace. Lightning, it is said, never strikes twice in the same place. Perhaps not, but jerry bombs do. They did last night. Girls, I shall simply expire if I have to go through another raid. Silver moths may be pretty to look at, but I don't like their sting. Soon after that the Overton girls went out to hunt for lodgings. They found very comfortable quarters in a little side street consisting of three rooms, with conveniences for getting their own meals when they felt like doing so. The quarters were not luxuriously furnished. In fact, there were not enough chairs for them all to sit down at the same time, so it was arranged that they should take turns sitting on the floor, and Grace promised to buy some pillows to be used for this purpose. There was a good-sized dining-room table, where they planned to write and read in the evening, when they were not otherwise engaged. The rest of the day was spent in going about Paris. This city wore a warlike aspect. Khaki was to be seen whichever way one turned, and Grace began to realise what it meant to the people of France to have their land invaded by a foreign foe. Americans seemed to be more numerous than French soldiers, but then the Americans had just arrived, and the French soldiers were out yonder fighting to save their beautiful Paris. Paris said that the American marines were on their way to help the French beat back the foe and drive back the German hordes. All this was most interesting to Grace. She scanned every American face, wondering if by some fortunate chance she might meet Tom Gray in Paris. That night, after her companions had gone to bed, Grace sat down to write to him. Of course she did not know where he was, nor could she ask. She could only address the letter to him in care of his regiment and hope that it would reach him. In that letter Grace poured out her heart and expressed the hope that Tom might not chide her for coming to France before hearing from him, explaining that her decision could not be delayed. She wrote of their experiences en route and after their arrival in Paris. It was a long letter, full of herself, as she knew he would like to have it, expressing confidence that he would be spared and the hope that he soon might be able to have leave to come to Paris to see her. I know that you will not seek to come so long as your duty calls upon you to remain elsewhere, Grace wrote, nor should I wish you to come unless it were right for you to do so. At least write me and tell me that you are not angry or disappointed. I think you will like me in my uniform. The girls tell me that it becomes me very much, but I do not care so much for that. My hope is that I may bring as much honour upon it as you will upon yours. Grace was interrupted by a rap on the door. Opening it, she found the concierge standing there. Mademoiselle will put out her lights immediately, he commanded. A zeppelin is reported to be headed this way and should reach here in a few moments. End of chapter 9 Recording by Ashley Jane Chapter 10 of Grace Harlow Overseas by Jessie Graham Flower This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ashley Jane Chapter 10 Old Friends Get a Surprise A few minutes, you say? Yes, mademoiselle. Thank you. Grace stood thoughtfully for a few moments, then turning her head listened attentively. She could hear the purr of airplanes. These were the French planes going up to meet the raiding Zeppelin. Poor Ruth, murmured Grace, stepping over and putting out the light. She went to the window and drew up the shade. Voices came up to her from the street, and the owners of the voices were American soldiers. Pardon me, buddies, 
that I should advise you to get under cover. We are going to have a raid. Thank you, miss. We thought something was coming off when we heard the French is going up. We'll go out in the square where we can see the whole circus. Much obliged. The soldiers moved rapidly away. Isn't that just like American curiosity? laughed Grace. I'm just as imprudent as they are. I must see it through. I wish I might get up on the roof. I believe I will try it. She slipped out into the hall and climbed the ladder she had seen there, leading to a trap in the roof. The trap was secured with a padlock. How provoking! Now I shall miss the spectacle. Grace hurried back to her room and, going over to the window, sat on the sill listening to the hum of the airplane motors. It was a different sound from that made by the German machines, being a much softer purr. The German planes gave off a monotonous drone, not unlike that of bumblebees, but much louder. About that time the anti-aircraft guns opened, then heavier guns until the banging and booming was deafening. One gun was placed in a little park a short distance from their lodgings, and Grace watched with fascinated eyes the quick, vicious flashes as shots were fired in quick succession. Then she saw it, high in the heavens, no larger to the eye than a lead pencil, but shining in the glare of the searchlights whose beams had found and were holding it. Spiteful flashes from attacking airplanes, returned by the gunners on the Zeppelin, made a thrilling spectacle. About this time the rest of the Oberton girls came running out in their bare feet. "'As Jerry c come again?' chattered Ruth. "'Yes, it is a Zeppelin this time. I wonder if there is any such thing as a night's rest in this place,' demanded Virginia Redfield irritably. Tell them to stop shooting, Grace. They are disturbing her rest, suggested Anne. They certainly are. I know I shall have nervous frustration if this keeps up many more nights. Think what it must mean to our soldiers who have to listen to this and more day and night, week in and week out. Oh! The exclamation came from Ruth. A bomb had exploded with a mighty crash right in the square where the French gun was blazing away. Bits of pavement and pieces of shell were hurled clear over to the house where the girls were watching. They could hear these pieces rattling on the roof over their heads. Lucky for me that the trap door was fastened, reflected Grace. The French gun out there in the square was heard no more that night, but whether it had been destroyed or whether its crew had been killed, Grace did not know and never learned. Shrapnel was bursting all around the big German airship. Suddenly a red eye appeared up there in the sky. The eye grew and began to descend. I believe they have got it, cried Grace. Yes, oh look, shrieked Ruth, it is falling down. The huge bag, now plainly seen, was falling in flames. Down and down it came to the accompaniment of yells and shouts of joy in the streets. It was a flaming torch in the heavens, but the flames gradually died out, though in the beams of the searchlights the girls could see what was left of the framework dropping, now more rapidly toward the earth. Poor fellows, murmured Grace, they are human beings like ourselves after all, and I suppose that they were but obeying orders. What? Sympathise with a hun? fairly shrieked Virginia Redfield. No, Miss Redfield, not with a Hun, but with a human being. I have no more love for the Germans as such than you have. Please make no mistake as to my meaning. Now go to bed, you sleepyheads. I wish to finish my letter before turning in. The city settled down to its accustomed night quite soon after that, and Grace went on with her writing. Having finished, she enclosed and directed it, then turned in and slept soundly until morning. The following day found the Overton unit at work. Grace's duties consisted of serving chocolate to the soldiers at the Gardenord station and talking with the men, and many a homesick lad was cheered up by her and sent on his way smiling.
The day was without incident, save that Grace was not pleased with some of the volunteer workers with whom she came in contact. The first real trouble, however, occurred one day later. Grace was working at a canteen near the opera house, when an awkward-looking doughboy entered and stood gazing almost rapturously at Grace. Some of the canteen workers were smiling at her, but so engrossed was Grace in her work that she did not observe their smiles. Chancing to look up, she caught the eye of the admiring doughboy and uttered an exclamation of pleasure. Running over to him, Grace greeted him cordially. I know you. You are Jonas Bartels, the homesick boy from Pennsylvania. I'm so glad you got away from the Holborn safely. You must tell me about it. Well, you picked up soon. We were out all night long in the lifeboat, and I surely thought we were never going to be rescued. Please come over and sit down. You must tell me all about it. Jonas flushed painfully, but he was happy beyond words. I sure never was so glad to see anyone in my life, Mrs. Gray, he declared haltingly. I sure never was. Yes, we got away all right, and were picked up just before the fog came down. You must have got lost in that, for they missed your boat. Yes. When did you get in? Three days ago. We are going out tomorrow, and I reckon we soon will be in the thick of things. Is your husband here? No, Jonas. He is somewhere in France fighting, I presume, answered Grace, her face growing serious. I do not expect to see him soon, if at all, while I am here in France. He is with the 130th Engineers. Be sure to remember the name, Tom Gray, and the regiment, and if you should chance to be near it, do not fail to look him up. I think he is in Company B. The lieutenant is coming in, whispered one of the workers to Grace. Better get busy pouring chocolate. The lieutenant? questioned Grace. Yes, it's Miss Gay. She is a volunteer and can make more trouble for the workers than any other single person in Paris. She is on a tour of inspection. Thank you, Miss Cole. I know of nothing in the regulations that prohibits one from talking with an American soldier. I am just as much obliged to you. Grace favoured her informant with a gentle smile and resumed her conversation with Jonas, immediately forgetting Miss Gay and the warning of Miss Cole. That warning was brought forcibly to her notice in a very few moments. Mrs. Gray? Yes. Grace rose and found herself facing a tall, dark woman, dressed in a tailor-made gown, a red cross badge on the left lapel of her coat. I wish to speak with you. Grace excused herself to Jonas and stepped aside. May I ask your name? questioned Grace. I am Miss Gay, the lieutenant. I believe you are new at this work, at least I am so informed. However, your good sense should tell you that flirtations are not permitted between the women of our service and soldiers. Grace Harlow's face crimsoned. She controlled herself with an effort. Do I understand that you are accusing me of doing that? She demanded, looking the lieutenant steadily in the eyes. I have the evidence of my own eyes. Miss Gay! A hot retort had been framed on Grace's lips, but she repressed it. You are mistaken, was what she said. I know this young soldier. He is a plain country boy, a homesick boy whom I tried to cheer up on the Holborn, and this is the first I have seen of him since we were torpedoed. Explanations are futile. A repetition of the offence will result in my reporting you to headquarters. Miss Gay turned away. One moment, please. Do I understand you to say that the regulations prohibit a worker from holding a friendly conversation with a soldier? Yes. Will you please show me that rule in the regulations? I have read them over very carefully, but I have found nothing of that sort. Do you doubt my word, Mrs. Gray? Certainly not. I am merely asking you to show me the rule so that I may not violate it. You have my orders. That is quite sufficient was the somewhat lofty reply. With that the lieutenant turned away, and in a somewhat louder tone was heard criticising one of the other workers. Grace, in the meantime, had calmly sat down by Jonas and resumed her conversation with him. 
Out of the corners of her eyes she saw a frown on the forehead of her superior, and observed that Miss Gay was casting black looks in her direction. Twice during the lieutenant's stay in the canteen, Grace got up to wait on soldiers and speak a pleasant word to them, each time returning to Jonas, but no further words passed between herself and Miss Gay, who finally left the canteen without appearing to observe Grace. Jonas finally said he must go, as his leave was nearly up. Grace shook hands cordially with him and told him to look her up when next he came to Paris, sending him away with a hearty hand-clasp and good luck. "'I'm afraid you haven't heard the last of this, Mrs. Gray,' said Miss Cole. "'The lieutenant was very angry. You must have said something to stir her up. She is very strict about the workers talking with soldiers.' So long as I am in the service, or out of it, I shall consider it a part of my duty to talk with and cheer up every man in the uniform of my country who comes to me plainly needing such encouragement, and cheer as I am able to give. We all feel the same way, Mrs. Gray, but Miss Gay either has powerful influence back of her, or is trying to make us believe she has, and by holding over our heads the threat to send us back to the States, she is able to do with the workers in this district about as she wishes. I do not think she will send any of the Overton College unit back. Please don't misunderstand me. I have no powerful influence, as you put it, but I have sufficient confidence in this great organisation to believe that the woman who comes over here intending to do and doing her full duty need have no fear of being sent home under a cloud. Keep that in mind, my dear, and be your own self. I do not believe there is any such regulation as Miss Gay referred to. I thank you very much. Won't you come and see us and meet the girls of my unit? We are living at number 17, Rue de la Pepinia. Miss Cole smiled radiantly and promised to do so at the first opportunity. I have made an enemy and a friend, observed Grace to herself as she resumed her work. It was a wary Grace who at nine o'clock that night was relieved and started for her home after making some purchases for a luncheon with her chums. She was nearing the Rue Pepenia, and had just passed the opera house when she saw a slight girlish figure clad in khaki come under the rays of the street light. Grace's heart gave a jump. It can't be possible, she murmured, amazement in her face and tone. Then she saw a familiar gesture that told her she was right. Grace stopped as the other girl swung past her without turning or even looking at her. Emma Dean, is this the way you ignore your friends? she demanded sternly. End of chapter 10 Recording by Ashley Jane Chapter 11 of Grace Harlow Overseas by Jessie Graham Flower This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ashley Jane Chapter 11 the bitter with the sweet. Emma Dean was one of Grace Harlow's most intimate associates at Overton College, and her light-heartedness, sunny disposition, and keen sense of humour always acted as a tonic to Grace. Before leaving Haven Home, Grace had written to Emma, but there had been no reply. Now the reason for the failure of her friend to answer the letter was apparent. Emma stopped short at sound of the familiar voice, and a startled look appeared on her face. What? One quick glance, and with a scream of delight, she threw herself into Grace Harlow Gray's arms, fairly mauling Grace with her embraces, kisses, and gargles of delight. Emma, Emma, dear, this is wonderful, but you mustn't maul me all over the avenue. We shall have a gun down down on us first thing we know, or perhaps a government officer may take us into custody. But Emma, what in the world are you doing here? Oh, Grace, you upset me so, you, you startled me so that I hardly know myself. That, that uniform, I'm a war worker, Emma. But what are you? I'm a hello girl. You always were retorted Grace smilingly as she held Emma off to examine her face more closely. It was a flushed face that was turned up to her, but it looked good to Grace Grey. You are a... 
in the telephone service. I have been over here nearly two months. You remember Mr. Elwood of the telephone company? Well, when they organised the overseas telephone unit, he, knowing that I spoke French, asked me if I would like to join the unit and go over. You know me, Grace. I came, I saw, I conquered, and here I am with the weightiest of secrets on my mind. Why, dear, I know almost as much of the secrets of General Pershing and of the French government as they do themselves. Shh! You mustn't warned Grace with an apprehensive look about her. Come with me to my lodgings, I have a surprise for you, and there we can talk without danger of being overheard. If you talk as freely to others as you have to me, it is a wonder that you aren't in the Bastille. No danger, Grace, dear. That institution fell long before I came overseas. I ought to go to my own lodgings. Not tonight, you won't. There is a telephone in our place. You can notify whomever you are living with that you will not be home tonight. Come along. I live just around the corner. Emma did not need much urging, and gargling and chattering in her great happiness at being with her beloved Grace Harlow once more, permitted herself to be led to the quarters of the Overton unit. Grace asked her to be quiet so as not to disturb the occupants, but it was a surprise that Grace was planning. As they reached the upper floor, the sound of voices and laughter was heard. Now quiet, warned Grace. I'm about to perpetrate a surprise on an unsuspecting public and a very charming individual. She opened the door and thrust Emma into the room. Look, girls, who's here? she cried. A few seconds of silence followed, then a chorus of cries. The colour was going and coming in Emma Dean's face, but speech seemed to have left her. An unusual condition for that little Overton girl. Then she was fairly smothered with hugs and kisses. What does it mean? stammered Emma. Please, please explain. It means, announced Arlene, that you are now gazing upon the Overton College unit over here to do war work. Now explain the uniform that you were wearing. Emma is a telephone girl, spoke up Grace. She got the start of us and has been over here for several weeks. It was then that Emma found her voice. They all found their voices, and such a chattering and such happy laughter as followed, those lodgings probably never had experienced. Grace made tea and set out a luncheon, to which all sat down, happier than they had been in many a day. Isn't this just like Carlo House? exclaimed Emma. I should think you would be lonely over here without any of your old friends, wondered Anne. I was at first, but then I was busy from the beginning. Since then I have made some wonderful friends. Of the masculine or feminine gender? questioned Ruth demurely. Both. Who is he? demanded Miriam. Come, confess. We must know the truth. His name is Schofield. He is a lieutenant in the army, and just the dearest fellow you ever saw. He looks positively handsome in his uniform. He is a second lieutenant, you know. You must meet him. I know you girls will simply adore him. What is he doing here? Has he not been to the front? asked Grace. No, William is in the quartermaster's department. He feels that he can serve his country better in Paris than at the front. Do not understand me as imitating that William is a tenderfoot. He is far from being that... William? Has it come to that? groaned Ruth Denton, whereat there was a shout of laughter. Emma blushed furiously. No, it hasn't, but I do not say that it may not. I think, observed Arlene Thayer, that were I to fall in love with a man... It would not be with an SOS soldier, as the army men call the fellow who prefers to remain behind the lines, wear good clothes, live on the good things that Paris has to offer, enjoy the company of attractive young American girls like Emma Dean, and have a good time in general. Whom else have you attached to your train? asked Grace, more to relieve her friend's evident embarrassment than because she wished to know. Oh, I forgot to tell you about the Countess exclaimed Emma, brightening. A countess? wailed Miriam. Our Overton birds are flying high. I just dote on counts and countesses, 
added Ruth. Won't you introduce me? Yes, indeed I will. She is the loveliest person and has the most beautiful house. She has invited me there on several occasions, and she takes me out driving and everything. She owns several automobiles, but the French government has commandeered them, and now we have to go about in an old handsome cab, drawn by an animal that must have seen better days as far back as when Noah was around with his ark. What kind of a countess is she? Russian, French, Austrian, German? Inquired Grace. French, of course," retorted Emma indignantly. "I will tell her about you, and she will invite you girls to her home. She fairly dotes on American girls." "How about the count?" interjected Arline. "There isn't any. At least I have never seen him, nor has the countess ever spoken of him to me. Too bad. A countess without a count has no special interest for me," observed Miriam. "What does she do for a living?" The others laughed merrily. Such ignorance is shocking," declared Grace. "Countesses do not work for a living. At least no countess that I ever heard of do. Have you a roommate, Emma? No. Then why not come to live with us? I think the other girls will be glad to have you. I am satisfied that you need a guardian." A chorus of "Oh, do come!" greeted Grace's suggestion. If you will promise not to make sport of William when he comes to see me, I believe I will," replied Emma after a brief reflection. "We could not make sport of a man wearing the khaki," returned Grace rather severely. "Then I will come. If you can put me up, I will stay here tonight. I do not like to be out on the streets so late, especially when there is likelihood of a raid. Have you experienced one yet? Don't speak of it." Moaned Ruth, "May I sleep with you, Grace? Of course, but we shall have to sleep three in a bed, you, Anne, and myself. Tomorrow I will see if I can get a cot for you, or you can have the bed with Anne, and I will take the cot. I would gladly sleep on the floor for the sake of being with you, girls," declared Emma with much feeling in her voice. "I do not believe I was ever so happy in my life." I hope I don't wake up and find myself in my luxurious attic bedroom on the Rue Putz. I have to keep pinching myself while you are talking to me to make certain that it isn't all a dream. Grace, tell me all about Overton and Haven Home and everything else. How did Tom happen to let you get away from him after less than a year of married blessedness? Tom is with the AEF in France. Grace made quiet reply. I see, I see. So that is it. I understand why you were over here. Is he coming to Paris to be with you, Emma? Tom is in France to fight for his country, not to step into an easy berth behind the lines. I say that in no disparagement of your friend. Someone must serve behind the lines, and that is why we Overton girls are here. Why you are here? Emma nodded understandingly, then questioned her friends as to just what they were doing, how they chanced to get over. Listening with sparkling eyes to their stories of their experiences. By the way, Grace, were I in your place, I should not say too much about Tom. Why not? Demanded Grace, the colour rising to her cheeks. Because there is a new regulation out, an army regulation forbidding the wives or near relatives of men in the army from coming over. We are not coming over. We are already here. Interposed Arline. I do not know how that will affect the situation. To make certain, I should be a bit careful. You see, we hear many things over the telephone wires. I keep the countess laughing nearly all the time, telling her of the funny things I hear. Emma Dean, surely you do not tell outsiders things you hear on the telephone wires? Exclaimed Grace in amazement. There, there, loyal heart. Don't fret your dear little head. I tell the countess nor any one else nothing of importance. That comes in over the wires. The position of a telephone girl is one of great confidence in wartime, and we necessarily are in possession of information that would be of tremendous importance to the Germans were they to get hold of it. I wish you would not say those things, Emma. My advice to you is not to talk about it at all. There surely is no harm in saying such things to you girls. You know I have told you nothing at all, nor do I intend to. Grace nodded her approval of Emma Dean's announcement. The rest of the evening, up to a late hour, was spent in exchanging confidences. 
Miriam told her that she had a letter from her husband, Everett Southard, saying that he had been requested to organise a company of actors and take them to France to furnish entertainment for the soldiers, and that he hoped to see her soon. What about permitting him to come over here in view of the fact that he has a wife here? demanded Ruth. It is a poor rule that doesn't work both ways. Perhaps after he gets here, Miriam will be sent back, suggested Grace mischievously. The American and French governments put together couldn't send me back once my husband gets to France, announced Miriam with emphasis. I propose that we go to bed. I understand that tomorrow is going to be a big day in the canteens, Grace. Several transports are in, and a lot of the men are coming to Paris. Of course this doesn't affect us in the offices so much as it does you girls in the canteen. I think I shall seek my luxurious couch. The rest of you may sit up the night through if you like. I much prefer to sit up than being bombed out of bed, observed Ruth Denton. For an hour after retiring, there was a continuous chatter and calling, then quietness settled over the quarters of the Overton unit. An early breakfast next morning was enlivened by the arrival of the postman bearing letters for nearly all the girls of the unit. There was nothing from Tom, but there were letters from Grace's mother and Tom's mother, which made her very happy. Grace then turned to a letter bearing the imprint of her organisation. She read it last of all, the colour slowly mounting to her cheeks as she did so. It was from Mr Davis. You will please call to see me early tomorrow morning on a matter of extreme seriousness regarding yourself, were the words that Grace read. Grace's face grew serious, and a strained expression appeared about the eyes. If it should be Tom, she murmured, no, it cannot be. I shall not think of it. Bad news, loyal heart? questioned Grace brightly. No, just a summons to see the director at headquarters. I do not know what he wishes to see me about, but probably something about the work. Nevertheless, Grace was greatly disturbed in mind over the summons, and as soon as possible excused herself, not forgetting to urge Emma to move her belongings in early. I will speak to the concierge added Grace, so there may be no difficulty. With that, she made a smiling goodbye and hurried to the headquarters of her organisation. She had to wait some little time for the arrival of Mr Davis, and Grace saw from the serious expression on his face that something had gone amiss. He asked her to wait a few moments. The few moments stretched out to half an hour, a most trying half hour for Grace, who, though her face did not show it, was in great suspense. At last the summons came. Sit down, Mrs. Gray, begged the director. Thank you. May I ask you how you are getting along with your work? I am enjoying it very much, if that is what you mean, Mr. Davis, was the reply, accompanied by the suggestion of a smile. I hope I may be giving satisfaction in my work, for I assure you my heart is in the cause, sir. Mrs. Gray, what I have to say with regard to that gives me great distress and I can scarcely credit the truth of the report that has been made to me, was the director's grave announcement. End of chapter 11 Recording by Ashley Jane Chapter 12 of Grace Harlow Overseas by Jesse Graham Flower This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ashley Jane Chapter 12 Grace Meets the Countess Grace eyed Mr. Davis steadily for a few seconds. May I ask for a specific statement, sir? You may. Charges have been made that, if true, would make necessary the sending of you back to the States, Mrs. Gray. You see, we have to be very particular with regard to the actions of our workers. It is an inflexible rule that each one must live up to the regulations both of the army and of our organisation itself. If I have transgressed, I am indeed sorry. However, I am not aware that I have. Who makes the charges? And what are they? Asking you to pardon the bluntness of my inquiries. You are quite justified in making them. Your inquiries in as direct language as you can command. The charges are that you were flippant, 
that you neglect your legitimate work and spend your time in frivolous enjoyment with the soldiers who visit your canteen. In other words, you will pardon my bluntness, that your actions are flirtatious. I am sorry to have to say this. Mr. Davis was evidently ill at ease, and Grace observed, avoided meeting her eyes. What have you to say in answer to these charges, Mrs. Gray? If I may do so, I should like to reply by asking you a question, sir. You are at liberty to do so. Then may I ask what you think of these charges, as to their truth, I mean? Mr. Davis hesitated, fingered his papers uneasily, then looked Grace fairly in the eyes. As I already have said, I find it difficult to credit them. Grace smiled radiantly. It seems to me that that answers the accusation, she said. In a way it does, so far as I am personally concerned, but this charge, or rather these charges, have been made in an official way, and I am therefore obliged to investigate them in an official capacity. Mrs. Gray, there is something in this matter that I do not understand. I ask you to be perfectly frank with me. It is difficult to do that without making counter-accusations, which I do not care to do. I have always avoided anything of the sort, and do not care to begin now. I think I know whence these charges have come, but I think now that I do not wish to know the name of your informant. I assure you, Mr. Davis, that they are absolutely unfounded. First, I should like to ask you if there is, either in Army or Red Cross organisation regulations, anything that prohibits women in my work from acting like human beings. None that I ever heard of, was the smiling reply. No regulations that prohibit a woman from being gracious to the men who have come over here to offer their lives for us. Mr. Davis shook his head nor that forbid one's talking to soldiers who need cheering up and encouraging. On the contrary, it is a part of the work for which you are here, was the reply. Then these charges against me are fully answered. I will tell you, as you have asked me to do, all that I know about them. The beginning of the story dates back to the day the SS Holborn was torpedoed, and only a few moments before the tragedy, when I picked out a poor homesick farmer boy and made him dance with me and talked him into forgetting his troubles. I did not see him again until he walked into the canteen yesterday. I was naturally glad to see him, and he appeared to be equally delighted to see me again. I spent some little time talking with him, trying to cheer him up, for he was to start for the trenches today. I did not neglect my work, for I got up several times to attend to men who came in when the other women were engaged. While talking with this man, Jonas Bartels, a woman, who announced that she was a lieutenant, called me aside and accused me of flirting at the same time declaring that such actions as mine were sufficient to send me back to the United States. Mr. Davis nodded. That is all, sir, except that I denied the lieutenant's charges, but with much less force than I ought to have put into my denial. Miss Cole and the others saw all that took place on that occasion, and I think they will bear me out in all that I have told you. Do you ever speak to soldiers on the street? Quite frequently. Why not? They are our own kind, and when there is no probability of my doing so being misunderstood, I stop and speak with them, ask them about their families when I can properly do so. Inquire where they are staying, and urge them to spend such time as they can with one or another of the welfare organisations. There is a work of great importance to be done on the streets of Paris, Mr. Davis a work even more vital to the welfare of our boys than the mere pouring of chocolate and passing out sweets. Some persons might say that such work was more properly for older women to do, but I do not agree with them. It is a work we all should do, at all times exercising judgment, tact, temper and cordiality with dignity. Perhaps I have said too much, sir. Mrs. Gray, you have expressed what has been in my own mind for a long time, but which I have not considered wise to put in concrete form. 
It is a policy, a plan, if you will, that can be followed by the individual, but not by the workers generally, for reasons which you must understand. I think I do. A few of the splendid young women of our organisation are already following the lines suggested by you. You are at liberty to do so, and I may add that I honour you for your loyalty and high purpose. I regret exceedingly that these charges have been made, and that they have to go on record, but I shall make your exoneration as full as possible, and see that it goes on record. Thank you, sir. Today I think I will have you go out to Dewey. Do you drive an automobile? I do. That is well. You will have no difficulty in finding the way. Some supplies are necessary at the American Ambulance Hospital there, which, if you do not mind, you will take out. It is about fifty kilometres, thirty miles, which you can easily drive in a couple of hours, as the roads are in excellent condition. While there, you may be able to be of some service to the officers in charge. It is extremely fortunate that you drive. We shall have much need of your services in this line of work if you do not object to taking it up. I shall be delighted, sir. Report at eleven o'clock, and the car will be ready for you. You may do as you like in the meantime. Of course, you understand that you must be back in Paris before dark. You might not be permitted to enter the city after that. I will see that you have the proper credentials to permit your departure and return. That will be all now. Grace left the headquarters in a much happier frame of mind than when she entered the place, and hurried toward home to make such small preparations for the journey as were necessary. On the way to her lodgings, she was hailed by a familiar voice, and looking up, discovered Emma Dean in company with another woman, waving to her from a hansom. The hansom pulled up to the curb. Grace, I wish you to know the Countess Jeanne de Beaupré. My friend, Grace Harlow Gray, Countess, of whom you have heard me speak so often. Grace acknowledged the introduction smilingly, while the Countess was gracious in the extreme. Indeed, I have felt that I knew you already," she declared in perfect English. "Won't you let us take you to wherever you were going? There is room for one more, especially a person so dainty." Grace thanked the Countess and said she had but a few steps to go to reach her lodgings, adding to Emma that she was to go to Juilly that afternoon to carry some supplies to the American ambulance there. "You drive the car yourself?" questioned the Countess. "How charming!" "I should love to ride out with you. May I?" she begged, bestowed a smile on Grace. It would be a pleasure to have you do so if there be no objection. I will ask the director, and if agreeable to you, will call for you at about a quarter after eleven. If I am not there within a few minutes of that time, you will know that permission is refused. Grace did not propose to take any unnecessary chances. She had very keen realization that France was at war and that regulations were very strict, necessarily so. Hurrying on to her room after receiving the thanks of the countess, Grace made her preparations for the journey, made a cup of tea for herself, and ate more than was good for her of those delicious French pastries. While sipping the tea, Grace reflected over her experiences of the day, especially on the charges that Miss Gay undoubtedly had made, and she was glad that Miss Gay was not a member of their organization. That she was merely a worker who had been made a lieutenant because, having a car of her own and being of no expense to the outfit, her services were welcomed. But what Grace did not know was that she was not the only one against whom Miss Gay had entered complaints, most of them trivial and with little or no basis of fact. Her second subject of reflection was the Countess de Beaupré. While she was most charming, Grace felt there was a note of insincerity in the woman's voice. She condemned herself for this feeling or intuition or whatever it might be, but the feeling would not down. Mr. Davis had no objection to the Countess accompanying Grace, saying that she was well known in Paris and had done much for the cause of France, in whose service some of the male members of her family were prominent. Grace asked how long the Countess had lived in Paris, but Mr. Davis did not know. 
It will be necessary for her to have her credentials in order to get back into the city with you, but I presume that is a matter you can safely trust to her own intelligence. The car was standing at the door when Grace came out from her interview with the director. It was an ambulance bearing the insignia of the organization conspicuously on both sides. It was loaded with surgical supplies and medicines, which were urgently needed at the American Ambulance Hospital at Dewey. After looking over the load and getting further directions from Mr. Davis, who had accompanied her down to the street, Grace started her motors, lifted the hood and examined them critically, then replacing the hood, got into the car. Grace was off with a rattle and a bang, for the car already had seen hard service and was not in the best of condition. She waved a hand at Mr. Davis as she sped away. A capable young woman. I'm glad we have her, was his comment as he returned to his office to take up the work of the day. Grace drove to the home of the Countess, a handsome white stone structure a few blocks from the Arch of Triumph, drawing up before the door at exactly fifteen minutes after eleven. The Countess was waiting for her and was coming down the steps before the car stopped. She was simply but daintily dressed in a tailored linen suit, wearing on her head a simple white straw trimmed with a narrow roll of black net. A broad patent leather belt hanging loosely encircled her waist. Grace made mental note of her passenger's costume and admitted to herself that Countess Jean was certainly a most attractive woman as well as a cultured one. I have permission to take you with me, Countess, greeted Grace. It is sweet of you to be burdened with me, for I am certain that I shall prove to be a burden, answered the Countess, favouring her host with a radiant smile. However, knowing the way I may be able to assist you, that indeed will be a help. As I recollect French roads and French landscapes, they all look alike. You have visited France before then? Yes, madame, once a few years ago. Grace had turned about and started down the avenue at a good rate of speed. Fast driving in Paris was the rule in peacetime, but in wartime, with so many military automobiles dashing through the streets, all speed limits were off. The driver made the most of her opportunity over the smooth asphalt streets, and turning to the right of the Avenue de l'Opera, was soon bowling along in the outskirts of Paris on what was to be an eventful journey. End of chapter twelve. Recording by Ashley Jane. Chapter thirteen of Grace Harlow Overseas by Jessie Graham Flower. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ashley Jane. Chapter thirteen. An inquisitive passenger. What a wonderful driver you are! Observe, Madame. You must teach me to drive a car. How I should love it. Grace brought her car to a quick stop when a French sentry barred their passage. He inquired who they were and where they were going, which Madame answered in French, not knowing that Grace understood. The Countess told him that Mrs. Gray was a Red Cross official on her way to Juilly, with supplies for the hospital there, and Grace tried hard not to show her amazement. She felt her face getting hot, but fortunately her passenger did not observe it. After taking the names of the occupants of the ambulance, destination and other details, the sentry permitted the car to pass. They are troublesome creatures after all, murmured the Countess. I shall be glad indeed when the war is at an end and one is free to go and come. But war is war and spies appear in many guises. The French must be ever on their guard. Turn here, my dear, she directed, pointing to a side road. Grace stopped her car and, taking out her road map, studied it for a moment or two. You are in error, Countess. The direct road to Juilly lies straight ahead. Look, is it not so? she added, offering the map to her passenger. Yes, I know, but the road to the right is much the better road. You will go that way, will you not? If you think that is the best road, yes, it is. There are many troublesome spots in the main road owing to the heavy traffic of camions and cars. 
The explanation appeared perfectly reasonable to Grace, who turned her car into the side road, for which she was rewarded with a gentle pat on her shoulder and a smile of appreciation from her passenger. You are a dear. We must see a great deal of each other. I hear you had a most unpleasant experience on your way across. You mean the Holborn? Yes, indeed, but fortunately we are none the worse for it. I think we were in more danger from the night air raids. I understand that none of the soldiers was lost. There was only one boat missing, and that was picked up later. Were there many of them aboard? Something like two thousand, I believe. A regiment, I presume. Let me see. I read something about that. It was the... the... how provoking! You must know what regiment it was, my dear. Yes, I know, answered Grace laconically. This old car acts as if it were going to fall to pieces, doesn't it, Countess? Madame de Beaupré flushed at the rebuff, and for a few moments there was silence between them, which Madame finally broke with a merry laugh. You are a wise little woman. But remember, my dear, we are allies. You need feel no restraint in speaking freely with me, though I admire your reticence regarding affairs military. The conversation drifted to a general discussion of the war, about which her passenger told Grace many things of a more intimate nature, shedding new light on what already had been accomplished and France's dire need at the time America entered the great world conflict. I understand you have fully half a million men on this side of the water already, and that three million more are being fitted out to come over. I do not know about the number here now. I should say, however, that it was less than the number you mention, perhaps two hundred thousand or something like that. As for those who will come over, their number is unlimited. America can put more than five million men on the battlefront in a year or less. We are a big and resourceful country, Countess. I'm aware of that. I visited America some years ago and was amazed at what I saw. It was wonderful, such buildings, such industries, such progress and such masterful men. Such is America. Grace was pleased at the characterization. Her passenger asked in detail about her friends of the Overton unit and led Grace on to speak of her husband and the regiment he was with. Taking it all in all, Madame, by adroit questioning, gleaned considerable information, though Grace was cautious, not that she suspected her passenger, but that she did not wish to reveal anything that she should not. What she had told her companion, Grace reasoned, might be learned from many persons in Paris, or perhaps from observation, so no harm could possibly have been done. The way to Julie, however, seemed much longer to her than thirty miles, and as there was no indicator on the dashboard, she could only guess at the distance they had come. They were now travelling through open country, dotted with pleasant homes and little farms, on which only women were seen at work, with the exception that here and there children were assisting them. At one of these little homes the Countess begged Grace to halt for a moment. They have the most delicious milk here, and I simply cannot pass without having a glass of it. May I fetch you a glass of milk, Mrs. Gray? I believe I really would enjoy a glass of milk. Thank you so much. Shall I go in with you to save you the trouble of carrying it out to me? The Countess protested that she could not think of permitting such a thing, and stepping from the car, she ran lightly up to the open door, where Grace saw her greeted deferentially. The Countess stepped into the cottage, and Grace saw her hand the woman of the house something, which she at first thought was money, but as the peasant woman held it up, folding it between her hands, Grace uttered a little exclamation. It was not money that the Countess was handing the woman, and which she stowed away in the pocket of her dress. A few moments later the Countess came out with two glasses of milk, and together they drank of the rich milk that Grace realized was mixed with cream. It was the first of its kind that she had had since leaving Haven Home, where two Jersey cows kept the household supplied. Delicious, isn't it? questioned the Countess. It is indeed. I thought you would enjoy it and consider it well worth the extra mile or so that we have travelled to get it, though the recollection of this place did not come to me until I sighted the cottage. I think we are ready now. Are you going to return the glasses? No, let the woman come out and get them. It is not wise to be too deferential to these peasant people. Grace bit her lips to keep back the reply that she was on the point of uttering. 
A little further on they swung into the main highway and completed their journey to Jouilly without further incident. The hospital there was a venerable old building, before the war a seat of learning known as the College of Jouilly, and already there were several hundred patients there, including many Americans. Grace delivered her supplies, for which she got a receipt from Major Coleman, an American surgeon who was in charge of the hospital. Grace introduced the Countess to him and left her there while she herself, conducted by an officer, made the rounds of the hospital, talking with the men and distributing cigarettes and chocolate to those who were permitted to have them. The presence of this lovable American girl with a smile on her face and another smile in her voice was like a breath from home for the soldier sufferers. For three hours Grace Harlow talked to them, read to certain of them, held the hands of the few whom the surgeon told her soon were going west, the soldier parlance for dying. She forgot the passage of time and everything else except the men of her race until the countess sent in to remind her that the hour was getting late. Grace went through the wards, bidding the men goodbye and promising to come again and as often as she could. The Countess declared that she had had a perfectly delightful chat with Major Coleman, who appeared to be quite taken with her, as Grace later expressed it. Madame Jean was in high humour as they drove rapidly back toward Paris, Grace taking the main road and wondering why her passenger did not suggest going the longer way on account of the roads. There was nothing the matter with the main road so far as Grace Harlow could see, and good time was made all the way along, except as they had frequently to draw off to one side of the road to permit the passage of what Grace called caravan, a long procession of army trucks on their way toward the lines. Many of the drivers, observing that a woman was driving the ambulance, saluted gravely, while others grinned and waved their hands in friendly fashion. Grace always answered these salutations in kind, much to the interest of her passenger. "'You Americans are such wonderful mixers,' declared the Countess. "'You have the knack of adapting yourselves to any company, to any situation. "'Why not? We are all human beings. "'Though some of us are not wholly human, I—' "'A hissing sound interrupted her. "'Madame de Beaupré started. "'What, what is it?' "'Only a tyre, that's all,' replied Grace disgustedly. "'Oh, it sounded every bit like a shell going over. "'You have heard shells? You have been under fire?' "'questioned Grace as she brought her car to a quick stop. "'Once in the early days of the war. "'In fact, I was under fire all of one night "'when stopping with friends of mine in a chateau up north. Do you know, ever since then, whenever I hear the air escaping from an automobile tyre, I think a shell is coming straight toward me. How interesting. I should like to experience real fire, artillery fire, and I hope to before I go home. Just now we have something fully as important on hand. Grace got out a jack and jacked up the car, after which she hammered and worked with all her strength to get the shoe off. This finally was accomplished, her uniform covered with a long linen duster that reached to the ankles, a pair of thin soiled gloves on to protect her hands. Strong and self-reliant as those slender hands were, Grace Harlow's pride was in keeping them in perfect shape. She believed that hands and hair were women's chief claim to beauty, and acted accordingly. If I drive a car over here much more, I think I shall send to America for my own little car, she declared. At least I could go out with reasonable assurances of getting back pretty nearly at the time I had planned. The Countess seemed ill at ease, which Grace put down to her annoyance at being late in getting home. After a half hour's hard work, the tyre was repaired and replaced, and the driver, face smudged with dirt, hopped in and started away. Thank goodness that is finished. How far are we from Paris? I should say about twenty kilometres. So near as that? We shall make it, provided we have no more difficulties with this rattle-trap car. Oh, there it goes again. Countess, you will be sorry you ever came out for a drive with me. This surely is my unlucky day. Instead of the repaired tyre going out, it was the tyre on the other side, and once more Grace put on her duster and gloves and got to work. Darkness was almost upon them when she finished and announced herself as ready. 
From that on to the city limits, Grace Harlow gave her passenger a ride, the like of which the Countess admitted she had never before experienced. The light car rattled and banged and skidded perilously when turning out for other vehicles, until the Countess, clinging to the side with firm hands, begged her driver to reduce speed. Sorry, but we must take time or we shall be in difficulties. At last they reached the outskirts of Paris, and there they were brought to an abrupt halt by two soldiers who stepped into the middle of the road, holding their rifles up above their heads at right angles to their bodies, thus barring the way. Here our troubles begin, announced Grace Harlow Gray. She believed that being late they would be held up outside of Paris for the night and be compelled to sleep in their car but the difficulties in which they were soon to find themselves were of a much more serious nature than the mere being late in seeking entry to the city. End of chapter 13 Recording by Ashley Jane Chapter 14 of Grace Harlow Overseas by Jessie Graham Flower This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ashley Jane Chapter 14 A Mystery in the Making Stand aside, commanded the Countess imperiously, addressing the soldiers in French. This is an official car, and I am an officer of the Red Cross on official business. I wonder what I am, reflected Grace. I must be the chauffeur. Your credentials? demanded the spokesman of the pair. He wishes to see your credentials, Mrs. Gray, the Countess informed her companion. Grace handed them over, smiling to herself as she did so, and the Countess extended a hand with the papers to the two soldiers. They examined the papers under the light of an electric pocket lamp, then the papers went into the pocket of the spokesman. The papers passed but one person, but in this instance neither passenger is to be permitted to pass. You will accompany me. For this I shall have you punished, threatened Madame de Belpré. You shall see. The French soldier was unmoved by the threats. It was quite plain to Grace, who had understood nearly every word of the conversation between her passenger and the soldier, that there was more to this hold-up than appeared on the surface. The soldier had declared that neither passenger was to be permitted to pass, and directed that both accompany him. Where? What would Mr. Davis say for her failure to follow his instructions to get back to the city before dark? Of course the tire trouble would be sufficient excuse for the delay, but not for being detained, as now appeared to be probable. The soldier, after giving the Countess brief directions, hopped into the rear of the ambulance, carrying his rifle under the arm, in position for use if needed. Where to this time? questioned Gray somewhat coldly. Number 8 Rue Francois Premier. It is most provoking, but I shall see to it that this fellow is punished for his interference. Do you know where the place is? questioned the Countess. Yes, I think so, but I do not know what it is. Do you? I do not. Do you believe he is taking us in because we are late, because we are suspicious characters? questioned Grace with a faint smile on her face. Surely my credentials should be sufficient to at least permit us to remain outside in our car for the night, uncomfortable as that might be. I know no more about it than you do, Mrs. Gray. We shall soon know. The French are naturally a suspicious race, and this is wartime. Leave all to me, and you will soon be at home. The Rue Francois Premier is the next turn to your left. Grace soon brought her car to a standstill before number eight, and their guard hopped off. He directed the Countess and her companion to follow him and conducted them into a reception room of what apparently was a suite of offices. You will remain here until you are summoned, was the brief command. Neither woman spoke while awaiting the next move in this most mysterious proceeding which interested Grace more than it disturbed her. Her principal concern was for her friends at the Overton unit lodgings, for she knew they would be concerned about her long absence, and that they might possibly get in touch with Mr. Davis, which she devoutly hoped they would not do. Just then a man in the uniform of the French army stepped briskly into the room. Grace saw that he was a captain. He was gracious but businesslike, 
and took in both women in a quick, appraising glance. "'You are the Countess de Beaupré?' he questioned, fixing his grace on Madame Jean. "'Yes,' replied the Countess, with dignity, not unmixed with hauteur. "'And you?' he demanded, turning to Grace. "'Grace Harlow Gray, a worker for the Red Cross.' The captain bowed low to both women. "'Come with me,' he ordered briefly, nodding to the Countess. The latter rose, and with a nod and a reassuring glance at Grace, followed the captain out of the room, leaving Grace alone. For more than an hour, Grace remained there, all the time wondering where they were and why they were there. The problem was too much for her to solve, so she gave up trying, and rising, strolled about the room. The hour was late, and she was eager to have done with this delay and get home to her bed. Her reflections were interrupted by the entrance of an orderly, who bowed ceremoniously. "'Captain will see Madame now,' he said. Grace followed the orderly through the door that seemed to hold so much of mystery beyond it, through a passage and into another room, bare save for a deal table and two chairs. The room was lighted by a solitary oil lamp suspended from the ceiling. The Countess was not in the room, and Grace wondered what had become of her. There were papers on the table, and among them Grace recognised her own credentials, but she could no more now understand the mystery that enveloped her than she had been able to do before. Madame is with the Red Cross, he murmured, consulting a paper which he selected from among the apparent litter on the table after he had beckoned her to a seat on the opposite side of the table. Yes, sir. He had addressed the question to Grace in English, and she had answered him in English. A member of the Overton College unit, Oakdale birthplace, the wife of Thomas Gray, he murmured reflectively. Grace wondered if there were anything about her that the captain did not know. She was becoming interested. Your husband, I believe, is now with the American forces, to be exact a private with the 130th engineers, he said, bending a quick glance at her. Yes, sir. How long do you intend to remain in France? I hope to be permitted to serve here so long as the war lasts, Captain, for beyond the fact that my husband is in the service, my own devotion to the cause is very great. The cause lies close to my heart. Her interrogator bowed and smiled. You are a patriot, I see. Why is it that, speaking French, you have preferred not to let the fact be known? Why have you denied that you speak the language of the country? He demanded sharply. I have never denied it. In fact, I have spoken French on several occasions since reaching France, whenever necessary, in fact. You have led the Countess de Beaupré to believe that you do not know the language. Why? For reasons that I cannot well explain. Perhaps I hardly know the reason myself. You were introduced to the Countess by your old friend, Mademoiselle D? Yes, sir. This man seemed to know everything. Your journey today was for the purpose of taking supplies to the American Ambulance Hospital at Jewelry, I believe. Why did you not follow the main road? You made a detour in going out that took you some miles out of the way. At my companion's suggestion, she said the main road was rough, considerably cut up by the constant traffic of the heavy camions. Yet you returned by the main road and had no difficulty. So far as the roads were concerned, no, sir. We had tire difficulty, however, and it was this that made us late in reaching the city. May I ask why all this mystery? I do not understand it at all. Surely my position should be a sufficient guarantee of my loyalty to the cause of France, which is the cause of my own country, answered Grace with some show of impatience, which she as quickly controlled and lowered her voice. I am serving both. I have no doubt of it, madame. But there are many things that you do not understand, things that you will never have the remotest conception of. The main highway, the direct route, being easily passable, then there was another reason, naturally, for your making the detour, he added abruptly. I suppose so, stammered Grace. What was the reason? That you wished a glass of milk at the peasant's cottage? We did stop for a glass of milk at Madame de Beaupré's suggestion, and it was delicious, Captain replied Grace, smiling. Thank you. Did you accompany your companion into the cottage? No, sir. I remained in the car, she bringing a glass of milk to me. You held no communication with the occupants of the cottage. You saw none of them? 
I saw through the door and observed an old woman who, after greeting my companion, fetched the milk to her. That was all. We drank the milk and proceeded on our journey, leaving the glasses on the ground in the yard. The captain asked Grace to give him a detailed account of her movements as well as those of the countess while at the hospital at Jewelry. This Grace did, so far as she herself was concerned, adding that the countess, she believed, spent the time chatting with the major. Her questioner asked her in further detail about the tire trouble, whether any one approached the car, whether conversation was had with any other person on the journey out or back. To all of which Grace gave prompt and comprehensive replies. Do you know an American woman by the name of Gay, who was a volunteer worker with your organization? I do, replied Grace, flushing. Is there any feeling between you? Not so far as I am concerned. I cannot speak for her. Why do you ask? Merely formal. We are seeking for information along certain lines, and to which all persons who visit France must submit. It may mean nothing at all, either to them or to us, but we are obliged to probe all possibilities. Are you acquainted with Mrs. Juliet Carmen, a war worker with the organization? I never heard of her. That will be all for the present. If there should develop any further necessity for questioning, I will send for you. I will now send a man with you who will leave you at your lodgings and take your car to its destination. I thank you for your confidence. The captain bowed low. The Countess, Captain. I must take her home. Really, I must. The Countess already has gone. She did not choose to wait and called a hansom. I am extremely sorry to have caused you inconvenience, but I am obliged to do my duty. The Captain summoned a soldier. Take the lady to the address she will give you and leave the car in its garage. You will then return here, he ordered. The soldier saluted and held the door open for Grace to pass out, the officer standing politely while Grace was leaving the room. Twenty minutes later, much to her relief, Grace was in her room. Anne was sitting up, waiting for her, the other girls having retired. Grace, dear, where have you been? I have been so worried about you. It is a long story, Anne, and I am not clear in my own mind what it is all about. Let's brew some tea and I will tell you all that occurred. Behind a closed door so as not to disturb the others, Grace related the story of her day's experiences, to all of which Anne listened with wide eyes and eager attention. Why, it is a regular mystery story, she exclaimed when her companion had finished. Won't the girls be amazed when you tell them? I do not believe I shall tell them. I do not know what all this mystery means, but I am certain that I am more intimately connected with the mystery than we think. I have a theory in the back of my head, but it is a vague one, and I do not think I could give it expression, no matter how hard I might try to do so. This tea does taste good. You will say nothing to the girls of what I have told you. Anne promised that she would not. I will tell them that tire trouble delayed us, which will be the truth. I am rather curious to know what the Countess will have to say about our experience, but I have an idea that I shall not get much information from her. On the following morning, Grace went first to the director and told him the principal facts concerning her experience of the previous evening, to which Mr. Davis listened, at first gravely, then smilingly. I am glad you have told me this. It in a measure clears up the inquiries that were made of me yesterday. Inquiries? Grace raised her eyebrows. About you. The officer who called on me was from the Bureau of Information, Department of the Sign. There are some wonderful operatives there, and no one is wholly free from their surveillance during these trying days. It behooves us to all watch our step, Mrs. Gray. I have done nothing to warrant their investigating me, sir. Of course not, though the mere fact that you have seen fit not to let it be known that you speak French is sufficient to set the Bureau's machinery to operating with regard to yourself. War is a sad business, but it is abroad in the land. We are a small, integral part of it, and we must adapt ourselves to the conditions created by it. You found the Countess a charming woman, did you not? Yes, indeed. I should like to take her with me on another day, if I am permitted to drive, said Grace demurely. Mr. Davis directed a quick, keen look at her, then smiling, said he knew of no reason why Madame de Beaupré should not go when there was room for her. 
He pleased Grace by his attitude, for she had looked for criticism, and pleased her still more when he told her she was to take the car, loaded with supplies, to the American hospital at Newly sur Seine, a suburb, then take charge of the canteen there for the day. Miss Gay came in during the afternoon and made a great many criticisms about the place, but without speaking to Grace directly or directing her remarks to her. The remarks plainly were intended for Grace, and her face burned with resentment. The assistants were smiling, and finally Grace could endure it no longer. "'Miss Gay, are you speaking to me?' demanded Grace. "'I was speaking of the filthy conditions of this canteen,' replied the lieutenant coldly. "'Perhaps it is not as neat as it should be, but we cleaned it thoroughly this morning and have swept the place at least three times since.' I'm sorry you feel obliged to find so much fault. Frankly, I do not like it, and if you persist in annoying me as you seem determined to do, I shall report you to headquarters, and with more cause than you had when you so unjustly accused me. I have no intention of being impudent or unwomanly, Miss Gay, but it has come to the point when your insinuations must stop. Grace's voice was without a trace of emotion or anger but her grey eyes were cold and held Miss Gay steadily. "'You... you threaten me?' gasped the amazed lieutenant. No one had ever dared to speak to her like that before. The other workers who had overheard the conversation could scarce restrain their joy at seeing this disagreeable woman meet one who was not afraid of her. "'No, I never threaten. I have simply stated a fact. I shall report you if you ever... Assume to address me in the insulting manner that you have adopted on two occasions. I do not care to carry this unpleasant conversation further. You will excuse me if I attend to my duties. End of chapter 14 Recording by Ashley Jane Chapter 15 of Grace Harlow Overseas by Jessie Graham Flower this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ashley Jane Chapter 15 Good Work Rewarded It will be unnecessary for you to trouble yourself, Mrs. Gray. You will not be in position to report anyone by tomorrow, for you will no longer be in the service. Grace made no reply, but smiled back into the flushed face of the lieutenant. Miss Gay got into her car a few moments later and sped away toward the city. She will make you trouble. She is very revengeful, warned one of the workers. She has already caused the dismissal of two of our force here. I hope she doesn't carry out her threat, because we like you and should like to have you with us all the time. Thank you, my dear. May I ask your name? I am Miss Totten, from New York, and I am Mrs. Grace Harlow Gray. I am glad to know you. I belong to the Overton College Unit, and we should like to have you come to see us. Our girls will make it pleasant for you. Oh, thank you so much, exclaimed Miss Totten, her freckled face flushing rosy red. I know so few people. I surely shall come. Please do so. I should like to know you better, and I promise you a cup of tea and some French cakes and a jolly evening. We can find a place for you to sleep. At least we can offer you the hospitality of our parlour floor. Grace drove back in the twilight, now pondering over the mystery of her summons to the Bureau of Information. As for Miss Gay's enmity, that might have been from jealousy, or it may have been due to the woman's unpleasant disposition. Grace Harlow was inclined to the latter theory, but she was sincerely in hopes that Miss Gay would carry the trouble no further, feeling certain that it would in the end react against the woman herself rather than against Grace. Emma Dean greeted Grace at the head of the stairs at their lodgings. He is here, Grace, she whispered. He? William. William Schofield, the lieutenant. Oh, I want you to promise to be nice to him, dear. All the girls have been perfectly lovely to him ever since he came. Come in and I will introduce you. Lieutenant Schofield was sipping tea and gingerly nibbling at a bit of French pastry. My dearest friend, Grace Harlow Gray, Lieutenant Schofield announced Emma in introducing him. Grace extended a cordial hand, over which, rather to her amazement, the lieutenant bowed in true French form and touched his lips lightly to the hand. Grace withdrew it rather hurriedly. 
The faces of her companions were so solemn that Grace laughed outright. Why, what a solemn gathering! she cried. Now that I am here, we will liven things up a bit. What is it all about? Lieutenant Schofield was telling us of the horrors of war at the front, of the dreadful life our boys are leading out there in the mud, without proper clothing or shoes, and seldom with enough food to satisfy the actual pangs of hunger, explained Arlene. Then you have been out there on the line? questioned Grace with well-simulated interest. No, I must confess much to my regret that I have not. I have it from officers who have returned and who have described to me the distress of our noble fellows. You say it is your regret. Cannot you get a transfer to the front, Lieutenant? Lieutenant Schofield looked distressed. I could, yes, were I not needed here. The Colonel says he cannot get along without me, and being a soldier I do what I am told to do, go where I am sent, he added resignedly. I suppose that is what a soldier should do, agreed Grace turning away and laying aside her hat. Do I get any of these refreshments? I have a perfectly ravenous appetite, an appetite that I fear such dainties as these will not satisfy. Is there such thing as a roll or a piece of bread and butter in the establishment? Give me something human, girls. Ruth fetched a plate of French rolls and butter and poured a cup of tea. This is more like real food. Do they feed you on light food at your mess, Lieutenant? No, indeed. We have everything that the market affords, but it costs us pretty much all we earn to buy it. And I understand the Y canteens out somewhere back of the lines take pretty much all the soldiers' wages for such trifles as chocolate and cakes. Fine food for a fighting man. The lieutenant agreed, with pious regret, that that was not right. Then Grace began questioning him about the service, and found him ready to talk on any subject at all, even to the extent of giving her such information as he possessed about army affairs. The young lieutenant stayed rather later than is considered good form, but the Overton girls enjoyed themselves, and Emma was a very happy young lady. The whole party trooped out into the hall to bid their caller good night, and asked him to come again, which he assured them he would do whenever he was invited. In taking leave of them, he kissed the hands of each member of the household. "'Did you ever see anything so perfectly ridiculous?' exclaimed Virginia Redfield. "'The lieutenant surely did not learn that in America,' agreed Arlene. "'Those are stage manners. That's the only place I ever saw them used,' interjected Miriam. "'I should characterize it as insanitary politeness. I had a pet puppy once that forever was doing that very thing,' Anne informed them soberly whereupon there was a merry laugh. Emma was actually on the verge of tears. I think you are real mean. The lieutenant is a nice fellow. Quite the nicest fellow I ever met. How about that, you girls who have noble husbands? demanded Ruth. We must take our medicine. You children have been prattling about Emma's friend, and I agree with her that you have been verging on rudeness, said Grace emphatically. Suppose we talk about something else. We will. First we apologise to you, Emma. We have been extremely rude, but we could not resist having a little fun at your expense, said Arlene. Girls, beg Emma's pardon. Now, all together. We apologise, Emma Dean, chorused the Overton girls. Then a merry laugh arose, in which Emma joined. Now, Emma, confess to us. We are your guardians, and you must be a dutiful child, demanded Grace. Confess what? Is this serious with you, or isn't it? You mean has he proposed to me? Has he, or is he going to? urged Miriam. What he may or may not do I am unable to say. He hasn't as yet, and if he does he is doomed to deep disappointment. With the examples that I have before me, I think I prefer single blessedness. But you lead him to believe you are very fond of him. I don't call that right, declared Grace. I know but you are looking at it from the superior ground of a married woman. He amuses me, and I presume I amuse him. At any rate, he has a lady love way back in the good old United States, and he is going to marry her after the war is over, if he doesn't get killed in the war. Emma Dean! exclaimed Grace. He will marry her all right, then, interjected Miriam. No doubt about that. Whereupon another laugh resounded through the Overton unit's headquarters. Grace asked how Emma knew that the lieutenant was engaged to another girl. I took it for granted that he was and made him confess it. However, he really is a nice boy. 
He would be more to my liking were he to get out on the line and fight like a real man, declared Grace spiritedly. Yes, you say that because your personal interest is out there, your husband, retorted Emma good-naturedly. Yes, my interest is out there, but I say it not because of that, but as a good American and a lover of real manhood. We agreed to change the subject. I'll make the change. I had words with Miss Gay, my lieutenant, today, and she has promised to report me, to have me removed from the service. What do you think of that? You don't mean it, exclaimed Emma. It is true. I had first told her I should report her if she did not cease her attacks on me. I presume I should not have done that, but it really had to be done, or there would have been no end to her annoyances. I do not believe Mr. Davis would listen to any such suggestion. If he did, he is not the man I think him to be. Besides, I know personally that he has very high regard for you, emphasized Arlene. He told me so himself this very day, she added. No, I hardly think he would let me go or rather send me back home. It would about break my heart to have anything like that occur. What he may do is to send me to some other district. I wish he would send me out to or near the line. I shall never be wholly satisfied until I have seen real service. Just think of it, here we girls are in the Great War and have never even heard a gun go off. If my recollection served me right, we heard several go off not so many days ago, observed Ruth Denton dryly. If that is anything like the real front, I'm as near as I care to be right now. And you would go out if they transferred you, questioned Emma. Why not? One would feel that she was doing real service then, and one could do great service. I know of no greater service than being up far enough to cheer our brave doughboys. Oh, girls, I forgot to tell you something that I know will fill you with delightful anticipation, cried Emma. More confessions, groaned Miriam. This is not a confession. It is an invitation. An invitation, chorused the girls. Yes, we are invited to the Countess de Beaupre's home on Saturday evening. Grace's face took on a grave expression. Informally, she asked. Yes, there are to be we girls and one or two others. Lieutenant Schofield will be there, but I do not know who else. Is the lieutenant attached to her train too? wondered Ruth. He knows her. In fact, he introduced me to the countess. I'll warrant you nagged him until he did, suggested Miriam. Emma indignantly denied the accusation. Of course all of you will accept. I promise to let the countess know. She called me up today, and at the same time inquired for you, Grace, and wished me to offer her apologies for leaving you so unceremoniously the other night. What was there about that? demanded Emma. I was engaged and did not get the opportunity to speak to her, so she very properly went on home, answered Grace evasively, but truthfully. So far as I am concerned, I shall be very glad to go, provided I am not detained by my work. Perhaps by then I may be out of the work entirely. How about the rest of you? Emma Dean, exclaimed Ruth. We do not have the pleasure of being entertained by a real live countess every day of our lives. Except, while well, you couldn't keep us away by any of the methods of restraint known to civilised man, I should say not. I thought you would be pleased. I will call the countess up in the morning and tell her. In the morning life may be wholly changed for me, reflected Grace. Her prophecy was right. Two things of very great importance to her were in store for Grace Harlow Gray in the day that would soon be upon them. End of chapter 15 Recording by Ashley Jane Chapter 16 of Grace Harlow Overseas by Jessie Graham Flower This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ashley Jane Chapter 16 A Letter from the Front So far as Grace knew, there had been no complaint entered against her by Miss Gay, and she hoped, for the sake of peace and the good of the work they were engaged in, that Miss Gay had decided to drop the matter entirely. Reaching Red Cross headquarters, Grace was directed to drive the director for a tour of inspection of the stations in the city of Paris. She was requested to accompany him into the canteens and other like places, both for her own information and for such suggestions as she might have to offer, 
as Mr. Davis informed her. I believe thoroughly in all my work as knowing all about what the others are doing, the needs of the service and its shortcomings, as well as the other side of the picture, said the director. Grace Harlow did have suggestions to make, but not many. When she made one, it was after acquainting herself with the subject on which she gave her views after asking questions. What she sought to accomplish was to get the slant of her chief's mind, as she put it to herself, showing that Grace had changed little from the days of her studentship at Overton. They returned to headquarters about one o'clock in the afternoon. Mr. Davis told her to come in to see him at three that afternoon, and as there were no pressing duties for her before that time, she went home to luncheon and to ponder over her disturbing problems. All that morning her mind had been on Tom. She was hungering for a word from him. While never uttering a word on the subject to her friends, this separation from her husband was the hardest cross Grace Harlow had ever had to bear. She was reflecting over this as she entered their lodgings. Grace grabbed up the letters that the concierge had thrust under the door and ran them over then to see if there were anything for herself. A square brown envelope bearing a red triangle in the left-hand corner and in the right hand the words Soldier's Mail attracted her attention above all the rest. The envelope was addressed to her in a handwriting that made her heart leap. Tom! she cried, tearing the envelope with eager fingers. It was the first word she had had from him in many weeks, and standing there in the middle of the room, with none to interrupt or to comment, Grace read with an eagerness and a happiness she had never known before. My beloved soldier girl, was the way he addressed her, and Tom Gray could have said nothing that would have held stronger appeal for her. From that on, she read the letter aloud, slowly and so that each word in its true meaning might sink into her heart. This will be but a brief scribble, wrote Tom. Writing out here has been next to impossible. We have been very busy. Every night we work out between the lines, building up the wire, repairing trenches and dodging steel. I do not seem to mind the big steel so much, but somehow the machine guns send a thrill through one, especially when it is merely a matter of yards between one and the enemy trenches. Several of our fellows have been hit while working out there. I have been fortunate, my only wound being a scratch I got from the prong of a barbed wire while running for cover when Jerry put down a barrage on us. You see, soldiers do run away sometimes. We are expected to protect ourselves, for a soldier placed in the field represents a certain investment to the government. We have been over the top three times. How does it feel to be under direct fire? To go over in the face of the enemy fire, I hear you ask. It really is not easy to answer that question. Going up toward the lines on a road that is under shell fire, get the soldiers, wind up as the men term it. On going over the top, however, a settled calm seems to take possession of one. I have observed that practically all the men are thus affected. One moves along without any especial or unusual emotion. Men are dropping around you, but you do not know, as a rule, whether they have caught their toes on strands of barbed wire and fallen, or whether they have been hit. In either case, they are left behind, and you go on, if you are not out of luck. You keep on going until you have reached your objective, and there you stick while the moppers up clean out the trenches behind you that you have gone over. There are some features of the work that do not make pleasant reading, so I will leave them to your imagination, always a live and fertile thing. The engineers, who are popularly supposed to work principally behind the lines, have their full share of excitement. We have been under fire with scarcely a moment's let-up for nearly a month. When back of the lines in rest billets, the engineers take their recreation in building bomb-proofs or fixing up quarters for officers. In short, we are the boys who never sleep. Do I like it? I don't know. 
I do know that I would not have missed it, come what may, for any wealth or happiness that the world might hold for me. I am writing out in a field near where we are billeted. Jerry is putting down a few small ones over on the other side of the field with his usual lack of intelligence. Even if he knew that I was sitting out here writing to you, he undoubtedly would keep on shooting up the earth over yonder, rather than shift his range to start me on a high dive for a convenient ditch. There is one near me. You see I pick my locations with rare good judgment. One develops a sort of sixth sense at the front, and if far enough from the gun that fires a projectile, one can tell from the sound whether or not it is headed in his direction. Sometimes when one is within a couple of thousand yards of the gun, the projectile travels faster than the sound, and the first intimation one has that a shell is coming is when it explodes, and all one can do is to throw himself flat on the ground and hope to dodge the pieces. I am becoming quite expert at burying my nose in the soil of France, but there are a few hundred thousand other fellows who are fully as expert at this as I am. By the way, I hear that Hippie has gone in for aviation, that he has completed his training in the States, and is over here somewhere in a flying school of acrobacy. Can you imagine Hippie as a bird? Grace paused and laughed until the tears actually blurred her eyes. If Hippy ever has a fall, what a mighty splash he will make. Do not be at all surprised if some day he should drop in. No one need ever be surprised or amazed at anything Hippy does. But I take off my hat to him. No, I salute him. His branch of the service is at least reasonably clean, and the only pests he meets in his work are those he fights with his Lewis gun. Baths are luxuries mostly unknown out here. In fact, I have not had my clothes off in nearly two weeks. I am dirty, unshaven most of the time, and when I do shave it is rather an unsatisfactory proceeding. You remember that little steel trench mirror you gave me before I left? I must tell you about that. Then I will drop talking about myself. One day nearly two weeks ago I hung it up on the shady side of a cow stable and prepared for a luxurious shave. Jerry put over a big one about that time, and your brave husband, hearing it coming, ducked into the stable. There was a cow there chewing her cud. She looked at me with reproachful eyes, then resumed her chewing. It was that time that Jerry's message arrived. Part of the cow stable was left open to the weather, and the cow lost a horn, but I, being in luck, was untouched. I went out to rescue the trench mirror and found it some little distance away all bent and marred with a shell fragment in it. That was where I lost my shave. Now, loyal heart, let's talk about yourself, then I will close, for I am due for a detail in a few minutes from now. I approve most heartily of your making the decision for yourself about coming over. I am happy that you have had such a wonderful opportunity, and further, your being here, even though I cannot see you, means more to me than you know. I feel that you are near me. That sense of nearness gives me strength of purpose and will inspire me to greater efforts. Do not worry. Nothing very serious can happen to me while your love protects me. I can feel it all about me like a protecting armour, and at times I feel almost guilty to wear it, knowing that it is my protection which no Hun bullet can pierce. Some day, however, if you stop thinking about me, my luck may change. Be of good cheer and write to me. You cannot fully realise how much letters mean to us fellows out here. Oh, I forgot to tell you that I have been promoted to a sergeant, and I am now bossing the finest gang of young ruffians, most of them college men, that ever dug a ditch or built up wire entanglements under the very noses of the Huns across the way. I am rather sorry to have been promoted when there are so many others much more deserving of it. I must go. We are ordered to go out and dig a reserve trench, so I judge there is going to be a big push from the other side, and we must have a place to get into if Jerry drives us back. I do not think that reserve trench will be needed, not from what I know of this man's army. If you should hear any stories about my promotion, which you are not likely to, I mean why I was promoted, don't let them excite you. 
I did nothing that every fellow in the regiment isn't doing all the time. His everyday duty to himself and his country. Goodbye for the moment. I will write as soon again as I can, rather as soon as Jerry decides to give us a little rest. Devotedly, Tom. Grace sat down, and with head resting on her arms, cried softly. They were tears of happiness, not of sorrow or regret. Finally she sat up with shining, tear-filled eyes. Did ever a girl have greater reason to be happy? She murmured. Nothing matters now, come what may, so far as my end of the work is concerned. I too am fortified and protected. End of chapter 16 Recording by Ashley Jane Chapter 17 of Grace Harlow Overseas by Jessie Graham Flower This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ashley Jane Chapter 17 A Clue That Bore Fruit Grace's face was radiant when she set out for the Red Cross headquarters to keep her appointment with the director. She wondered that Tom had not been more amazed to hear that she was in France, for Grace had yet to learn that more than the ordinary events of life were needed to stir the amazement of a man at the front. Grace was close to that state of mind herself, though she had not yet realised the fact, hence it was with entire confidence that she stepped into Mr. Davis's office, not knowing whether or not she would emerge with orders to return home. What Miss Gay might have done with regard to reporting her, she did not, of course, know. However, whatever apprehensions Grace may have had, faded when she noted the cordiality of her reception by Mr. Davis. Sit down, Mrs. Gray. I had another complaint about you in the mail this morning, but it was not to ask you to answer any charges this time that I asked you to call, for I have learned that this and other complaints in recent days were wholly unfounded. Thank you, smiled Grace. I have tried to do my duty. You have done so in full measure. Mrs. Gray, I should very much like to have you take the place left vacant by Miss Gay. Miss, Miss Gay, stammered Grace. Yes, while she is a thoroughly capable woman, she causes too much disturbance among the women of our force. You know she is only a volunteer worker. I think her shortcomings in this direction are more a matter of a temperament than intent to be unkind. However, we must have teamwork and the most thorough sort of cooperation. I believe, from my observation in the short time you have been with us, that you were the person to fill this requirement. That you have executive ability, I know, and that you have a happy faculty of drawing people to you, I also know. Has... Has Miss Gay resigned, may I ask? Yes, as lieutenant, but she will continue at least for a time as a worker in the hospital at Jouilly, where she has expressed a preference to be sent. I think perhaps she may do well there. I hope, Mr. Davis, that nothing I have done has led to Miss Gay giving up her work as lieutenant. I should feel very bad if this were the fact. It has been through no shortcomings on your part. Quite the contrary in this case. This is a war of efficiency, and we are no exceptions to the army when it comes to that. What we are looking for is efficiency, and when we find it, we use it. That is all. I am sure I am most grateful for your confidence. You will take on the work, Mrs. Gray. Of course. I hope I shall not have to give up driving, though. I am very fond of driving. On the contrary, you will have considerable of it to do, and, if you wish, you may continue to drive supplies to our various units. I think you can do this in conjunction with your inspection tours. Very nicely, sir. It may be necessary for you to spend a couple of days in that work before you go over to the inspection work. I will let you know about it in the morning. Has Miss Gay already left the work, or will she serve until I begin? She is no longer on inspection. There was a note of emphasis in Mr. Davis's tone that was not lost on Grace Harlow. I'm going to ask you to exercise the utmost prudence of speech and action both in and out of your work, Mrs. Gray. Just what do you mean by that, Mr. Davis? questioned Grace. 
Paris is just now undergoing a spy scare, and the Department of the Sign is much exercised over its failure to lay its hands on the agent who, it is known, are supplying the enemy with information that is to the distinct disadvantage of the Allies. But, sir, why should I be cautioned? persisted Grace. For the reason that it has been suspected by the authorities, for what reason I do not know, that somewhere in our organization is a leak. Impossible, exclaimed Grace. So I think. However, it is all the more reason for cautiousness in speech and action which I am sure you will observe. You may depend upon my doing so. I should suggest that the army authorities look into their own household before casting suspicious eyes in our direction. Mr. Davis bent a keen look on her. He smiled. Yours is a very wise little head, Mrs. Gray, he observed. I am of the same opinion as yourself in this matter, but of course it would not be prudent to voice such a thought. Leave it to the Secret Service eventually to get the guilty ones, though there will be others to take their places. Spies always will be with us in times of war, as undoubtedly ours are in the lands of the enemy. Tomorrow morning, then, Mrs. Gray, and thank you for taking on this new work. Do you hear favourably from your husband? I had a letter from him this morning, the first I've had since arriving in France. He is well and happy, therefore I am happy. Good afternoon, Mr. Davis. On her way home, Grace reflected happily that she had some real news to write to her husband that afternoon. I can tell him that he is not the only one to win promotion, and that if he doesn't look out I shall be a major at least before he is a captain. The first time I go out I think I shall try the detour and get a glass of that delicious milk, she decided. The opportunity for this came on the very next morning when Grace was ordered to Jewelry with supplies and for her first inspection. This time she drove out alone and without informing any of her friends where she was going. They did not even know of her promotion, for Grace had not informed them, preferring to wait to see how affairs shaped themselves. Mrs. Gray drove out early in the morning, gravely saluting the sentries after they had examined her papers and on out into the country. The birds were singing, and there was nothing to remind her of war save the long lines of camions loaded with war supplies that were moving out, lorries with wounded men moving in, and the constant rumble of trucks and the gasoline-infested air. Reaching the turn in the road that she had taken before, Grace left the main road and sped down the less-travelled highway that passed the peasant cottage of her former visit. She pulled up in front of the cottage, apparently without having attracted the attention of the inmates, and shut off her motors. Now I will have a glass of milk, she announced, stepping down and shaking out her dust-covered blue skirt. I must wear my duster, or I shall surely ruin my clothes. Grace walked up to the cottage and peered in. The old woman whom she had seen before sat leaning back in her chair, sound asleep. She was the only occupant of the cottage, which, Grace noted, was comfortably furnished for a peasant cottage. While standing there, she studied the features of the woman inside. It was a rugged face, with lines reaching clear across the forehead and ridging the cheeks. In a way, a hard, weather-beaten face it was, but not unlike those of most of the peasant women she had seen on this and her previous visit to France. Madame, called Grace sharply in a high-pitched tone. The peasant woman sprang to her feet, one hand slipping into a pocket of her skirt. Her face went almost ghastly. Did I startle you, madame? questioned Grace sweetly, hiding the smile of triumph that was lighting up her face. Madame is a sound sleeper. Oh, it is the mademoiselle. You frightened me. Why should madame be frightened? Surely she has nothing to fear, for the enemy is far away, and the sound of the big guns does not even reach here, not even the reports of the rifles of the firing squad, that every morning sounds the doom of the friends of the enemy. The pallor again showed under the tan of the peasant woman's skin, but Grace appeared not to notice it. What would you? demanded the woman. Milk, if you please. Yours is delicious. Have you word for me? asked the peasant woman, half hesitatingly. Madame had no letter to send to you today. She will come again soon, perhaps tomorrow. Then there will be tidings. I asked you for a word. 
insisted the woman, bending a frowning look on her caller. Of what? demanded Grace. Of the war, of course. I told you there was no word for today except that Madame will come at the earliest possible moment. It is not well that she should come too often. The peasant woman nodded understandingly. Is there any word for me to take back to Madame? questioned Grace in a low tone, placing her lips close to the ear of the woman. The woman shook her head. Then give me some delicious milk and I will be on my way. From the well just back of the house, the old woman drew up a bucket, removed the cover, and took out a pail of milk that was almost ice cold. It was a delicious drink. Grace took two glasses of it, handing the peasant a franc in payment. It is nothing, mademoiselle, replied the woman. I prefer to pay for it. You need the money you make, though some of it is made easily. You know what I mean. Not so easily as you think, mademoiselle. I, too, have my troubles and my cares. Do you know Miss Gay? No. Thank you for your kindness. I shall be this way again soon, and perhaps I may have word for you in case it is not convenient for madame to come. It is not always wise for her to come, nor always possible. I know, mademoiselle. I hope it may be soon, for the need is great. I need the money from the milk and such other things as I have to sell. One must live, and living in these days of war is a sad business for us peasants, with the men folks at the front and prices so high. Grace nodded and said that it was hard in the United States too, since wartime conditions had overtaken them. The old woman did not go beyond the door as Grace left, but stood there watching the younger woman start her machine and drive off. Grace waved a friendly hand to her as she got underway. I surely have turned up something today, though I do not know what it all means, she reflected. It was a message of some kind that I saw the Countess hand to her the other day, but it may have been, and probably was, of a harmless nature. Perhaps it was an order for milk or vegetables, which I understood the Countess to say she got from this peasant woman whenever possible. I wish I had someone to consort with. Goodness knows I need advice more than ever I did in my life. Arriving at Jouilly, Grace found a call from headquarters awaiting her. She was to go on with her load of supplies to the western end of the Marne Valley to the base hospital there. You may come within the zone of long-range fire, but if you do, do not try to go through it. Impress an ambulance going out into service and request them to take supplies the rest of the way for you. You are not afraid, are you? questioned the director. Indeed I am not. What about credentials? Shall I be able to get through? Yes, those you have are quite sufficient. You will observe that they are for two persons, the ones I gave you this morning, as it is frequently necessary for our drivers to pick one or another of our workers. You, of course, will have no one go with you today, but that will make no difference. The credentials are correct, and the officers out there know that a car is on the way. Of some of the supplies, they are not in the immediate need, but leave it all and bring the car and yourself back. That is all. Thank you. I will be off as soon as I get a bite to eat. Grace entered the canteen there for a cup of chocolate and some cakes. Why, Miss Totten, she exclaimed as the freckled-faced young woman from New York came toward her smilingly. What are you doing out here? I thought you were a fixture. At Newley. I was until Miss Gay transferred me out here the day before yesterday. She thought it would displease me, but I like it, except that it makes it well nigh impossible for me to get into the city to pay you that promised call. How would you like to come with me? I have to go on with the car to number three station and shall be back about dusk. My past is good for two. I should love to go, but I'm afraid Miss Gay might cause trouble for me. You need have no worry about Miss Gay. I have succeeded her as the lieutenant in this district. You, you mean it, Mrs. Gray? Yes, indeed. I will speak to your superior if you really wish to go. Oh, I am so glad. Now I really shall have the heart to work, to put all the energy and initiative I have into the work. I know that all the girls will be pleased. Let me tell them, please. Wait until I speak to your superior. This Grace did, at the same time requesting that Miss Totten be permitted to drive out to the number three station with her, which permission was of course granted. 
It was close to thirty miles on to the hospital, and the roads were good in the early part of the journey, but grew very rough as they went farther. An hour after leaving Jouilly, Miss Totten said she feared they were going to get caught in a shower, because she heard thunder. Stopping the car, Grace listened. There were no clouds in the sky that indicated storm. Then she heard it, too. It is guns, she murmured in an awed tone. Hear them. The booming grew in volume, and she realized that an artillery duel far on ahead of them was being fought. We must go on. Are you timid about it, Miss Totten? No, Mrs. Gray. Rather, I am curious. So am I, agreed Grace. As they progressed, the reports and the rolling echoes grew louder. They passed soldiers in rest camps who were lying about smoking, indifferent to the battle that was in progress. What the artillery did was none of their concern. One of the military police finally halted them and demanded to see their pass, which he examined with care. I should not advise you to go further, he said. The road is being shelled by long-range guns. How far ahead? demanded Mrs. Gray. Two miles, I should say. Sorry, buddy, but I must get this stuff through to number three. By the sound of things, I should say they might be in need of it. The soldier grinned and said he reckoned they might be, but advised her before she reached the next crossroads to stop and look the ground over. If you can get past the crossroads, you won't be likely to have any trouble. Anyway, Jerry will stop shelling at four o'clock. He will begin again at eight o'clock and send over exactly six big ones. I'm telling you so you may know what to expect. They drove on, in a few minutes coming into view of the crossroads, where they saw a white signboard. However, they saw nothing that looked like shelling, so Grace started the car on. The driver had no more than done so when it seemed as if the earth was splitting wide open, and the most terrific explosion she had ever heard rent the air. The light car lifted clear of the ground, turning over on its side, and they felt themselves going down and down. "'Hang on! We are going over the bank!' cried Grace Harlow. End of chapter 17 Recording by Ashley Jane Chapter 18 of Grace Harlow Overseas by Jessie Graham Flower This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ashley Jane Chapter 18 Facing the Perils of War Grace shut off the power as the ambulance toppled and threw on the emergency brake, and as they were turning over, she saw just to one side of the road a tower of black dirt and smoke rising up into the air and spread like the waters of a fountain. They went over the bank with a crash and slid down, the car never stopping until it reached the bottom, leaving both women bruised and stunned, almost to the point of unconsciousness. Grace, after a few moments, struggled free and climbed out over the huddled figure of her companion. With all her strength, she then dragged out the freckled-faced girl and laid her on her back on the bank. "'Miss Totten, are you hurt?' she begged. "'I... I don't know yet. I... I may be. What happened?' "'I think it was a shell that exploded close by the road.' Oh, I'm so sorry that I got you into this mess. There goes another one. I think we'd better stay down here until the shelling stops. If the enemy is aiming at the crossroads, he is a poor marksman, I must say. Hello down there, called a voice from the road. Everybody gone west? No, but we have a good start in that direction, shouted back Grace Harlow. It's a woman, men. Khaki-clad figures swarmed over the bank like a cataract. There were more than a hundred of them, Grace Harlow thought, and they came sliding down, the dirtiest, raggedest bunch of humanity she had ever set eyes on. The mud and grime on their faces almost blotted out their countenances, but the white teeth showing when they grinned, as most of them were doing, was a welcome sight. I'm Lieutenant Pierce. Who are you? Mrs. Gray from the Red Cross headquarters in Paris with supplies for station number three, but I'm afraid my machine is out of commission. If it is, you must hail an ambulance or a camion and get this stuff forward as quickly as possible. They are in need of it up there. 
Her voice had a note of command in it that brought instant results. We shall see about that. Here, men, lend a hand here and unload this car. Handle the stuff carefully. When you have it all out, get the car up to the road, ordered the lieutenant. Do you think you can do it? wondered Grace in a doubtful tone. We are engineers. Engineers are supposed to be able to do the impossible whenever called upon. Engineers? Oh, what regiment? questioned Grace eagerly. 106. Grace sighed. At intervals, shells were exploding, and while the men were unloading the car, she crawled up to the road and stood up. Explosions were occurring out in the field, throwing up great geysers of dirt. While she was standing there, Miss Totten came up and stood beside her. Isn't it wonderful, Miss Totten? Are you afraid? No, Mrs. Gray, though I get a chill up and down my spine every time one of those shells explodes. It must be terrible to be under direct fire. Better get down, ladies, advised the lieutenant, running up the bank to them. Look yonder. Do you see that object in the sky over there? Yes, it looks like a balloon. It is. It is a German observation balloon, and you are under their direct observation at this moment. This is no place for a woman, so I have discovered, returned Mrs. Gray half humorously. Jerry up there is studying us, trying to make up his mind what is going on over here. He is quite likely, as a result, to drop some iron on us. I wish you would get away from here. It would make me feel much easier in mind. Very good, Lieutenant, if you wish it. The lieutenant smiled as he assisted the young women down the bank, and the mud on his face actually cracked under that smile. There comes one now, and it's headed this way. Lie down. When you do, lieutenant, she answered. The officer uttered an exclamation that caused Grace to smile and threw himself flat on the ground. Grace and Miss Totten did the same, but the soldiers down there worked and joked and chuckled to see their officer lying flat on the ground beside the two women. The shell is a big one, one of Jerry's best, and it is coming rather close, announced the lieutenant. He must think something of importance is going on here to waste one of the big fellows on us. The shell came on with a woo, woo, woo that increased in volume as it approached. It was a thrilling sound, and it stirred the pulses of grace. But it was not so much the thought that a huge projectile was headed their way as it was the suspense the awful suspense listening to that woo-wooing sound that thrilled her and made every nerve point stand out. Over by a hundred yards. Poor shooting, Jerry. Keep down, he commanded sternly as Grace sought to rise. She dropped instantly, but no sooner had she reached the ground than the earth began to rock under her simultaneously with a terrific explosion. Grace noted that just as the explosion came, every one of the engineers threw himself face down on the ground. Faces to the dart, ordered the lieutenant, addressing the girls. Though they were a full hundred yards from the exploding shell, with a high bank and a road between them and the point of explosion, they were in great peril as was evidenced a few seconds later when stones and shell fragments began raining into their hiding place. Several soldiers were hit by pieces of stone, but none were hurt more than to get slight flesh wounds which Grace insisted on dressing for them on the spot. "'Shall we try to get the ambulance up to the road now?' said Grace. "'It isn't prudent. The minute that machine shows itself on the road at this point, the enemy will begin reaching for it. You will have to remain here until dark.' "'That depends upon whether or not the machine will run,' returned Grace." Won't you please ask the men to write it so I can look it over? This the lieutenant did, and the ambulance, its top banged in and a hole in its side, was tipped up and stood on its four wheels. Grace lifted the dented hood and examined the motor. The wires connecting with the spark plugs were broken off, but she quickly spliced them and examined other vulnerable parts of the motor and found that no harm had come to it, probably because of the soft sod on which the machine had fallen. Next, she examined the steering gear, the clutch, and the controls. Each appeared to be in working order, but she surveyed the top with rueful eyes. I do not see how those holes got in there right over the driver's seat, wondered Grace. Shell fragments made these, the lieutenant informed her. Grace laughed and found to her intense relief that the motor responded to her first push of the self-starter. No more shells came over but the lieutenant said the Germans were merely waiting to cite some activity 
rather than waste shells on a bare spot in the road. They can't see me if I walk along behind this bank, can they? Not unless you climb up to the road, said the lieutenant. Miss Totten, if you will remain here with the lieutenant, I think I will walk down on this side a little way. I wish to take an observation. She started away with the admiring engineers watching her. Her purpose was to look over the ground and see if the car could be safely driven over it, and also to see if it were possible to get up into the road near the crossroads. She found that this not only could be done, but had been done by other cars. Their tracks were plainly discernible, and she saw where they had gone around great gaping holes in the earth where shells had torn it up. The landscape off to her right was pitted with these holes. A wrecked airplane lay out some distance beyond her, and likewise an overturned and wrecked truck. It was a scene of desolation that made the soldier's plucky wife sigh, and to think that what I see is only the beginning of what lays beyond. I believe I can make it even if they do try to reach me. Yes, I will try, but I don't believe I ought to expose Miss Totten to the danger. Returning to where the ambulance now stood, Grace requested the men to load it up for her. "'Surely you were not going, Mrs. Gray,' demanded the lieutenant. "'Yes, I am going through the field, then drive into the road and take the crossroads at high. "'If they don't shoot me until I get into the road, they won't catch me. "'I see the road is hidden by a bank just beyond the crossing. "'It is positively suicide. I can't permit it. "'Please don't stop me. I must get through. "'Other ambulances go through there, do they not?' "'Of course, but nearly always after dark.' then I shall be the exception. Miss Totten, I dislike to take you along. Lieutenant, would it be possible for you to have my friend looked after until my return? I should be back in two hours at the outside. If Miss Totten will go with us to our billets a couple of miles back, I shall be glad to have her share with us the officer's mess. We can promise her no more than soldier's fare. You can pick her up on your return. Do, Miss Totten. You will enjoy it, I am sure." The lieutenant added his voice to the urging, and Miss Totten gave a rather reluctant consent. Her reason was that it looked too much like deserting Grace, but the latter assured her that it was best to accept the lieutenant's hospitality and go with him. The car was soon loaded, after which Grace distributed cigarettes to the men and announced that she was ready to move. "'I hope you make it, Mrs. Gray,' smiled the lieutenant. "'I shall if the gas holds out.' Thank you, buddies. I shall not forget your kindness, nor yours, Lieutenant, she added, shaking hands cordially with him. Should you come to Paris, do not fail to look us up. I am sure you will find the girls of our unit good fellows, and who will consider it an honour to have you call on them. Au revoir. Grace started up, and the ambulance moved off, bumping over the rough ground, swaying from side to side, though. Grace was driving slowly and carefully. Back beyond the embankment, the group was anxiously watching her progress. A very remarkable woman, observed Lieutenant Pierce. And as good and fine as she is remarkable, spoke up Miss Totten. I have not known her very long, but I hear all the women workers praising her. When women do that, you know there must be a very good reason for it. Lieutenant Pierce laughed heartily. At about this time, Grace was remarking to herself that the lieutenant appeared to be much taken with her freckled-faced companion. The attraction, too, appeared to be mutual, else Miss Totten would not have consented to go back to the billets with him and have mess. It would be a novel experience which Grace would have enjoyed. Her husband is in the service, lieutenant. He is in the 130th Engineers. Oh, indeed. There she goes. She is going to take the crossroads. That is some nerve for a woman. Phew! Grace was driving the car at a speed that would have been fast on smooth roads. Out there on the rough field it was akin to suicide. On the car swept, fairly leaping out into the highway and skidding as she straightened it out in the road. They have spotted her. They are sending one over, groaned Lieutenant Pierce. They surely will get her this time. Too bad. Too bad. End of... Chapter 18 Recording by Ashley Jane Chapter 19 of Grace Harlow Overseas by Jessie Graham Flower This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ashley Jane Chapter 19 Forging a Link in the Chain 
Miss Totten's face paled when she heard the now familiar woo 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 of the rushing shell. Grace Harlowe was headed straight now, and the ambulance fairly leaped forward as she flew over the crossroads, neither heeding nor caring for the shouts of the military police sentries who were crouched in a ditch beside the road, waiting for what they could hear coming through the air. The shell struck fairly in the middle of the crossroads. The enemy had the range exactly, probably long since worked out. It mattered not to them that it was an ambulance that they were shooting at. The shell exploded with a mighty, reverberating roar. The watchers saw a great black cloud leap up into the air and spread out like a parachute as it caught the wind on its downward flight. Is she hit? gasped Miss Totten. I don't know. If she isn't, it is a miracle. The lieutenant ran up to the top of the bank and, crouching low, trained his glasses on the black cloud. Keep down. Don't stand upright, he warned as the young worker ran up the bank to join him. Grace knew what was coming, feeling rather than seeing or hearing. She heard the crash which seemed to be right on top of her, and she felt the rear wheels of the car lifted clear off the ground, whereupon she put on all the speed the car had, despite the fact that the car was rocking like a ship in the trough of the sea. By sheer pluck and clear-headedness, Grace brought it on a straight course again and sped on her way, knowing that in a few seconds a deluge of steel and rock would be falling on the spot. She made it, shouted one of the engineers who had discovered the fleeing car. The lieutenant and his companion caught a momentary glimpse of the ambulance, then it disappeared behind the bluff that rose from the road just beyond the crossroads. That is the most remarkable piece of pluck I ever knew a woman to exhibit, marvelled Lieutenant Pierce. Do, do you think she will be safe now? Yes, if she waits until twilight before she comes back. We shall have to be going now, but we won't go out into the road until we are out of observation range. In the meantime, Grace was speeding on, and in due time arrived at station number three, where she was welcomed, but with some amazement that it was a woman, and a young and pretty one at that, who had driven through with the supplies for the station. They were even more amazed when they observed the condition of the body of the car. Several shell fragments had pierced it in that explosion at the crossroads, but when asked about her experience by the medical officers at the station, she shrugged her shoulders and replied that she had had rather an exciting race with a German shell. The car was thoroughly looked over by an ambulance driver who had just come in with his car loaded with wounded from the front. Some minor repairs were made, a fresh supply of petrol taken on, then Grace, declining to remain for tea, started back. She reached the crossroads in good time, and though it lacked nearly an hour of twilight, put on full speed and dashed through, waving a friendly hand to the military police who were stationed there to warn and direct traffic. An hour later she pulled up at the billet where she was to pick up Miss Totten. A soldier came up to the car and helped her off. He was one of the engineers who had assisted her out of her difficulties that afternoon. You had a close call over yonder, he observed, saluting. It might have been worse, buddy, she replied, favouring him with a radiant smile. Do you mind sending my friend out? We must be on our way, as we have quite a long drive ahead of us. Can you get in after dark, miss? Yes, now we can. Headquarters has arranged for that. Oh, there they come. Lieutenant Pierce and Miss Totten appeared walking together. Behind them strolled several officers who paused a short distance from the car. The lieutenant beckoned to them. I wish you to meet the pluckiest woman, one of the two pluckiest you have ever known, announced the lieutenant, introducing Grace to each member of the group. Grace had removed her right glove and was shaking hands cordially with the young officers. You must call on us when you come to Paris, she said. My friends will try to make your visit pleasant. They assured her that they would do so, then insisted that Grace come in and have some tea and a light luncheon. 
She said she could not spare the time, and that she would be delighted to do so if she was permitted to drive out that way again. Now, Miss Totten, if you are ready, we will be going. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for entertaining my friend. I know it has been a delightful experience for her. It has indeed, confirmed Miss Totten. Bidding goodbye to their friends, Grace and her companion were soon bowling along at as high a rate of speed as was prudent. They were not permitted to have their headlights on so near to the lines, so cautious driving was necessary, as there were many trucks and officers' cars on the road. In fact, the road presented two long processions of them. After a time, however, Grace turned the lights on when she observed that other cars were running with lights. Did you have a pleasant time, Cora? she questioned finally, addressing her companion by her given name. Lovely. Lieutenant Pierce is the most charming man I have ever met. I judge the admiration is mutual, observed Grace, laughing. I shouldn't be at all surprised were it to be a go, my dear. Miss Totten was silent and soon changed the subject, which of itself was significant. Reaching the point of detour, Grace had decided to take her friend into the city with her. The car was turned off into the side road, principally because there was less traffic there and less danger of collision, for the drivers of the army camions were reckless and expected all mankind to give them a clear road. It was about nine o'clock in the evening when Grace approached the pleasant cottage where she had partaken of milk on the two previous visits. A closed car was standing before the door, and Grace thought she saw someone sitting on the front seat. No lights were showing in the cottage. Proceeding a little further, Grace turned off the road and drove her car into an orchard. Cora, will you be afraid to stay here alone for a little while? I have just thought of something I wish to do back at that cottage. No, how strange. May I not go with you? I prefer to go alone. Please keep perfectly quiet and do not move around, but sit tight until I return. I shall be back as soon as possible. You are going home with me tonight. Grace threw her gloves on the seat and slipped away in the darkness. Coming in sight of the cottage under the shadow of the trees, she proceeded with extreme caution. Nearing the house, she now observed that there was a light in the room, showing at the edges of the curtain as the breeze swayed it. I may be shot, but I must take the chance. I simply have got to know what is going on in there. This is another example of a woman's curiosity. Grace crept cautiously up to the window, and straightening up placed her ear close to it. There were voices in there. Two of the voices belonged to women and one to a man. They were speaking in French, with occasional remarks in a language which Grace believed to be Russian, though she was not positive as to this. She was unable to understand it at any rate, but she did understand every word that was being spoken in French, and she recognised the voices of the women. For a full hour at least, Grace crouched by the window listening. Much of the conversation was of an indirect nature, but she was able to piece the greater part of it together so that she understood that she was listening to the plotting of the enemies of France as well as of her own country. Grace experienced a tightening of the heart, a tenseness of muscles all over her body. It was hard to listen and to keep quiet, yet this sturdy American girl realised that she had need of all her discretion and of all the resources of mind and body in the emergency that confronted her. At last the conference in the cottage came to an end. The night had grown darker, the sky now being overcast. A sudden resolution took possession of the watcher. She must know who it was out there in the car at the gate. Grace recalled a scraggly hedge that had grown up before a section of the yard close to the place where the car was standing, as she had intuitively fixed the location in her mind, and she determined to try to reach the hedge without being observed. Her dark uniform and the felt hat pulled well down to shield her face, enabled Grace, by crouching low and moving cautiously, to reach the hedge. Once there, she threw herself flat on the ground. Only one person, a woman, came out of the house and stepped rapidly toward the car. I was a long time, wasn't I? demanded the woman. Oh, yes, I began to get nervous. 
I thought I saw someone out there in the yard just before you came out, answered a voice from the car that Grace recognized and the sound of which caused her heart to sink. No one is here but the old woman. We shall stay at my chateau tonight. It will not be prudent to try to return to Paris. That was the destination that I gave anyway, so we must go there. The car started away with a jolt. Grace waited until they were almost out of sound before she got up and crept out of the yard, then walked briskly to her own car. Is that you, Mrs. Gray? asked the calm voice of Miss Totten. Yes, my dear, it is I. I thought you never were coming. Is anything wrong? A great deal is wrong. I will tell you about it perhaps tomorrow, but not a word of this to any human being. Great issues depend upon your secrecy and mine. I shall not even speak of it to the girls at the house, so be prudent. You may depend upon me, replied Cora Totten. Grace pressed her companion's hand. Thank you, my dear. I may need your assistance in a very grave matter. I know that I can depend upon your loyalty and your pluck. I have had evidence of the latter. The former goes without saying. End of chapter 19 Recording by Ashley Jane Chapter 20 of Grace Harlow Overseas by Jessie Graham Flower This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ashley Jane Chapter 20 Grace Dares to Do it was a very tired Grace Harlow Gray who arose early the next morning and sat down to think while she brushed out the coils of her golden brown hair before the long French mirror on the stand that did duty as a dressing table for her. The other girls of the unit were still in bed and Miss Totten was sound asleep on the cot that Grace had prepared for her the evening before. Grace had made her plans, or at least her first plans. What followed would depend wholly upon circumstances. After breakfast, she directed Miss Totten to go to one of the city booths for the day, saying that she might need her and wish to have her within call, and, leaving her freckled-faced friend with the Overton girls, Grace went out early. Arriving at the Red Cross headquarters, she called up Mr. Davis and inquired where Miss Gay was to work that day. He informed her that Miss Gay was indisposed and would not report for work that day. Grace took the address of the former lieutenant and, getting in her car, drove to the lodgings that the woman called home. Miss Gay, clad in a Japanese kimono, was sipping her breakfast cocoa when Grace knocked and walked in. The once lieutenant's face grew dark when she saw who her caller was. "'What do you wish here?' she demanded rudely. "'To speak with you, Miss Gay.' Before I state the nature of my business, I wish to say that I am here to save you from a very great disaster, perhaps even greater than you can even dream. I know of no disaster that you can save me from, Mrs. Gray, answered the woman coldly. May I ask where you were last night? You may not. I am not responsible to you for my actions, nor did I invite you here. You will be good enough to leave before you make it necessary to have you forcibly ejected. Miss Gay, I know where you were last evening, and the woman with whom you went. That woman is a spy. Is what? gasped Miss Gay. Grace was secretly pleased, evidencing, as it did, that Miss Gay did not realise the desperate game in which she had become involved. A spy. You will be held as her accomplice if you are found out, and it is my opinion that when she is caught she will seek to put the blame on you. She surely had some motive, a deep motive, in enmeshing you in the folds of her plot. Miss Gay got up slowly, supporting herself with both hands on the table. Her face had gone grey and hard. I do not believe you. You were seeking to be rid of me. Who knows to what limits you are willing to go to serve your own ends? She protested hotly. You are mistaken. I never have done you injury. You have? You know you have. Did you not cause the director to relieve me of my work and put you in my place? You are the one who needs watching, and I understand you already have been under surveillance. Have you finished, Miss Gay? demanded Grace coldly. If you have, I still have something to say to you. If you still persist in your attitude, there remains for me but one honest thing to do. 
to go to the Bureau of Information and tell them what I know. But you are a countrywoman of mine, and so long as I believe you guiltless of any intent to betray that country, I am willing to take the chance of being arrested as a spy myself because I have befriended you. Listen to me, Miss Gay. Last night you sat in a closed car just outside a certain cottage on the Marne Road. You were instructed to blow the horn should an alarm be necessary. There was no alarm, though at one time you thought you saw something moving in the yard. Your eyes did not wholly deceive you, Miss Gay. There was something, someone moving there. And in the cottage there were two women and a man. The two women were giving the man, an agent of the enemy, information about the United States forces in France and on the way to France. That is not all. A map was turned over to him by one of the women showing the locations of recently constructed defences in the city of Paris, and on this map there were indicated certain other works of vital interest to the French and their allies, works which might be bombed if the enemy's aim was sufficiently good by airplanes or heavy artillery, provided the enemy artillery gets close enough to Paris to do so. You are a spy yourself, cried Miss Gay excitedly. Grace ignored the accusation. I understand now, continued the woman hotly. You have been spying on me for reasons that concern your own advancement. You wish to be rid of me. Suppose I go to this woman, the one you mean, and repeat to her what you have said to me. Suppose I do. What do you suppose will happen to you? I am glad to hear you admit the truth of what I have said, murmured Grace. That being admitted, we will now proceed to other things. You will not go to this woman to report me, nor in any way put her on her guard, Miss Gay. Why won't I? Because this very day you will be on your way to America, provided we can get you properly cleared as regards passports and a permit to leave France. I think it can be arranged. Oh, when will you be ready? What if I refuse, Mrs. Gray? At a certain point, the location of which you may or may not know, in a warden yard, less than a mile from where we are standing, the reports of a firing squad are not infrequently heard, but one has to be quite close to hear them. Would you care to hear them? persisted Grace relentlessly. She pitied this misguided woman, but knew that by pressing her as she was doing, she was but doing Miss Gay a great service, and the organisation itself though she had no official connection with it, being but a volunteer. Miss Gay uttered a little cry of dismay and sank down in her chair, burying her face in her arms and giving way to bitter tears. Grace stood silently until the storm had passed, and the woman before her looked up, red-eyed, her face rigid with troubled lines. "'What do you wish me to do?' she asked tremulously. First, give me such information as you may think will shed further light on this unfortunate affair. I will tell you all, so far as I myself am concerned, but I shall give you no information about the other woman. She has been very kind to me and made you presents, finished Grace. How did you know? Perhaps I guessed it. Go on. I say to you truly that I did not know she is what you say. I cannot believe it even now. I have driven her to the peasant's cottage several times, twice with the ambulance and at other times with a private car. How many times have you been to the chateau where you went after leaving the cottage last night? Twice, replied the woman, looking her amazement. You must have taken an early start this morning in order to get back here to Paris so early. We did. We started just before daylight, as the other woman was obliged to be at home quite early in the morning because of some appointment she had made. What is the name of the man this woman met at the peasant's cottage last night? I do not know. She did not say. But it may have been a man named André, of whom she has spoken several times, and who, I took from certain remarks she made, had previously been to the chateau. Where is the chateau? On the main road, just beyond where you turned down to go to the cottage. It sets back in the grove, and you would never suspect it was there. I thought you knew where it was, as you seemed to know everything, added the woman bitterly. Do you think of anything else that you might tell me, only to say that I want to get out of this miserable country as quickly as possible? Pack your trunk. I will see what arrangements I can make for you. 
but you must give me your word that you will not communicate directly or indirectly with any person on this subject. I promise. Please go away and leave me now. I can endure no more. Grace placed a hand on a shoulder that shrunk away at her touch. Please remember, Miss Gay, that I am trying to do you a service, to save you. Now show your appreciation by doing your part. I shall see you later in the day. Saying which, Grace left to see what arrangements she might make that would enable Miss Gay to get away from Paris immediately. End of chapter 20 Recording by Ashley Jane Chapter 21 of Grace Harlow Overseas by Jessie Graham Flower This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ashley Jane Chapter 21 A Dance and a Raid With the assistance of Mr. Davis, to whom Grace related nothing of the true circumstances, she was able to make arrangements for Miss Gay to leave Paris that afternoon. The formalities were all completed by noon, and at three o'clock that afternoon Miss Gay was driven to the station by Grace herself. Passage had been reserved for her on a ship sailing from Havre two days hence. Grace gave a sigh of relief when she had finally bundled the woman into a compartment and saw the train draw out without Miss Gay having spoken to a person except the officials at the station. For the rest of the afternoon, Grace attended to her duties and went home early. "'Grace Harlow, have you forgotten what day this is?' demanded Emma Dean. "'Saturday, I believe. Why? This is Saturday, yes. But have you forgotten where we are going this evening? I fear I have. To the Countess de Belpraise. I'm positively ashamed of you, Grace Harlow. I'm sorry, Emma, but I've been very busy, you know.' "'Then you really are going?' demanded Arline. "'Of course. What time are we due there?' Eight o'clock.' Miss Totten was not invited, and the girls did not feel at liberty to take them with her, but she said she had some writing to do and did not mind being alone. Grace asked her if a certain lieutenant had anything to do with her eagerness to be alone with her pen and ink. Cora blushed becomingly. "'I am answered,' announced Grace." "'What is this I hear about a lieutenant?' cried Emma. "'Miss Totten will have to answer that question. "'Is your SOS lieutenant to be at the party this evening, Emma?' "'Lieutenant Schofield is to be there,' returned Emma with dignity. "'All were doing their hair, but they were to wear their uniforms, "'the affair being an informal one, so there was no dressing to be done. "'A light supper was prepared before they left,' as Emma said refreshments were to be served by the Countess. It was a happy party that set out shortly before eight o'clock that evening for the home on the boulevard Houseman. Lieutenant Schofield was already there, and shortly after their arrival, two second lieutenants and a captain from the United States forces arrived and were introduced. Grace looked them over with interest. Not one of them had been near the front. She could tell by their complexions and their clothes, for the men back of the lines all dressed in much better clothes than the men out there. The Countess was all graciousness. Have you wished for another glass of that delicious milk that we got the day we took our memorable drive? she asked Grace. Yes, I stopped there the other day. That milk is worth going miles for, replied Grace easily. I should much enjoy driving that way again with you, if you would care to go. A pleasure, I assure you. I will take you to another place where we can get berries with our milk. I know you Americans are very fond of berries, and I confess that I am fond of them myself. That will be a pleasure indeed, Countess. I will call you up and let you know when I am going that way again. It will not be before some time in the early part of next week. One has to be attentive to one's business, you know. Yes, it is wise to devote one's attention to the legitimate business in hand. Grace gave her hostess a quick look of inquiry, but the Countess was nodding and smiling at Lieutenant Schofield, who was sitting with Emma on the opposite side of the room. We cannot all be diplomats either, Mrs. Gray, continued the Countess. The inexperienced person who thinks he or she can is riding to a mighty fool. 
Diplomacy is perhaps the oldest profession in the world next to war itself. It is a lesson that you should apply to yourself, my dear. You are new to the ways of the old world. Why should I apply it? I am not a diplomat, nor even practising diplomacy, returned Grace, looking evenly at her hostess. There are various forms of it, Mrs. Gray. I have been thinking, to change the subject, that you and your friends might enjoy an afternoon at my chateau. Of course you did not know that I possessed one. It is unpretentious, but it is useful when one wishes to get away by oneself. Why not go out there tomorrow? Sunday will be a busy day with us. There are so many soldiers in the city on Sunday that we are kept at work from early until late. Then we will arrange for it later in the week and go out and have dinner, provided we can get passes to return. If not, we can remain at the chateau overnight. I have but two servants out there, but we shall manage it somehow. Shall I play for you young people to dance? she called. There was instant approval of the suggestion. We have not quite enough men to go around, but those who are here are soldiers and will not mind standing double sentry duty, I am sure, added the countess. Grace smilingly declined when the captain invited her to dance with him. She preferred for the present to watch the others, she said, but perhaps would dance later on. The dance was on, and Grace smiled as she noted the happy laughing girls of her unit. Later on came the refreshments, chocolate and French pastry. Grace sang later on, Arlene playing the accompaniment, and Anne gave them a recitation. You are an artist, exclaimed the countess, clapping her hands in approval of Anne's selection. The stage has lost some great talent in its failure to claim you. The stage already had claimed her when Mrs. Southard's brother came along and took her away from it, explained Grace. Ah, then I was not wrong in my estimate, cried the countess delightedly. Genius cannot be hidden, not for long, can it? Perhaps it eventually is bound to come to light, but I have known it to be hidden for a long time ere it saw the light of day, replied Grace. Most things hidden from the light of the world are the really worthwhile things, observed Madame de Beaupre. With that I cannot agree, retorted Grace. The worthwhile things of life are the things we should share with others where it is possible to do so. Hark! It is the siren, announced Madame calmly. Another raid is coming. Madame called a servant and ordered that the heavy wooden blinds be closed to protect the windows and the occupants of the house against shrapnel and bomb splinters. The Overton girls would have much preferred to have had the privilege of looking out. The booming of the guns soon was heard. The Countess listened, a far away look in her eyes. Some distance away. I do not believe they are near us, spoke up the captain. The Jerrys are after something in another part of the city, evidently. Yes, they are searching out vital spots, or trying to, agreed Madame. It was some time after the raid that the Overton girls took their departure. Late Monday afternoon, Grace picked up Miss Totten and took her for a drive. Cora, she said, after they were well started, I must confide in you. I have something of great importance to say, and I need your help. End of chapter 21 Recording by Ashley Jane Chapter 22 of Grace Harlow Overseas by Jessie Graham Flower This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ashley Jane Chapter 22 The Trunk That Held a Mystery from certain things that occurred last night, I feel the need of confiding in someone, resumed Grace. Cora, I have discovered what I believe to be a spy plot, a plot that even the Department of the Sign, so far as I am aware, has failed to unearth. What is more, I believe that the guilty ones suspect that I suspect them. Please tell me about it, urged Miss Totten. Grace then related the story of her being taken to the Bureau of Information following her first visit to the peasant woman's cottage on the Marne Road, but without revealing to Cora the name of the woman who accompanied her. Then you will recall, continued Grace, the other night when we drove into the orchard and you waited for me so long. 
That is the cottage that I have reference to, and what I heard there was the unfolding of a plot against the Allies, or, more definitely, against the French. It was a desperate plot, Cora, and I knew three of the principals in it. I have written out the story in the hope that it might clear my own mind as to the facts. It is in my trunk at home, and if you do not mind we will stop at my lodgings and you shall read it. Have you proofs to support your suspicions, Grace? questioned Miss Totten. No. How I am going to prove what I know to be true is the question, but I am in hopes you may be able to suggest something helpful. The car had pulled up in front of the lodgings of the Overton unit, and Grace and her companion entered. I will get the papers and you can look them over while I am making a bit of tea. We shall need some stimulant, you know, for we have a serious problem to solve. Unlocking her trunk, Grace took from under the lining several sheets of paper covered with writing in her clear, upright script. The sheets had been slipped under the lining of the trunk through an opening that she had deftly cut with a pair of manicure scissors. It was not discernible unless one were looking for something of the sort. Grace stood looking at the interior of her trunk, chin in hand, a slight frown ridging her forehead. It doesn't seem as I left my clothing in that condition, she murmured. Perhaps one of the girls has a key that fits my trunk, though I hardly think any of them would take the liberty of opening the thing. Miss Totten was reading Grace's manuscript with eager eyes. She did not even hear her companion's remark about the trunk. Grace got down on her knees and began removing her belongings. There, she exclaimed. I never left that petticoat on the bottom of the trunk. I left it on top, just under my kimono. Someone has been in the trunk. What is that, you say, Mrs. Gray? questioned Miss Totten. Someone has been peeping into my trunk. However, no harm done. Almost at the bottom of the trunk, Grace pulled out a roll of paper, carefully done up and sealed with tape. She held it in one hand, gazing wonderingly at it for a full moment. Being in my own trunk, who has a better right to open it? She murmured. This is very strange. With cautious fingers, she broke the seals and spread the roll out on the floor of her room. Within the roll was a second roll of typewritten sheets, but it was the roll itself that first claimed her attention. Grace Harlow studied it with wondering eyes, then turned to the typewritten sheets, which she read over twice, now and then referring to the spread-out roll. The colour was rising in her face as she read and began to comprehend the nature of the papers before her. Permitting the typewritten sheets to fall to the floor, the Overton girl sat back, and, with knees clasped in her hands, pondered deeply. The Countess was right. A mere child like myself has no business to meddle with the diplomatic functions of the old world. I wonder what Cora will think of this newest development, she reflected, casting a quick glance of inquiry at her companion. Miss Totten was absorbed in her own reading, and Grace noted that her face, too, was flushed. Stepping to the door, Grace called down to the concierge. Maurice, has anyone been in our rooms today? A woman came for the washing, that's all, was the answer. Thank you. Grace had observed that the washing that always was called for on Monday had been taken away, though the woman ordinarily came for it in the evening when the girls were at home. Returning to the room, she paused, observing Cora reflectively. What do you think of it? questioned Grace, as her companion laid the sheets in her lap and glanced up. Almost too remarkable to be believed, was the reply. Exactly. I agree with you. How much more difficult will it be for me to convince the authorities of the truth of the statements I have made there? Have you no proofs at all that you can fortify this with? asked Miss Totten, holding up the sheets. Proofs, yes but proofs that were I to be caught with them in my possession undoubtedly would lead to my being stood up before a firing squad. Cora Totten, you see before you a very much disturbed woman. Please look at what I just found in my trunk. How it got there I do not know. I do know that it was not there the last time I looked through the trunk, which I believe was yesterday. 
Read this over, and if you do not understand it, I think I can enlighten you. Miss Totten did so while Grace paced the floor thoughtfully. It seems to be a map of Paris, judging from the outline and the familiar names of the streets. A partial map, Grace informed her. Do you make anything else out of it? Not much. Then I will tell you. It is a military map, made to show the vulnerable points for enemy bombing or bombardment. I do not know which, nor is that feature of it at all material. Here on these typewritten sheets is a necessary explanation of the principal features of the map. Is it possible? More than that, continued Grace, several of the vital works indicated on that map were bombed last Saturday night. Some of the works destroyed when we were at Madame de Beaupre's. The, the papers were not in your trunk before, stammered Cora. I never saw them in my life though I heard them discussed that night when I was listening under the window of the peasant cottage. These very same plans, this very same map. Now what do you think? I think it the most remarkable combination of circumstances that I ever heard of. Why, Mrs. Gray, why are they in your trunk? To involve me in this miserable plot, that's all, cried Grace. End of chapter 22 Recording by Ashley Jane Chapter 23 of Grace Harlow Overseas by Jessie Graham Flower This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ashley Jane Chapter 23 In a Maze of Difficulties Do you think the papers were placed in the trunk today? questioned Miss Totten, after pondering over the problem for a moment. They must have been, replied Grace. Then there is no time to be lost. You must go to the Bureau of Information this very day and tell them all you know. I had made up my mind that that is the proper thing for me to do, but I am not so certain about the rest of it. However, my duty is plain, for unless I am much mistaken, our rooms will be searched before the night is ended. The placing of those papers in my trunk can mean but one thing, that the plotters have in some way communicated their suspicions to the department, knowing that the latter would make an immediate investigation. I agree with you that there is no time to be lost. Come, we will take the car back, and then I will go directly to the bureau. Grace and her companion hurried out, Grace taking the papers with her, and a few minutes later had left the car in its garage. Thank you, my dear, said the Overton girl, extending her hand to her companion. You have been very kind to me, and you may be able to help me still more than you know now. Please communicate with the Bureau if I do not get in by nine o'clock. I neglected to tell you the name of the woman in the case which for certain reasons I did not mention. The real spy, I believe, is Madame Jean de Beaupré, and the peasant woman is the go-between, her and the man André. But please do not use this information unless it becomes absolutely necessary. With that, Grace hurried away, and shortly thereafter, reaching the bureau, she requested an audience with the captain. After waiting fully an hour, the Overton girl was conducted to the room to which she had been summoned on her previous call there, and the same officer who had questioned her on that occasion faced her now. "'How do you chance to be here at this time?' he demanded brusquely. "'Because I have something to communicate to you. Certain occurrences have hastened my coming. To what do you refer?' demanded the captain, fixing a steady gaze on her until Grace felt as if he would never desist, though she bore the scrutiny unflinchingly. Are you aware that my men are already out in a matter in which you may or may not be concerned, and are perhaps at this very moment in your apartments, Mrs. Gray? I was not aware of the fact, though I supposed that such would be the result, answered Grace smilingly. The result of what? asked her questioner quickly, of a letter that you possibly may have received relating to myself. The French captain plainly showed his amazement. May I tell my story, sir? Proceed. 
When last I was here, you asked me certain questions. Your investigations, in a way, confirmed a suspicion that entered my mind the day I was driving with Madame de Beaupré. I answered those questions truthfully, of course, but what I did not say was that I saw something pass from the Countess to the peasant woman, which I believed at the time to be a letter. I know it was an envelope, a large brown envelope. Following that, and the inquiry which began here with relation to my connection with the case, certain occurrences confirmed my suspicions that the Countess was not what she seemed, and having been informed that spies were active in Paris at this time, I was watchful of others as well as myself. I stopped at the peasant cottage a few days after my first visit there, and from the attitude of the peasant woman and her answers to my questions, which I have written down for your examination, I was positive that I am right in my deductions, added Grace, who then went on in detail to relate all that occurred on the occasion of her last visit to the peasant cottage. On my return to my quarters today with my friend, Miss Totten, I had occasion to go to my trunk, and I discovered that my belongings were not as I had left them, so I removed them in order to place them in order. In that trunk, sir, I found a sealed roll which I opened. In that roll was what I believed to be the map that I had overheard being discussed at the peasant's cottage. With it were certain explanations of places that were to be bombed, and I realised at once that some of those very places had been attacked in the raid last Saturday night, when we were attending a reception given for the Overton unit by the Countess. "'Where is the map?' demanded the captain, now thoroughly aroused. Grace withdrew the roll from her bag and placed it on the table before the French officer. He tore off the wrapper with eager fingers, and, spreading it on the table before him, scanned the plans with deep interest. Next he turned his attention to the typewritten sheets, frequently uttering exclamations that were wholly unintelligible to the young American woman who was observing him closely. After a time the captain rose abruptly and left the room. Eventually Grace was summoned to another room where the captain and two other officers were seated at a table. All rose upon her entrance and bowed ceremoniously, but the young American woman was not deceived by this show of deference. She knew that even were she to be sentenced to die at sunrise, they still would have accorded her that deference which is so much a part of a Frenchman's nature. For a moment the French officers sat looking at her, Grace meeting each pair of eyes unflinchingly. Finally one, a lieutenant, spoke. What language was spoken at the meeting you say you overheard at the peasant's cottage? he questioned. Mostly French, sir. Occasionally the Countess and the man André, if that be his name, spoke in a language that I did not understand, though at the time I believed that it was Russian. Grace saw instantly that her reply had confirmed something that was already in their own minds. Did you inquire if any person had been in your rooms that day? then questioned the captain. Grace told him that she had done so, and that no person, according to the concierge, except the laundry woman, whose name and address she gave them, had been there, adding that she did not know of her own knowledge whether or not it really was the laundry woman who had been there. After asking many questions, the officers retired, and after what seemed to her an interminable time, returned. Madame Gray, it pains me greatly to have to tell you that for the present we can come to no decision in this matter, announced the captain. We must pursue our investigation further. Either you have rendered a very great service to France, or I have offered myself as a victim for the firing squad, finished Gray evenly. No, 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 madame, exclaimed the captain with a deprecating shrug. The French do not shoot women. They leave that to the Huns. I beg your pardon, Captain. I should not have said that. What do you wish me to do? You will remain here for the present in the custody of the Bureau, announced the Captain, with more sternness in his tone than she had yet heard him employ. Thank you, replied Grace evenly, then added to herself, A prisoner. None but a Frenchman could so sugarcoat a sentence to jail. End of chapter 23 Recording by Ashley Jane
Chapter 24 of Grace Harlowe Overseas by Jessie Graham Flower. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ashley Jane. Chapter 24 Grace Harlowe's Surprise. When nine o'clock came and no Grace Harlowe, Cora Totten's alarm was very great. Her call by telephone to the Bureau of Information was productive of no information whatever as to what had become of Grace. Of course Miss Totten surmised what had occurred, but there was nothing that she could do beyond telling the girls of the unit about what had happened, which she did at once, and they, of course, were alarmed for Grace's safety. Arlene was designated to see their chief in the morning and get him to use his good offices toward assisting Grace out of her predicament. While the girls were still discussing the situation, Cora was summoned to the telephone. She uttered a little cry that centred the attention of her companions on her on the instant. "'Lieutenant Pierce, you are a gift straight from the gods,' she cried. "'Come over to the Overton unit immediately, for we're in great trouble. Hurry! Girls, girls, isn't it wonderful? Lieutenant Pierce is here on leave, and he is coming to help us. Oh, I'm so happy!' The lieutenant was with them very shortly thereafter, and Miss Totten related the story as she knew it to him, to which he listened gravely, now and then interrupting with a question. "'We can do nothing tonight,' he declared after Cora had finished. "'In the morning I will try to see the American ambassador. Does her husband know?' "'Of course not. He is at the front,' spoke up Emma. It was late when the lieutenant left. On the following morning he succeeded in obtaining an interview with the ambassador, who promised to investigate at once. The latter did so by sending his military aide to the bureau, where the aide personally examined all the papers in the case, to which he was given free access by the French officers. But the day passed with no word either of a favourable or unfavourable nature. In the meantime, Mr. Davis, thoroughly aroused, had started an investigation of his own, and the Department of the Sign perhaps never had brought upon itself such a storm of protest from various quarters as it had stirred up by detaining Grace Harlow Gray. The day passed and the night came with still no word, and Lieutenant Pierce again called at the embassy, where he held a brief interview with the aide. What the aide said to him, the anxious girls of the Overton unit did not know, but when he called on them early next morning, they observed that his face wore a worried look. Lieutenant Pierce did know in a general way that the Department of the Sign were investigating, that the plot they were unfolding was deeper and more far-reaching than even Grace had dreamed could be possible. When Saturday night came and still no word from the Bureau, Genuine alarm began to manifest itself among the girls of the Overton unit, and that night, red-eyed and miserable, they slept not at all. It was early Sunday morning when Lieutenant Pierce received a summons to call at the Bureau. "'You have news for me?' he asked eagerly, as the French captain shook hands with him cordially. "'More than that, Lieutenant. We have the great honour of turning over to you the person of a most estimable young woman. Enter, madame, he added, throwing open a door, and Grace walked into the room. Oh, she exclaimed, is it possible? Lieutenant Pierce, I thank you, Captain. I'm certain that the lieutenant can do much to assist you in clearing up this affair, and I know you will trust an American officer and gentleman, even though you doubt me. Madame Gray, Lieutenant Pierce already has done much for us and for you in this matter, and far from distrusting you, our confidence in you is of the highest, for you have rendered to France a very great service. We were convinced after going over the proofs that you submitted to us that you were guiltless and that you had done what the Secret Service had failed to accomplish. It became necessary, however, for reasons which I am not at liberty to explain, to detain you as our honoured guest. The captain bowed low. That reason no longer exists. Thank you, captain, answered Grace smilingly. Our great regret it is, continued the French officer, that we have done you so unforgivable a wrong. Such amends as can be made will be made. 
To your ambassador and to our friend the lieutenant much credit is due. The same may be said of the head of your own organisation. The captain paused and smiled. At one time he came near assaulting me because I cast, as he thought, doubt upon your uprightness. Believe me, Madame Gray, I am deeply grieved that he should have so construed any remark of mine. I fully understand, Captain. I... I wonder if I might ask a question. The Countess... What of her? Pardon me, madame. I cannot speak of that. I will say that the countess has been under suspicion for some time. You will understand that I... I think I do understand, sir, interrupted Grace smilingly, and, stepping forward, she shook hands cordially with the French officer. I am grateful to you, Captain, and I assume that hereafter I shall leave old world diplomacy thoroughly alone. Goodbye, monsieur, le capitaine and viva la France. Grace, with an arm linked with that of the lieutenant, walked from the room free. My thanks to you are too great for words, lieutenant. Where is Miss Totten? she asked. At your lodgings. I will take you there. Grace said she must go to headquarters and report to Mr. Davis first, and would join the lieutenant at the lodgings in a very short time. Upon reaching the Overton unit's lodgings, Lieutenant Pierce was treated to a surprise. Several of the girls of the unit and a caller were there. "'Mrs. Gray is free!' cried the lieutenant, as a group of anxious faces peered down over the stair railing. "'She will be here shortly.' It was then that he discovered the caller, to whom he received an introduction a few seconds later. "'What a surprise this is!' he said, shaking hands cordially with Sergeant Tom Gray. I think I know of a noble little woman who will be even more surprised. How do you come here at this psychological moment? questioned the lieutenant smilingly. I am on leave, lieutenant, and I thought to surprise my wife. Instead, she has furnished me with a genuine surprise. Lieutenant, I am unable to express what I feel for your kindness in this unfortunate affair. However, it is war, and we must accept conditions as we find them. How soon do you look for Mrs. Gray to arrive here? She should be here within the hour. I hear a cab stopping now. Cora, look out! Lieutenant Pierce was all excitement. It's Grace, cried Miss Totten, starting for the door. The lieutenant barred her way. I think we may all, with propriety, leave Mrs. Gray and her husband alone for their greeting, he said. You will excuse us, Sergeant. Tom Gray nodded and smiled. He was lean and strong, and his face was browned and a little more lined than before he went to war, but there was a certain something about him that the old Tom Gray did not show, on the surface at least. Hello, girls. Here I am again, cried Grace, bursting into the room. She halted abruptly, a puzzled look on her face. I beg your... Don't you know me, Grace? Tom! Oh, Tom! Grace's eyes shone through her tears when finally she held her husband off at arm's length and surveyed him critically, lovingly. How, how wonderful you are! But in your eyes, except when they are looking at me, I see the same hard look that I have observed in all the men who have seen service at the front. I want you to look like that when you were looking toward the enemy but I do not wish to see it there when you are with me. Now talk to me, then we must call the girls in. Where are they? Lieutenant Pierce dragged them all out when he heard you coming. He thought we would wish to be alone, smiled Tom. He is a dear. I do hope he and Cora make a match. Here they come now, and I haven't said the least little part of what I wanted to say. The greetings were heartfelt, as Tom Gray knew, and his heart went out to these loyal Overton girls as it never had before. Lieutenant Pierce and Cora came out after the greetings were over. Grace looked at her freckled-faced friend suspiciously. Cora, if I am a judge of human nature, I should say that you two have something to say to us. The moment for full and free confession is at hand, reminded Grace. Oh, Mrs. Gray murmured Cora, blushing furiously. My friends, Miss Totten has consented to be my wife, and I think I may call you that, spoke up the lieutenant. We are to be married at the close of the war, provided we both come through it. It was and is my desire to have the wedding now, but Cora will not listen to that. 
declaring that after our duty to our country is done will be time enough to do our duty by ourselves. And when that day arrives, interjected the freckled-faced girl, I do not mind saying that I shall marry the best man in the world. One of the best, corrected Grace, slipping a confiding hand into the big brown, hard fist of Sergeant Tom Gray. It was a happy party that sat down to dinner in the Overton quarters that day. There was music and song, chatter and laughter all the rest of the afternoon, and until a late hour in the evening, then still later, as Tom and Grace stood hand in hand at the window of their darkened room, beams of light began sweeping the skies, followed a few moments later by the crashes of artillery, while the detonations of exploding bombs rattled their windows and set the building a tremble. It is war, murmured Grace, but love is greater than all, for war will one day stop, while love goes on forever. Sergeant Tom Gray's brief leave expired on the following day when he started for the front, and Grace, her heart filled with happiness after those few hours of perfect companionship, took up her work with new strength and purpose, a work that, amid the confusion and crash of war, called for endurance and courage of high order. The Countess de Beaupre, as Grace learned some time later, had been sent to prison for the duration of the war, but she was unable to learn what had become of the spy Andre, though she heard it said that he, having taken alarm, had successfully made his escape. As for the peasant woman, while not knowing what had been her fate, Grace observed upon driving that way some time later that the cottage was deserted, from which facts she drew her own conclusions. Though the Countess de Beaupre had made a dramatic exit from the Overton girl's life and activities, her passing was not a final one. Grace was to meet her again, when the battle of wits between the two women would be renewed, one revengeful and dangerous, the other thinking only of her country and its welfare, ready to do and to dare all for its cause. The further exploits of Grace Harlow and the story of her labours in the cause of humanity and her country will be found in a following volume entitled Grace Harlow with the Red Cross in France. End of chapter 24 Recording by Ashley Jane End of Grace Harlow Overseas by Jessie Graham Flower